a quartet of men left Rome. It was about the year 62 A.D., and these men were bound for the province of Asia, which was located in what is currently designated as Asia Minor. One of these men was going into Macedonia. Now, these men had on their persons four of the most sublime compositions of the Christian faith. These precious documents would be invaluable if they were in existence today. Rome did not comprehend the significance of the writings of an unknown prisoner. If they had, then they would have apprehended these men and the documents would have been seized. And when these men bade farewell to the apostle Paul, each was given an epistle to bear to his particular constituency. Now, these four letters are designated in the Word of God as the prison epistles of Paul. He wrote them while he was imprisoned in Rome, awaiting a hearing before Nero, who was the Caesar at that particular time. Paul, as a Roman citizen, had appealed his case to him and was waiting to be heard. Now, this quartet of men and their respective places of abode can be identified. Epaphroditus was from Philippi, and he had the epistle to the Philippians. Tychicus was from Ephesus, and he had the epistle to the Ephesians. Now, the scriptures for that you find in Philippians 4.18 for Epaphroditus, for Tychicus and Ephesians 6.21. I'll not turn to the Scriptures because as we take up these epistles, I'll make reference to it. Now, Epaphras was from Colossae, and that's in Colossians 4.12, and he had the epistle to the Colossians. And then there was a man by the name of Onesimus. He was a runaway slave from Colossae. Philippians verse 10. And he had the epistle to Philemon, and Philemon was his master, who was a believer in Christ. Now, these epistles present a composite picture of Christ, the church, the Christian life, and the inner relationship and function in of all. These different facets present the Christian life on the highest plane, by the way. Now, Ephesians the one that we're going to take up presents the church, which is his body. This is the invisible church, of which Christ is the head. And Colossians presents Christ, the head of the body of the church. You see, in Ephesians, the emphasis is upon the body. In Colossians, the emphasis is upon the head. And in Philippians... That presents Christian living with Christ as the dynamic. I can do all things in Christ which strengtheneth me, Paul says in Philippians 4.13. Now, Philemon presents Christian living in action in a pagan society. Paul could write to Philemon, who was the master of this man Onesimus, and say, If thou count me therefore a prisoner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Now, in other words, friends, the gospel walked in shoe leather in the first century, and by the way, it worked. And that is the thing that we're going to see in this epistle of Ephesians, as well as these others, when we come to them. Dr. Arthur Pearson called Ephesians Paul's third heaven epistle. Another has called it the Alps of the New Testament. It's the Mount Whitney of the high Sierras of all Scripture. It is the church epistle. And we now have arrived at what many expositors consider the highest peak of scriptural truth, the very apex and the very acme of Bible revelation is in Ephesians. Now, that may well be true. Some even suggest that Ephesians is so profound that none but the very elect 
In other words, the chosen few are the only ones that can understand it. And I've always noticed that the folk who say that, they always include themselves in that inner circle. I want to be very candid with you. I do not even pretend to be able to probe and to plumb the depths of this epistle, nor to ascend to its heights. This epistle is lofty and it's heady. It's difficult to breathe the rarefied air of this epistle. And you're going to find that out when we get in it, too. I'm going to do the very best I can with the aid of the Holy Spirit as our guide to understand it. And I do want to make this statement here at the very beginning, and we'll see it now in just a moment. The two books of the Bible that men have always said you can't understand them are Ephesians and Revelation. Liberalism likes to say Revelation is just a conglomerate of symbols that no one can figure them out, and that Ephesians is so high that it's too high for us. Well, let me say this, that the two books of the Bible that can be arranged mathematically and logically are Ephesians and Revelation. There are no two books as logical as they are. Now, I have attempted to write a book known as Briefing the Bible. We mentioned that on the program, but that's one of the first books I wrote because I wanted to know what the Bible was about. I got tired of hearing folks say, I believe the Bible from cover to cover, and they didn't even know what was in the covers at all. They just had the pious statement, their creed was, I believe it. Well, if you believe it's God's Word, my friend, you're going to try to find out what it says and get off of this gimmick line that many are on today and always talking about methods and how we can increase the number in Sunday school, and how we can communicate with the younger generation and how we can, you know, better organize the church. Well, that's all fine. It has its place. But let me tell you this. The important thing is to know what's in the book. Now, we attempted to go through and outline every book of the Bible. I have that in Briefing the Bible. Now, Ephesians and Revelation were the two easiest books in the Bible to outline. You know why? They're logical. Now, I don't pretend to be able to understand them, but I do want to say this. You can outline them, and Paul is logical in Ephesians, and John is logical in Revelation. The book of Revelation is outlined for us. He was told to write the things you have seen, things are, things that will be. Now, that's a threefold division, and it's arranged according to sevens. You couldn't have it any better than that. Now, the epistle to the Ephesians is logical. And the very interesting thing is, you can outline it very easily. And so I'd like to just say a word about the outline of this epistle. And then I want to say a word about Paul and Ephesus, because that's important for us to see. Now, there are six chapters here. The first three chapters, you have the heavenly calling of the church. This is the doctrinal side. In the last three chapters, you have the earthly conduct of the church, which is very practical. You see, the church has a head. The head of the church is Christ. He's in heaven. We're identified with him. But you see, the feet of the church are down here on the earth. And Paul won't leave you sitting up there in the heavenly. Because one of the things he's tell you at the beginning of chapter 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what he's saying is this. He says, Christian, it's nice to sit up there in the heavenlies and boast of your position in Christ. But he says, for goodness sakes, get down out of your high chair and start walking. Because you need to walk. And remember, in that day, they were walking in a pagan society in the Roman world. Then there's something else that I think is quite interesting. He says also, 
As soldiers, you're to stand. So when you get tired of sitting in the heavenlies, it might be well for you to come down to earth and walk down here on the earth. Now, that makes a nice division, does it not? First three chapters, doctrinal. Last three chapters, practical. And we need both. Don't just live in the first three chapters. Oh, they're wonderful, but get down here where we live today, right down where the rubber meets the road, right down here where the nitty-gritty is, where you live and move and have your being. Now, in chapter 1, it's very logical. The church is a body, chapter 1. Chapter 2, the church is a temple. And then chapter 3, the church is a mystery. Now, these are the three chapters of doctrine. Now, when you come down to the practical part in chapter 4, the church is a new man. That is, the church is to exhibit something new in the world, walking through the world as a new man. Then you have, in chapter 5, the church will be a bride. Now, don't get the idea that the church is a bride. The church is not a bride today. The church is a church. Paul said to the Corinthians, I've espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I'm just getting you engaged. We're engaged to him today. But the church someday will be a bride. Then the church is a soldier of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 6. And a wag who heard me give this down in Florida, he said to me, he says, that's interesting. The church will be a bride, you say, and the church is a soldier. He says, you know, for a lot of marriages down here today, why, they get married first and then the fighting starts. Well, it ought not to be that way because that's not the way Paul gives it to us. Now, these are the practical aspects. The church is a soldier. There's an enemy to be fought today. There's a battle going on. And the bugle is sounded. And we need to stand the day for God in this world. Now you have, in chapter 1, where we're going to begin, the church is a body. And do you know that's interesting? Here again, you can divide it into three parts. And I'll come to this later, but just let me mention it now. God the Father planned the church, verses 3 through 6. God the Son paid the price for the church, verses 7 through 12. And then... God the Holy Spirit protects the church, verses 13 and 14. And this was so wonderful that Paul concluded chapter 1, prayer for knowledge and power. And we're going to pause for that too when we get there because this is great. This is wonderful. I hope it'll be meaningful to you. Now, let's look at Paul now in Ephesus because it's important for us to see this. I had the privilege back in 71 in May of visiting Turkey. And I visited all the seven churches of Asia Minor. And Ephesus is where I spent the most time. Now, to me, the greatest thrill of my ministry was to visit these seven churches. And the number one church was Ephesus. And the great city, by the way, as we shall see. Now, the... Holy Spirit would not permit Paul on his second missionary journey to enter the province of Asia where Ephesus was the leading center. And we're told in Acts 16, 6, And when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, in other words, the Holy Spirit put up a roadblock, and said to Paul, you can't go down there now. Now, I do not know why, but it was not the right moment. And so this man, he went on west into Macedonia to Philippi, down to Berea, down to Athens, over to Corinth. And then on the way back, he came by Ephesus. And, oh, what a tremendous opportunity he saw there. In Acts 18, 19, I read, he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And so this man Paul saw what a tremendous opportunity there was. 
And on his third missionary journey, he came here. And he discovered that another by the name of Apollos had been there in the interval and between his second and third missionary journeys. But he'd only preached the baptism of John, not the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. At that time, why, he didn't know about it. Apollos didn't. Later on, he became a great preacher of the gospel himself. Now, Paul began a ministry there that was far-reaching. Actually, it's my firm conviction, having visited Turkey and has seen that area and read a great deal on the excavations that have been made there, that the greatest ministry that the gospel has ever had was in what is today modern Turkey. That in that day, as today, there were millions of people living there. It was the very heart of the Roman Empire. The culture of Greece was no longer in Greece. It was now over along this coast, the western coast of Turkey, Ephesus being the leading city, great cultural center, great religious center. And the Roman emperors came to this area. The climate was great, and it was a wonderful place to visit. Millions of people there, friends, and here is where The gospel had its greatest entrance. In fact, Paul could write. Do you remember later on as he wrote to the Corinthians, he says, I'll tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me. And there are many adversaries. And he met opposition there. But did you know that he went into the synagogue, as Dr. Luke tells us, In Acts 19, verses 8 through 10, he went into the synagogue. He spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitudes, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, this was a tremendous impact, friends, that the gospel made upon that area. Now, Paul began there in the synagogue. I wonder what some of these hyper-separationists who wrote me, by the way, some very unlovely letters... They may be lovely Christians themselves, but they don't write lovely letters, I can tell you that. And they criticize me for going into a Catholic monastery and giving out the Word of God. (laughs) I wonder what they would say about Paul going into a synagogue, which was, I would say, in that day, actually farther from God than even a monastery. May I say to you, my friend today... I think that Paul would go anywhere if he could preach the gospel. And since that was the way he did it, I want to do it the same way. Now, I don't compromise with the system. I think the system is absolutely wrong. And when we get to Revelation, you're going to hear me say some very strong things. Some of you may wonder how I've been able to stay on the air all these years. But I want to make it very clear to you that I'll go anywhere I can preach the gospel, give the Word of God, and I want to say something else. I remember hearing the late Dr. Harry Rimmer. Someone criticized him in downtown Los Angeles for going out and speaking in a liberal church. And he answered like this. Why? He says, Madam, I would go to hell and preach the gospel if I had a return ticket. May I say to you, this idea today that we are to be so separated, my friend, let's get the Word of God out today and take it anywhere, provided they'll let us take it. And do you know what? Here's one fellow that no one's been able to say that I don't give out the Word of God. You can't say that and be honest in making that statement. Therefore, I'll go anywhere I can. I go to all kinds of churches. I criticize the Pentecostals, but I go and preach for them too. Anywhere they let me give out the Word of God, I'll go. And my friends, I have a good example. Paul began in Ephesus, 
And the word of God went out from there so that everyone in Asia heard it. Don't you want them to hear it today? Let's get the word of God out. Now, this was a glorious city. It was probably the second most important city in the Roman Empire, only second to Rome in influence. It was a city that had a culture that was largely Greek at this particular time that Paul was there. The city was founded probably 2000 B.C. by the Hittites. And it was what we would call an oriental city, Asian city, until about 1000 B.C. and the Greeks came in. And then you have a mixture of east and west. Actually, Kipling is wrong as far as Ephesus is concerned. He said east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. But they did meet in Ephesus. And over this long period of probably 2,500 years, this city was one of the great cities of the world, a cosmopolitan place. It was on a harbor that now is all filled up, silted in, and it's not a harbor anymore. In fact, it's about 10 kilometers, about 6 miles from the ocean today. But when Paul went there the first time, he sailed right up to that beautiful marble, white marble freeway, if you please, because it was a very wide street, and this beautiful Parian marble was everywhere. And the quarries of Mount Prion had supplied the marble, and there was the art and the wealth of the Ephesian citizens, and as a result, they had built there one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was that vulgar idol of Diana. And it was housed in one of the most beautiful temples ever built. And it was that temple that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In it was some of the most wonderful artworks. Apelli's great picture of Alexander the Great hurling the thunderbolt was in there. It was the largest Greek temple ever built, four times larger than the Parthenon, and very similar to it. It was 418 feet long by about 239 feet wide. And the columns, over a hundred of the exterior columns. But inside was this vulgar idol of Diana. It was not the beautiful Diana of Greek mythology, but it was actually the Anatolian conception, the goddess of fertility, not the goddess of the moon, but the goddess of fertility, the many-breasted one, and all sorts of gross immorality that took place in the shadow of this temple. This was what Paul had to contend against in the party that was with him. But here the gospel was preached with such great power. And as a result, they had a riot in the city. There were those that led a rebellion against Paul because he was putting them out of the business of making these little idols of Diana. And he was preaching a gospel of the living God, that there was life through Jesus Christ. And the believers that turned, there was a great company of them. I think the gospel was more effective in this area than any place and at any time in the history of the world. And there came into existence this Ephesian church. And that church is the highest church spiritually, I think, of any. The epistle to the Ephesians reveal that. To me, the amazing thing is there were people living in that pagan city who understood this epistle. Paul wouldn't have written it to them if they couldn't have understood it. And not only that, you find that in the seven churches of Asia, the first one is Ephesus. And that is a series of churches that give the entire history of the church. And Ephesus was the church at its best, the highest spiritual level. You and I today can't even conceive of the high spiritual level that the Spirit of God had brought these Ephesian believers where they love the person of the Lord Jesus drawn to him. Oh, today in our churches, and now I hope I won't be misunderstood again, 
because I've been a pastor for years. I have a pastor's heart. I love to minister in our churches today. But we're far from the person of Christ. We're so enamored with a program. We're so enamored with an office. We're so enamored with doing some work in the church. And we're far from the person of Christ. The big question would be, how much really do you love him? Paul's going to tell these Ephesians, Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it. Well, do you return that love? Do you respond to him? Can you say to him, I love him because he first loved me? Well, this letter to the Ephesians ought to bring us very close to Christ. Now, as we come here to this first chapter, the church is a body, the body of Christ in the world today. We are going to see in the first two verses an introduction. Then we'll see God the Father plan the church in verses 3 through 6. Remember the Lord Jesus said, A body hast thou prepared me. And he came to this earth yonder at Bethlehem, given a body, grew up yonder in Nazareth, became a carpenter. And Mary's husband, Joseph, taught Jesus to be a carpenter. And then for three years he ministered, finally died on the cross, shed his blood for you and me. And then we have, in verses 7 through 12, God the Son paid the price for the church. We have redemption through his blood. And then God the Holy Spirit protects the church, verses 13 through 14. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Then you have prayer for knowledge and power. And we need that prayer as we come to this epistle today and let us pray. Lord, we do pray. You'll make real and living this epistle to our heart. For we pray in Jesus' name. Now, here in the introduction, as we come, we have the heavenly calling of the church, the vocalization, and we have here the church as a body. And I read the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints that are at Ephesus, even to the believers in Christ Jesus, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you probably, as you followed the text, and I do hope that you have your Bible. Some of you are listening to us today at work. Some of you are riding along the highway. But for goodness sakes, don't try to read it while you're driving. But pull over to the side and just turn that to this text. And you'll find it indeed very helpful now, as you follow along, you'll notice I changed some things. And this is, first of all, a brief introduction. And it's brief for several reasons. It's brief because, very frankly, this epistle was directed to the church in Ephesus. But in some of the better manuscripts, an Epheso is left out. It's not there which just simply means this, that it was apparently the epistle that Paul referred to when he said in Colossians to read the epistle to the Laodiceans. In other words, this was a circular letter that went around. And I think it was primarily for the church, of course, in Ephesus, but for the churches in that day. And he's not writing here to the local church as much as he is to the church in general. That is, the invisible body of believers. We're going to see that. Paul, he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to change that just a little. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Why do I say that? And I hope you'll not think I'm splitting hairs here, but he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul, all the way through this epistle and many other places, it should be Christ Jesus. Christ is the title, of course. That's who he is. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus was his human name. Paul could say that we know him no longer after the flesh. Paul didn't know him, the Jesus of the three years' ministry. 
He says, I met him on the Damascus Road, and he was the glorified Christ. I know him as the glorified Christ. And he emphasized always the name Christ first, Christ Jesus. But he says, I am an apostle. Now, what is an apostle? Well, that the highest office the church has ever had. No one today is an apostle in the church for the simple reason they can't even meet the requirements. To begin with, the apostles received their commission directly from the living lips of Jesus. You will find Paul made that claim. He said, I'm an apostle, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. And I'm an apostle that's been made an apostle directly by Jesus Christ. And that's the reason that I believe Paul took the place of Judas and not Mattathias. They voted Mattathias in. I don't find anywhere Jesus Christ making him an apostle. All the apostles apparently received their commission directly from the living lips of the Lord Jesus. Now, the second requirement for an apostle was the apostle saw the Savior after his resurrection. Paul could meet that requirement, as you know. And then the third requirement of an apostle was they exercised a special inspiration. They expounded and wrote Scripture. And certainly Paul measures up to that more than any other. And then the fourth, they exercised supreme authority. The Lord Jesus said actually to them, all powers given unto you, And the badge of their authority was the power to work miracles. And miracles, I think, ceased with the apostles because that was their badge in that day. And John could say before he finished his long ministry, probably at the close of the first century, he could say, if any come to you not having this doctrine, no longer a miracle worker, but not having this doctrine, The doctrine's important today. And then they were given a universal commission to found churches. These are six requirements that an apostle must meet. And Paul certainly met that. Then he says here that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul rested his apostleship upon the will of God rather than any personal ambition or on man or whether the church made him an apostle, but he's an apostle by the will of God. Over in Galatians, the first chapter, verse 15, he says, "...but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me that I might preach him among the heathen." So that Paul says, I'm this kind of an apostle, that is, by the will of God. And he said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, Paul made constant reference to the will of God as the foundation of his apostleship. You'd like to check that. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.1, 2 Corinthians 1.1, Colossians 1.1, 2 Timothy 1.1. In all of these places, Paul says he's an apostle by the will of God. Now he says to the saints in Ephesus, the word for saint is hagios. It actually means separated or set aside for the sole use of God, that is, that which belongs to God. For instance, the pots and pans in the tabernacle and later on in the temple, they were called holy vessels. Why? Because they were specially holy, very fine and nice? No, I think they were all beat up and battered after that long wilderness journey, but they were for the use of God. And my friend, A saint is one who's trusted Christ. In fact, there are only two kinds of people today, the saints and the ain'ts. And if you're not a saint, you're an ain't. And if you ain't an ain't, 
then you're a saint, you see. So that a saint is one who's trusted Christ, and he's set aside for the sole use of God. Now, there's some of the saints not being used of God, of course, but that's their fault. They are for the use of God, and they're for his service. Therefore, saints should act saintly. It's true, but they're not saints because of the way they act. They're saints because of their position in Christ, and they belong to him to be used of him. Then he says in Ephesus, and I've already referred to that, it could be in your town, whatever the name of it is. For me, it could be in Pasadena. And he says, even to the believers. Now, the believers and saints are the same, you see. They are the same people. A saint should be saintly, and a believer should be faithful. But a believer is one who's trusted Christ, and a saint is the same one. Now, the term saint, I think, is the Godward aspect of the Christian. The term believer is the manward aspect of the believer. Now, they're in Christ Jesus. And this is probably the most wonderful thing of all. And this epistle is going to amplify that so much that I will be dwelling on that in more detail later on. But to me, the most important word in the New Testament is the little preposition in. In. Theologians have come up with some lulus trying to tell us what it means to be saved. How do you define our salvation? Well, they've come up with the word redemption, atonement, justification, reconciliation, propitiation, and vicarious substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. And all of those are good. I'm not finding fault with them. I think they're wonderful. But each one of them merely gives one aspect of our salvation. What does it really mean to be saved? To be saved means to be in Christ. We are irrevocably and organically joined to Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're put in the body of believers. And we're told, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We belong to him. And there's nothing as wonderful, therefore, as that. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Can you improve on that? We're in Christ Jesus. That's the great accomplishment of salvation. Dr. Chafer found that it occurred 130 times in the New Testament. How wonderful it is. The Lord Jesus used it. He says, ye in me and I in you. And we're in Christ. Now, the bird is in the air, but the air is in the bird. The Lord Jesus said, ye in me and I in you. I can't explain that. It's so profound. But the fish is in the water, and the water is in the fish. The iron is in the fire, and the fire is in the iron. And the believer is in Christ, and Christ is in the believer. We are joined to him. The head is in the body. The body is in the head. My body can't move without the head directing it. Now, the church, which is his body, is in Christ the head, and all the truths of this epistle of Ephesians revolve around this great fact. Now, friends, I feel very keenly that these epistles should be given top priority. Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and we spent quite a bit of time with First and Second Corinthians, I feel like that these have a throbbing, personal, living message for you and me today, probably as no other portion of the Scripture does. In other words, when God said to Joshua, Arise, go over this Jordan. I know he's not talking to me, but it has a special message for me, and it has a special interpretation as I know it meant to Joshua, but to me it has an application. In fact, the epistle to the Ephesians is the Joshua of the New Testament, and we're going to see that. Now, we got down to verse 2 of chapter 1. We're not moving very fast. Now, let me read. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, we are going to talk about this word grace a great deal in this epistle. And I'm going to pass by it with just a word or two. It was a word of greeting. And the word grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace was the Gentile form of greeting in that day. The word in the Greek was charis. Two men meet on the street, one would say to another charis. I was walking down the street in Athens with a Greek friend of mine who was a missionary. And he spoke to several people as we went by. And I said to him, it sounds to me like you greet them with the word charis. And he laughed and he said, well, it's similar to it. So that apparently today it's still a form of greeting. Grace be to you and peace. Now, the word in the Gentile world, the pagan world, the secular world, was the word grace. Now, the word that is the religious word is the word peace. That is the word that you would hear in Jerusalem, shalom, grace to you in peace. And Paul has given both of these words a wonderful meaning. In fact, the matter is he's lifted them to the height. And the grace of God is the means by which God saves us. We'll see that when we come to the second chapter here, and I'll talk about it then. But you must know the grace of God before you can experience the peace of God. And Paul always puts them in that order. Grace before you can have peace. And today, you see everywhere the word peace. Of course, what they're talking about is generally peace in some section of the world. Our world peace is what they're talking about. But the world can never know peace until it knows the grace of God. And the interesting thing is you don't see the word grace around very much. You see the word love. You see the word peace today. They are very familiar words. They are supposed to be taken from the Bible, but they don't mean when you see it on a bumper sticker of a car. It doesn't mean there what it means in the Word of God. And we'll have occasion to call attention to that. Now, this peace is peace first of all with God, because your sins are forgiven. And your sins can never be forgiven until you know something of the grace of God. Now, the grace and peace is from God our Father, and He becomes our Father when we experience the grace of God and regenerated by the Spirit of God, and it's from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is interesting. Doesn't Paul believe in the Trinity? Why didn't he say from the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit was in Ephesus, indwelling believers. The Lord Jesus was seated at God's right hand in the heavens. So that we need to keep our geography straight when we study the Bible. A great many people get their theology warped because they don't have the geography right. And when we get that straightened out, It even helps our theology. Now, will you notice, we come to a marvelous verse here. It's verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, that is a very wonderful expression, but I'm going to change that just a little today. Blessed here be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. And you'll notice places are in italics in the text, in Christ. Now, we notice here that there's something that is very important here. He has blessed us. We praise him with our lips because he first made us blessed. And our blessing is a declaration. His blessings are deeds. We pronounce him blessed. He makes us blessed. Now, what does it mean, blessed? Well, the word has in it the thought of happiness and joy. God is rejoicing today. And God is happy today. 
because he has a way of saving you, and he can bless you. And this is so wonderful. The fact of the matter is, I can't think of anything more wonderful than this. And he hath blessed us. Now, he's not speaking here something that may be ours when we get to heaven. But he's speaking of something that's ours right now. Somebody says to me, have you had the second blessing? Second blessing? Well, my friend, I'm working way up in the hundreds. In fact, up in the thousands. I've not only had a second blessing, I've had a thousand blessings, by the way. And he's blessed us. And he's done it in Christ. And we're going to see that here because that's something else. And here we are, blessed with all spiritual blessings, and we should see this. It's in the heavenlies. I don't know exactly where the heavenlies are, but I do know where the Lord Jesus is. He's at God's right hand, and we're told here that these blessings are in Christ. Well, may I say to you that we need to be careful with this. He doesn't say here that these blessings are with Christ. Now, there are those that read it like that. Right now, you and I are seated in Christ. Somebody says, you go into heaven someday? The answer is, that's generally given. Well, I hope so. Well, let me say this to you. If you're going to heaven, you're already there in Christ. He's blessed you in the heavenlies, in Christ. And you are there, my friend, regardless of what your position is down here. You're in Christ. Why, your practice down here may not be good, but if you're a child of God, you're already in Christ. Now, some people even misunderstand it like this. I was teaching Ephesians not long ago in a conference, and they called on a brother at the end of the service to lead in prayer. And he got up and he says that, Lord, we just thank you that this morning we've been sitting in the heavenly places in Christ. Well, he missed the point again. We didn't have to come to a Bible study, as important as that is, and have our hearts thrilled with these great spiritual truths to be sitting in the heavenlies. The fact of the matter is, you're in the heavenlies in Christ. Even, my friend, when you're down in the dumps, you can be down in the dumps, but if you're in Christ, you're seated in him. That's something that he's done for us. Now, he's blessed. Blessed be the God and Father. We praise him. Why? Because he's blessed us, now he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And I want you to see something to me that is a tragic thing today, and it's this. The picture that's given, of course, is the book of Joshua, as we've said before, that the children of Israel were given the land of Canaan. And by the way, Canaan is not heaven. Canaan is a picture of where we live today. Canaan could never be heaven because there was enemies there to be fought. There was battles to be fought. And when you get to heaven, they won't be there. Down here is where the battle is being fought. And the interesting thing is this. God gave them the land. But he said to them, every place that your foot shall stand upon, that's going to be yours. That's what he told Joshua. But couldn't Joshua say, well, Lord, you've already given it to us. Let us walk in and take it. My friend, God has blessed us today with all spiritual blessings. We're in Christ. And have you ever stopped to think of what we have in Christ? Christ has been made unto us. He's been made sanctification, justification. I started out in a church as a boy working for my salvation. I didn't do very well with that. May I say to you, Christ is my justification. And then I got saved, and then I tried to work to be good. I didn't do very well at that either. And then I found out that Christ has been made unto me sanctification. May I say, I've got everything in him, blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Friends, you can't improve on that, can you? At least I don't think you can. 
all of that that you have in Christ. And when you come to Christ, you get everything in him. Don't come and tell me today that I have to wait later on and that I have to tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit to give me something special, a baptism or something. Why, my friend, I got it all in Christ. And that's when you say Christ is a curse. You say Christ is a curse when you say to me, I don't get everything in Christ. I got everything when I came to him. Now, there are two ways, though. You've got to lay hold of these possessions, your spiritual possessions. They're yours. I want to tell two stories today, and both of them are true. I was in Chicago many years ago, picked up the evening paper during the week, and this was a little clipping, a little article, and I clipped it out, that was on the front page, actually, of the paper, but way down at the bottom. Wouldn't have to be noticed. And here was the byline, Chicago, June 9. The flop houses and saloons of Chicago's Skid Row were searched today for one Stanley William McKenna Walker, 50, an Oxford graduate and heir to half of an $8 million English estate. The missing persons detail hope that somewhere among the down-and-outers who line the curbs and sleep off wine binges in the cheap hotels, they would find Walker, son of a wealthy British shipbuilder. You know, when I read that, I thought, how tragic it is. Imagine being an heir to a half of eight million dollars and being a wino that's sleeping in two-bit hotels in Chicago. My friend, I felt like sitting down and weeping for that poor fella to think that that was true of him. And then I got to thinking, just think of the children of God today. They're living in cheap hotels. They are living off of the little wine of this world. And I don't mean that necessarily literally, but they engage in cheap entertainment down here. And they are wealthy beyond the dreams of Croesus. Imagine being blessed with all spiritual blessings and living like a pauper down here. And there are a lot of folk in our churches today living just like that. This was tragic. And later on, I was telling that story here in Los Angeles when I was past. And a lady came up to me afterward. She was a visitor from Chicago. She said, Dr. McGee, do you know how that, that story worked out? What really happened? I said, no, I never heard. She said, well, they found him. Oh, I said, well, that was wonderful. No, she said, it wasn't quite so wonderful. She said, they found him dead, sleeping in a doorway a cold night later on that fall in Chicago. Dead. And I thought, of my, how tragic it is to live like that in this life. My, I tell you, to have that and to die like that man died. And a lot of Christians live and die just like that. And yet they're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Now, there's something else that we have in Christ. And I want to tell this other story. And this is a story that is also true. There was out west here years ago an heir to a British nobleman. He was one of the heirs. And he was also living in poverty, just eking out a struggling existence. And finally, when this nobleman died, they began to look for him, and they found him. And when they found him, they told him that he was the heir. And you know, a great deal of publicity was made of it. You know what that fellow did? Why, he believed it. <laughs> he went down to the clothing store and showed them the article. And the lawyer that had come to look for him and had found him while he was with him. And he said, I want the best suit of clothes you've got. <laughs> and he bought a first-class ticket and returned back to England in style. You know why? He believed it. He believed that that was his. And he acted upon it. My friend, you can go either route you want to today. You can go first class as a Christian, or you can go down in the steerage. You can go second, third, fourth class, and a lot of Christians doing that today.
But God wants you to know that you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now, he hasn't promised us physical blessings. He has promised us spiritual blessings. And these are in the heavenlies. They're in Christ. And you're not going to have any spiritual blessing in this life that doesn't come to you through Jesus Christ, my friend. That's just how important he is. He not only has saved us, but he is the one today that blesses us. Oh, how we need to lay hold of him in faith and start living as a child of God should live. Now we come here to this section that is very important. We have attempted to give you this outline before here. We have God the Father plan the church. You see, you wouldn't even build a house today without a blueprint. At least I don't think you would. You'd be very foolish if you did build a house without a blueprint. And here we find that God the Father planned the church. Now, what did he do in planning for the church? Well, there are three things that are mentioned here. He chose us in Christ. And second, he predestinated us to the place of sonship. And third... He made us accepted in the Beloved. Now, I know that I've come here today to a passage of Scripture that's difficult. I want you to gird up your loins or your mind to look at the strongest passage there is in the Word of God. We're going to talk about election. We're going to talk about predestination. And these are two words that are frightening. People run to cover when these words are mentioned. Why, you'd think that they're dirty words. But may I say to you, they're Bible words, and they mean something. And I hope we won't be extreme, but I think that we need to see here that it's something that's very important to see. He says here, according as he chose us in him, that is, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, in order that we should be holy and without blame before him. Now, this verse and these verses that follow this, they're essentially the most difficult verses in Scripture to grasp. They are, first of all, let me say, they are repulsive to the natural man. And unfortunately, the average believer today finds them difficult to accept at face value. The statements are clear. The truth they contain is hard to receive. And I think these two verses are sort of like a walnut, hard to crack, but there's a lot of goody on the inside. Now, let me just add this further word, according as. Do you notice that? According as. And that's the connective which modifies the preceding statement. The spiritual blessings that you and I are given... They are in accord with the divine will. All is done in perfect unison with God's purpose. This world, my friend, and this universe is going to operate according to the plan and purpose of Almighty God. That's important for us to see. Now, we need to get the perspective that in this section here, we see that God, the Father, Plan the church. God the Son paid for the church. God the Holy Spirit protects the church. Now, the source of all of our blessings is actually the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he's blessed us with all these spiritual blessings. And now he carries our mind back to the past eternity and... He makes us realize that salvation is altogether of God, not at all of ourselves. Actually, you and I learn that you and I are not the originator, we're not the promoter, nor are we the consummator of our salvation. He did it all. Now we're looking at this that we said is very difficult. And it's been put in an old hymn, "'Tis not that I did choose thee, For, Lord, that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, but thou hast chosen me. 
And we have one that's very popular today. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. God is the one who planned our salvation way back yonder in eternity before you and I were even in this world at all. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that came down in time and he wrought out our salvation upon the cross when the fullness of time had come. And then God the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us today. He brings us to the place of faith in Christ, saving knowledge of the grace of God that's revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard this story many years ago. It's the story of a black boy down in Memphis, Tennessee. He wanted to join the church, and it was a good conservative church. And the deacons were examining him, and they asked him, they said, how did you get saved? Well, he said, I did my part, and God did his part. And these deacons thought they had him. They said, what was your part, and what was God's part? And the boy said this. He said, my part was the sinning. He said, I ran from God as fast as these rebellious legs would take me and my sinful heart would lead me. I ran from him. And he says, you know, he done took out after me till he done run me down. My friend, there's nothing in a theology book that tells it as well as that. God is the one that did the saving. Our part was the sinning part. It's like a little story that the late Dr. Harry Ironside told about the little boy that was asked, have you found Jesus? And the little fellow said, well, sir, I didn't know he was lost. But he says, I was, and he found me. (laughs) My friend, you don't find Jesus. He finds you. He's the one that went out after the lost sheep. And he's the one that found him. Now listen to this. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, God chose believers in Christ before the foundation of the world. And that means before all time, way back yonder in eternity past. May I say to you, That means, then, that you and I didn't do the choosing. And he didn't choose them because they'd do some good. But he chose them so they could do some good. And the entire choice is thrown back upon the solitary sovereignty of the wisdom and the goodness of God. My friend was Spurgeon that once put it like this. You know, he says, God chose me before I came into the world because he said if he'd waited until I got here, he never would have chosen me. It's God who has chosen us, and we've not chosen him. You remember the Lord Jesus put it like this to his own yonder in the upper room? He said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And as Dr. Camel Morgan put it years ago, he said, you know, that puts the responsibility on him if he did the choosing then he's responsible. And that makes it quite wonderful, friends. You remember God said about the children of Israel, he said, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I'll punish you for your iniquities. Now, God chose Israel in time. He chose the church in eternity. God made the choice in eternity, and there hasn't arisen anything unforeseen to God that has caused him to revamp his program or to change his mind. He knew the end from the beginning. He did it for a purpose, in order that we should be holy and without blame before him. God chose us in order to sanctify us. That's the reason for the choosing. He saves us and he sanctifies us that we might be holy. Now, that's positive. And this has to do with the inner life of the believer. A holy life is demanded 
by election. Now, don't tell me that you can say, well, I'm elected, and there are a great many folk that are saying today, well, I've been saved by grace, and I can do as I please. Paul has already answered that. Paul says, shall we continue in sin because we've been saved by the grace of God? And his answer is, God forbid. You can't do it, friends. If you go on living in sin, it's just because you're a sinner that hasn't been saved. Because a sinner that's been saved is going to change his way of living. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then we're to be without blame. That's the negative side. The believer in Christ is seen before God as without blame. God would not permit Balaam to curse Israel or find fault with his people. Listen to what is said in Numbers 23, 21. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord is God's with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Yes, but if you go down there into the camp of Israel, God did find fault with them, and he judged them, and he was sanctifying and purifying that camp. My friend, if God has chosen you, it's in order that he might make you holy, in order that he might make you without blame, and therefore it means that your life has been changed. And if it hasn't, you're just not one of the elect, that's all. And God wants his children to live lives that are not marked or spotted with sin. And he's made every provision to absolve them from all blame. Remember, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by the way, that answers once and for all this question of the limited atonement that Christ only died for just the elect. This verse makes it clear, died for the world. And I don't care who you are, there's a legitimate offer that's been sent out to you today from God, and that offer is, you can't hide behind it and say, I'm not the elect. You are the elect if you hear his voice. You know, it's glorious and wonderful that the God of heaven would elect some of us down here and save us. And I don't propose to understand all that. fact of the matter is, I just believe it. (laughs) You know, the picture our Lord gave is, here's a great big wide highway. And off of that highway, there's a little narrow entrance. And the entrance has on it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And he has on it another I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Go in and out and find pasture. Now, the very interesting thing is that broad way that leads down that everybody's on, it gets narrow and narrow until finally it leads to destruction. Now, you can keep on it, but you can also turn off if you want to. You can turn off where the invitation is, him that cometh to me, I'll no wise cast out. You can enter in. And the very interesting thing, it is a narrow way as you enter. But after you get in, he says, I've come that they might have life, might have it more abundantly. Oh, my friend, it's wide. They talk about the broad way. The broad way is after you get through the gate. And let me tell you, that's a broad way. The picture is there. And the picture is you have a perfect right in order to make the choice. And it's a legitimate invitation that whosoever will may come. And Moody used to put it in his very quaint way. He said, the whosoever wills are the elect, and the whosoever wants are the non-elect. It's up to you, therefore. The Lord has given you an invitation, and whosoever will may come. (laughs) Don't tell me you've been left out. You haven't. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son of whosoever. And whosoever, that means Vernon McGee, it means you. You can put your name there too. And you can come just because there is the elect. But the interesting thing is we don't know who they are. And you have no right to say that you are the non-elect. 
because if you open your heart, you can come. And that's all you have to do. This idea today that you've got mental reservations, I don't believe you have. <laughs> your problem is you've got sin in your life, and the Bible condemns it. And if you come to Christ, it means you'd have to turn from that. You don't want to turn from it. Now, may I say to you again and again, the Word of God emphasizes that we've been chosen in Him. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And Peter in his epistle, 1 Peter 1.2 elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing is, election and sanctification seem to go together. If God has saved you, he hasn't saved you because you're good, because you're not. I think Paul put it in such a marvelous way over in the epistle to the Romans. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Now, God made it very clear to Moses. He says, So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercies. Now, when Moses went to God in prayer, God says, Moses, I'm going to hear and answer your prayer, but not because you're Moses and the deliverer. Because... I will show mercy on whom I will. I'll show compassion on whom I will. And it's not to him that willeth, nor him that worketh, but it's the God who shows compassion. You want to experience the compassion of God? Then you'll have to return to him. Now, I think the best illustration that we have of this is over in the book of Acts, over in the 27th chapter. You remember that Paul, after that, terrific storm. The ship was listing and about ready to go down, and they had already cast some of the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Now, Paul went to the captain, and he said, "'Be a good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve, say, "'Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar.'" And, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Now, that's God's foreknowledge. That's election. God elected that nobody on that ship would be lost. But you remember a little while after, Paul found a group of these sailors. They were making them a boat. And they intended to go overboard with that boat and try to get to land that way. And Paul said to the captain, he said, Now, look, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Well, now, couldn't the captain say, well, wait a minute, you already told me that none would perish. That's right. That's what Paul said. Now, that's God's side. But he also said, except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. That's their side. They've got to stay in the ship. Now, may I say to you today, God knows who the elect are. I don't. Someone came to Spurgeon one time and said, Mr. Spurgeon, if I believe like you do, I wouldn't preach like you do. You say you believe that they are the elect. Well, then you preach as if everybody can be saved. Well, he says they can. But he says, you see, if God had put a yellow streak up and down the backs of the elect, I'd go up and down the streets lifting up shirt tails, finding out who had the yellow streak up and down their back. Then I'd give them the gospel. Well, he didn't do that. He told me to preach it to every creature and whosoever will may come. My friend, that is our marching order. And as far as I'm concerned, until God gives me the roll call of the elect, I'm going on the whosoever will gospel. That is the one that we're to preach today. And as someone else has put it like this, on the door to heaven from our side, it's whosoever will may enter. I'm the door by me if any man, any man. That means you, any man. Well, then he's going to come in and find past. He's going to find a lie, my friend. But when you get on the other side of the door someday in heaven, you're going to look back, and on that door, it'll be written, Chosen in Him, for the foundation of the world. 
But you know I haven't seen that side of the door yet. And therefore, I give God, since he is God, the right to plan his church. A friend of mine down in Florida showed me the blueprints of a home he was going to build. And he's built a lovely home on a lake. And I looked at the blueprint, and he planned it. They had just laid the foundation. He showed me where everything is going to be. His wife told us where this would be and that. And we were in the home and visited them. And, you know, it's just like they planned it. Now, they didn't have any supernatural knowledge, but as far as I know, nobody's questioned whether they had the right to do that. They did have the right, and that's the way they did it, according to their plan. Now, God's plan the church. After all, this is his universe, and the church is his church. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And love is connected with not this verse, but the next one. In love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to to the good pleasure of his will. Now, somebody says, ooh, there's that word predestination, and that's another frightful word. Friend, that's one of the most wonderful words we have in the Scripture. This is important, is it not? This is a glorious section. And by the way, this is something that we don't hear much about today, do we? If I wasn't going through the Bible, I would have avoided this. I would have taken something else. I'd have talked about the comfort that there is for the saints, because that seems to be the big theme today of most even fundamental preachers. We're all talking about comfort. This is strong medicine. Some folk won't be able to take the medicine. I'm very sorry, but if you take it, it'll do you good. And we need something pretty strong today in this flabby age in which we live. We need to know that we've been chosen in Him and today to stand for God, it'll make all the difference in the world, in your life. We are treading on the mountaintops in the epistle to the Ephesians. We are way back yonder in eternity past when God planned the church. I wasn't back there to give him any suggestions or tell him how I wanted it done, but he's telling me how he did it. And I don't want to be unlovely, but I want to say this. He says to me, you either take it or leave it. This is the way I did it. Maybe you don't like it, but this is the way I did it, and I'm the one that's running this universe, you see. God hasn't turned that over to any political party yet. Thank God for that. And he hasn't turned it over to any individual. And we can thank the Lord for that. And he certainly hasn't turned it over to me. And I tell you, all of us, and shout a hearty amen to that and thank him that he didn't do it that way. Now, we mentioned that there are three things that he has done for us here in this matter of planning the church. First of all, we've seen that he chose us. And that was a pretty hard pill, I think, to take for all of us to swallow. I'm sure that we found that a little difficult. The Father chose us in Christ, and the Father predestinated us to the place of a sonship. We are going to see that today. And then the Father made us accepted in the Beloved. Those are the three things that he did in planning the church. Now, I think we ought to make this very clear also, that men are not lost because they are not elected. They are lost because they are sinners. And that's the way they want it, and they've chosen it that way. Now, the free will of man is never violated because of the election of God. A lost man makes his own choice. And Augustine made that very clear, that if there wasn't free will to accept the grace of God, how could God save the world? And if there be not free will in man... How can the world by God be judged? Therefore, we find that God is the one that did the choosing. Now, I want to make a very strong statement today, and I'm back in Romans. You remember we referred to Romans 9? 
Paul says that there's no unrighteousness with God. And he says, if you really think there is, then you better change your thinking because is there unrighteousness with God? And the answer is, God forbid. And he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Now, let me make this very clear. And this needs to be made today. Because I get the impression in many of these evangelistic campaigns today that people are asked to come forward and that even coming forward is doing something, you see. May I say to you that God says that he's not saving you because you came forward. He's not saving you because you're a nice little boy or a nice little girl. He's not saving you because of the fact that you joined the church. He's not saving you because you have even an inclination to turn to him. God says it's because he extends mercy. And he had to say it even to Moses. You see, Moses could go to the Lord and say, Look, I'm Moses. You remember me? I'm leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. I'm something on the stick. I'm really up there at the top. You'd have a little problem getting along without me, I can assure you. Therefore, I want you to hear my prayer. No, oh, Moses never prayed like that. You read his prayers, and God said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll compassion on whom I'll have compassion. What did he mean? He says, So then it's not of him that will it, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, Will you listen to me very carefully at this particular point? He says, Moses, I'm going to hear your prayer, and I'm going to answer it. Not because you're Moses, because it's not to him that will it, and it's not to him that run it, but it's God that showeth mercy. My friend, I'm going to be in heaven someday, and I'm not going to be there because Vernon McGee is a nice little boy. He's not. You just don't know me like I know myself. If you did, you'd tune your radio out. But wait a minute, don't tune it out. Because if I knew you like you know yourself, well, I wouldn't speak to you. (laughs) So let's stay together, will you? Because we're both in the same boat, by the way. We're all lost sinners. And the reason that I'm going to be in heaven is not because I became a preacher It's not because I joined the church. It was not because I was, and talk about baptized, I have been immersed and I have been sprinkled. My wife, she belonged to a Southern Baptist church, and she's always prided herself in being immersed. And I said, it's sure going to be funny if we get to heaven and find out that the Lord was really taking sprinkling after all, and that might leave you out, but I'm going to make it because I got both. Well, that's ridiculous. Why? Because, my friend, it's not those things at all that are going to put you in heaven. The reason I'm going to be in heaven is because of the mercy of God. I'm a lost sinner. And until you and I are willing to come to God as a nobody and then let him make us a somebody, you and I will never get saved. Your best resolutions must totally be waived. Your highest ambitions be crossed. You need never think you'll ever be saved. Now, first, you'll learn you're lost. You're lost, friend. That's your condition. And God is prepared to extend mercy to you. And you've got a free will. And don't tell me that you've got intellectual problems, hurdles to get over. You don't have any. The problem with you and the problem with me was not that we had trouble with Jonah or we had trouble with Noah and the ark. Our problem today is that the Bible condemns the sin in our lives. And that's the problem. Because of the fact when the heart is willing to turn to God, God will save you. Now, that is something that's, I know, rather strong, but Maybe somebody today needs to say it like this. And he's done this in order that he might bring you and me into heaven someday. 
When we get there, we're going to find out he did it. Now we come to this next thing God did for us, and I have to go back in verse 4 and lift out that little expression, that phrase, in love. That doesn't belong really with the election. It belongs here with predestination. In love, having predestinated. Now, somebody's going to say, well, I never knew you could get predestination and love even in the same county, let alone in the same verse. But here they are. In love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, this word predestinate is a word that's been frightful to a great many people. And predestination is a word that comes from proorisis, a Greek word, and it means to define, to mark out, set apart. It means to horizon. You go out, especially if you're in flat country, and look around, you see you are in a certain area, and you can only see to the horizon. That's the word. You are horizoned. You are put in that area. Now, may I say that predestination is never used in reference to unsaved people. God never predestinated anybody to be lost. If you are lost, it's because you've rejected God's remedy. Here is the thing. Here's a man lying on a bed dying. The doctors come in and prescribe to him and says, here's a medicine. If you take it, it'll heal you. The man looks at the doctor in amazement and says, I don't believe you. And he leaves that glass of medicine there by his desk. He could reach out and take it, and he won't take it. Now the man dies, and the doctor's report says he dies of a certain disease. And that's accurate. But may I say to you, there was a remedy there, and he actually died because he didn't take the remedy, don't you think? May I say to you that today God has provided the remedy. Now, God has never predestinated anybody to be lost. That is something that you will have to determine yourself. That's where your free will comes in. Now, predestination has to do with the saved. And all it really means is that when God starts out with a hundred sheep, he's going to come through with a hundred sheep. That's all in the world it means. Again, if you go back to the epistle to the Romans, you find that wonderful verse that's quoted so often in verse 28 in the 8th chapter. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And as Dr. Tari used to say, that's a wonderful verse for a tired heart to pill it its head on. Is that verse there? And it is. To them that are called according to his purpose. Now, this that follows goes with it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, you see, we talk now about saved people. He called, and whom he called, and he also justified. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. In other words, when God starts out with a hundred sheep, he'll come through with a hundred sheep. Now, that's a good percentage, because I was told by one of the sheep growers, or raisers, out in San Angelo, Texas, years ago, that very frankly, he said that, they would appreciate getting 65%. He said, we can make money if we get 65% of the sheep we start out with, if we can get them to market. Well, may I say to you, what would it hurt if one little old sheep got lost? Well, I'll tell you what the Lord Jesus said about that. He said a man had a hundred sheep. One little old sheep got out and got a loss. Most of us do that even after we get saved. Now, we don't lose our salvation but we sure get out of fellowship with him. We get way out yonder. And some people think they actually lose their salvation. But the little old sheep is still a sheep, and he's way out yonder, and he's lost. And all we like sheep have gone astray. That's our propensity. That's our tendency. That's the direction we go. We don't go toward God. We go from him. 
and we get out yonder away from him. And what does the shepherd do? Well, he went out to look for that little sheep. I'm confident that that man who raised his sheep in San Angelo, Texas, I don't believe he'd go out on a cold, blustery, stormy night to get one little old sheep. I think he'd say, let him go. Thank God we got a shepherd that never says that. He said, I started out with a hundred sheep. I'm going to come through with a hundred sheep. And it's just as simple as this. He starts out with a hundred sheep. Now, the day comes when he's counting them in yonder in heaven, way out yonder, somewhere in the future. And he starts out one, two, three, four, five. Ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, 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 ninety-nine. What in the world happened to Vernon McGee? Well, we just lost one, so I think we let it go at that. A lot of folk didn't think Vernon McGee is going to make it anyway. And thank God he won't do it that way. If I'm not there, my friend, when he counts them in, he's going to go look for me, and he's going to bring me in. That's what predestination means. I don't know about you. I love the word. He's guaranteed. That's his guarantee. He says, I've lost none of those that were given to me. And I love it that way. And if sheep are safe, it's not because they're smart little sheep, because they're stupid little fellas. If they're safe, it's because they got a wonderful shepherd. That's the glorious, wonderful thing about it. Now, that's the second thing that he does for us. But he's predestinated us to the adoption of sons. Now, I'm not going into that because I have dealt with that in Galatians. Adoption means he's brought us into the place of a full-grown son. And that means two very important things. It means, first of all, we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, that the child of God has been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the new relationship the Lord Jesus talked about to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, it means something else. Adoption does. It means a position and a privilege. It means that we have been saved and not only born into the family of God as a babe in Christ, but we've been given the position of an adult son. And it means now that we are in the position that we can understand the Father. Now, it's wonderful. I've got a heavenly Father today, and I've been a babe a long time. But, you know, he told me that he's put me in my position where I can understand him. Today we can understand. And how? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And all of this has been through Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. as one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And all of this, friends, is for the glory of God, For now, he ends all of this each time by singing this glorious doxology, this wonderful psalm of praise. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, all of this is done on the basis of grace. And I'm going to talk about grace when we get to the second chapter. But it's on the basis of grace, and the end is the glory of God. Inception is grace. Conception is adoption. Reception is for His glory. And the beloved refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me from the foundation of the world. God sees the believer in Christ, and he accepts the believer just as he receives his own son. That's wonderful. That's the only basis I'll be able to be in heaven. I can't stand there on the merit of Vernon McGee. I can only accept it in the Beloved. 
And again, the Lord Jesus said in John 17, 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. God loves the believer just as he loves Christ, because the believer is in Christ. How wonderful. This is the threefold work performed here by the Father God. The Father chose us in Christ. The Father predestinated us to the place of sonship. The Father has made us accepted in the Beloved. And all of this is to the praise of the glory of His grace. He's the one that gets the credit. He's the one that did it all. And, you know, that's going to be for your good and my good. I don't know about you today. I'm going to revel in this. I'm going to rejoice in this. And, my friend, I'm going to talk about this because it's worth talking about. And it's lots more valuable than a lot of the chit-chat that I hear today that goes under the name of religion. Oh, my friend, how we need to see the grace of God as it's revealed in Christ. Now, today we see God the Son paid for the church. And first we have here, He redeemed us through His blood. Let me read verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, these verses here are actually like mountain peaks. We've just been leaping from one to the other. And I keep thinking, well, we're going to come to one where we can just touch down and then take off again. But it's not quite like that. This is so important and so vital for us today. Now, we are told here we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. This is very important for us to see. He's redeemed us through his blood. Now, we move from eternity in the time. Back in eternity past, God chose, God predestinated, made us accepted in the Beloved. Now we come out of eternity into time, where the plans of God the Father are now placed in the hands of Christ, who moves into space and time to construct the church. And now it is a historical fact that Jesus was born into this world 1,900 years ago. God intruded into humanity. And there, after being in this earth for 33 years, he died upon a cross, buried, rose again bodily, ascended into heaven. Those are the historical facts that the Word of God gives us. And while he was here, he redeemed us. And he redeemed us through his blood. Now, this is something that's not popular today. The thing that most people like is a beautiful religion, one that appeals to their aesthetic nature. The cross of Christ does not appeal to the aesthetic part of man. It doesn't appeal to the pride of man. And unfortunately today that, well, of course, all the liberal churches, but even a few of the so-called Bible churches today make an appeal to the old nature, to man. And therefore, there is no emphasis on the blood of Christ. It's rather repulsive. A lady went up years ago to the late Dr. G. Campbell Morgan. I'm told it was up in Philadelphia. And she was one of these dowagers that had a lorgnette. You know what a lorgnette is. It's a snare on the end of a stick. And she went up with that lorgnette and said to him, Dr. Morgan, I do not like to hear about the blood. It's repulsive to me. It offends my aesthetic nature. And Dr. Morgan looked at her in his characteristic manner, and he says, I agree with you that it's repulsive. 
But he says the only thing repulsive about it is your sin and mine. That's the thing that's repulsive about the blood redemption and the forgiveness of sins, my friend. And then I'm told years ago that when a new pastor came to the great church in Washington, D.C., that a couple came down to him and said, we trust that you are not going to put too much emphasis on the blood. The last pastor we had, he just talked about the blood all the time. And we hope that you will not emphasize it too much. Oh, he looked at him and says, you can be assured. I won't emphasize it too much. And they said, look pleased and thanked him for it. He says, but just a minute. He says, you know, you can't emphasize it too much. And he continued to emphasize the blood. Well, it's repulsive to man. We have redemption through his blood. Now, the writer to the Hebrews puts it like this. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it's written of me to do thy will, O God, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now, you see, God drew the blueprint for the church. And the Son, he comes into time to form the church with nail-pierced hands. And the entire context of the Old Testament sets forth the expiation of sins by the blood of an animal sacrifice. Yet this, as the writer to the Hebrews says here, could not take away sins. Only Christ could execute that. That's what Paul means. In whom, that is in Christ, we have our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sin, according to the riches of his grace. Now, this is the one who's called the Beloved, accepted in the Beloved, that's Christ, and in whom we have redemption. Now, redemption is the primary work of Christ. Actually, the word is here, the redemption. In whom we have the redemption is the literal, and that gives prominence and position of the fact that it's named first. It's given top priority. That's what Christ did for us when he came to this earth. He made it that way. He said that. Matthew 20, 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, he came to pay a price for your redemption and mine. We were slaves in sin, and he came to pay a price to deliver us, to give us liberty. Now, there are three words that are found in the New Testament which are translated by the one English word, redemption. The word that is very important is the word agorazo. Now, that word agorazo, it really means to buy in the marketplace. That is the way that it is used. It means to buy in the marketplace. And the picture is this. Here goes a housewife out of a morning to the marketplace. She wants to buy some vegetables and a roast for the day. And she goes in and she sees the roast and the vegetables. She puts down cash 
on the barrel head, and she pays the price. And now they belong to her, of course. In other words, the only thought in this word is just to buy and take out. That's the word that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 6.20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He went in and bought us out of the slave market. That is the word. And that's all this word means. Now, there's another word that is used, and that is the Greek word ex agorazo. Now, that means to buy it out of the market, and the thought there is to buy it for its own use. Now, you see, somebody could go into the marketplace and buy that roast and buy vegetables and go down to the next town where they're short of those items and put them up for sale for a price. But ex agorazo means to take it out of the marketplace and never to sell it again. It's not to be put up for sale anymore. And that's the thought that is in this word. And by the way, we find this word over in the third chapter of Galatians at verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now, that means that Christ not only redeemed us, but he redeemed us that we would not be exposed for sale again. That he paid the price and he's taken us off of the market. We're never to be exposed for sale again. Well, there is a third word, and this third word is apolutrosis. Now, apolutrosis is an altogether different word, you see, and that's the word that Paul uses here. We have redemption, and it's pretty important, by the way, I think, for us to see that, that we have redemption, and we have redemption through his blood. We are told, for instance, in Luke, 21, 28, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, that's a marvelous word. It means not only to go into the marketplace, put cash on the barrel head. It means not only to take it out of the market to use for your own private use and never to sell it again, but it means now to set free, to pay a price and to set free. It means to liberate. When the ransom is paid, it means to buy out of slavery in order to set a person free. And this is the word that we have here. Now, man's been sold under sin, and he's in the bondage of sin. All you have to do is look around you today. Man is a rotten, corrupt sinner, and he can't do anything else but sin. And he's a slave to sin. Now, Christ came to pay the price of his freedom. And that's what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, If the Son make you free, you'll be free indeed. Now, here is something else that is quite wonderful. We are told that we have redemption through his blood. That's the price he paid. And Peter speaks of that blood. He says, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Now, the blood of Christ is more valuable than silver or gold. To begin with, there's not too much of it. What is it, three gallons in a human body? Or is there that much? Well, anyway, it's a, a limited supply, and that always runs a price up, you know, the scarcity of the item. But the important thing is that one drop of that blood would save every sin on top of this earth if he'd trust it. And we have redemption now through his blood. And he saves us that way because he says, without shedding of blood is no remission of sin. That's an Old Testament principle. And it's applicable to the entire human race from Adam down to the last man. We've been redeemed now. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, that can't redeem you, but the precious blood of Christ. Now, we have also, in connection with this, the forgiveness of our sins or our trespasses. 
Now, forgiveness, therefore, is not the act of an indulgent deity who's moved by sentiment to the exclusion of justice and righteousness and holiness. Forgiveness depends on the shedding of blood. It depends on the payment of the penalty for sin. Now, I think right here we ought to learn to make a distinction. Human forgiveness and divine forgiveness are not the same. Actually, forgiveness means that you just send it off or away. Actually, that means that you just mark out the account. Now, human forgiveness is always based on the fact that a penalty is deserved and that the penalty is forgiven. May I say to you, divine forgiveness is never that. It always means there can be no forgiveness apart from the execution of the penalty. In other words, human forgiveness comes before the penalty is executed. And divine forgiveness, the penalty has to be executed. You know, that is something that it's too bad that our entire legal system that has bogged down today and we're living in a lawless nation where it's not safe to be on the streets of our cities at night. Why? Because of the leniency on the part of certain judges throughout this land. And as a result, well, we're in a bad way. And they think that it's easy to sit on a bench and you feel big-hearted if you tell a criminal that you're free. But the penalty, my friend, has to be executed. The very interesting thing is, I heard a judge make this statement. He says, well, if God can forgive, then I can forgive. I want to say something. God paid the penalty. Is that judge willing to go and pay the penalty? I don't think you have any right to take men out of death row unless you're willing to take their place because a penalty must be executed. And God forgives on the basis a penalty has been executed. When was it executed? When Christ shed his blood 1,900 years ago? Sure, that's not aesthetic. That doesn't appeal to the refined nature of civilized man today. Of course it doesn't. But his sin doesn't seem to be so bad. That's sophistication. That's because he's a suave individual and clever. My friend, he's a lost, hell-doomed sinner. And God cannot forgive until the penalty has been executed. And that penalty has been executed. And that's the reason that right back to back in the Word of God in the New Testament, when you talk about forgiveness, the blood of Christ is put there. It depends on the blood of Christ whether you are going to be forgiven or not. That's how valuable the blood of Christ. I said it last time. I say it again. Come to God as a nobody. And let him make you a somebody. He can forgive you your sins because he paid the penalty for your sins. And that's the only way that you and I today can have forgiveness of sins. Now, will you notice what he says over in Acts 26, 18? I'd like to read that for you. Paul is giving here his testimony, and he said that he was sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me, that is, in the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say to you that forgiveness depends on what Christ has done for us on the cross. Notice Luke 24, 47. And again, here the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, and that repentance and remission of sins. And remission, here's forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Your witnesses of these things. Now, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul says it again in Colossians 1.14. Now, the shedding of the blood of Christ and his death 
is the foundation for forgiveness, and without this, sine qua non, which means without that, nothing. Nothing. God cannot forgive you until the penalty has been paid. Thank God today the penalty has been paid. Now, Paul put it like this in Romans 4.25, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And that word offense is the word for sins here. You will have forgiveness of sins. That's the word that's used for Adam's transgression, you see here. And we are told, who was delivered for our offenses, was raised again for our justification. And so that the entire list of sins which is chargeable to man are forgiven on the basis of the blood of Christ. Christ bought the church foul that he might make it fair, is the way Augustine put it. And this, by the way, is according to the riches of his grace. Now, that's an interesting expression. He doesn't say, out of the riches of his grace, but it's according to the riches of his grace. Let me illustrate the difference there. I read many years ago that when the late John D. Rockefeller played golf down in Florida, he always gave the caddy a dime. And I always felt like that almost broke the man each time to pay out that handsome sum. But you see, he didn't give according to his riches. He gave out of his riches. And I do believe he could have made it a little bit better than that. But he gave out of his riches, not according to his riches. Say, if he'd have given according to his riches, the caddy would have been rich. Well, you see, God has given according to the riches of his grace. And friends, we haven't come to that word grace yet that we're going to deal with, but God's got a lot of grace. <laughs> He's rich in it. And he is willing to give according to his riches of his grace. Oh, he has had to bestow so much on me, and he's got enough left for you. And you, and you, way up yonder at the North Pole, we're on a station up there. It must be cold up there. But God's grace is rich up there. And then way out yonder across the Pacific, some of you hear this message. God's got, oh, he is rich in grace. He has enough for you. Just come to him. We can find grace to help. God's rich in grace. He can save you and he can keep you. Now, that word redemption we looked at is such a tremendous, wonderful word. It means that he paid a price in order to save us, that we were sold under sin, slaves of sin, and he paid a price, and we have forgiveness because he paid the price. And the forgiveness of God is different than man's forgiveness. Today, man will forgive a person because of a debt that has not yet been paid, but should be paid. And God's forgiveness is based on the fact that he forgives because the penalty has been paid and the price has been paid. Christ, by his blood, has purchased our redemption. And it's a glorious redemption, as we've seen. It means that he went into the marketplace where we were sold on the slave block of sin, and he purchased us. He bought us, all of us. But there's another word he uses, and that's ex and that is, he's going to use us for himself, that it's personal, and established a personal relationship. And then there's another wonderful word, and that was apolutrosis. He went into the marketplace, he bought us to set us free. If the Son make you free, you will be free indeed. Now, somebody says, doesn't that sort of upset the hymn that says, I gave, I gave my life for you. What hast thou done for me? My friend, it sure does. Because the very word redemption that's used here means he never asked you that. That's the glorious thing about this word grace is when God saves you by grace, it doesn't put you in debt 
to him. Somebody says, but aren't you supposed to serve him? You sure are. But it's on another basis now and relationship. And you say, what's that? Well, the relationship now is love. The Lord Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, because I'm dying for you, you're to keep my commandments. If you love me. And today, if you love him, he wants your service. If you want to say today, I don't love him, then may I say, forget about this business of service. I hear so much about commitment to Christ today. My friend, you and I got very little to commit to him. But we're to respond in love to him. And that's on a different basis altogether. Because we love him. We love him because he first loved us. I heard this story many years ago, and it's the kind of story that you're not supposed to tell today, but I still tell them. I guess I'm still a square. But it illustrates a great truth. In my Southland, and I hate to say this, but in the days of slavery, there was a beautiful girl put on the slave block to be sold. And there was a very cruel slave owner, brutal fella, that began to bid. And every time he would bid, the girl would cringe, and a look of fear came over her face. And there was present there another man who was a plantation owner, and he owned slaves too, but he was good to his, and he saw what was happening. So he joined in the bidding, and finally he outbid the other fella, and he purchased the girl went up and put the price down, started to walk away, and she started after him. And he turned and said, well, what are you doing and where are you going? And she said, well, you bought me. <laughs> oh, he said, you misunderstood. I didn't buy you because I need a slave. I don't. I don't want one. I bought you to set you free. And she stood there stunned for just a moment. Then all of a sudden, she dropped her knees. Why, she said, I'll serve you forever. But my friend, that's the basis that Jesus wants you to serve him. If you're willing to come to him and accept him as Savior, and he loved you and he gave himself, but he had to pay a price for you. And he paid that price, his blood. And therefore, there's forgiveness of sin. Now somebody says, brother, don't love him. Well, my friend, he's not asking you to serve him. But if you love him, he wants you to serve him, by the way. And that's what that's all about, that matter of redemption. We have forgiveness, and that's according to the riches of his grace. Now, we come to the second wonderful thing, and that is he's revealed the mystery of his will here. And I read now verses 8 and 9 and 10, in which... He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him." That's a wonderful passage of Scripture. That means that he's revealed also to us today the mystery of his will. Now, what is that? Well, to begin with, what does he mean when he says a mystery? Now, as I indicated last time, that when we looked at the word mystery, we'd say it's not a whodunit. This is not something that Agatha Christie wrote. This is not something that Conan Doyle wrote. And this is not Sherlock Holmes by any means that we're talking about. A mystery is not a whodunit. A mystery in Scripture means that God is revealing something that up to that time he has not revealed before. And not only that, I have put in my book on Ephesians this twofold meaning of it. It cannot be discovered by human agencies because it's a revelation from God And then it's revealed at the proper time and not concealed. And enough is revealed to establish the fact without all the details being disclosed. Now, there are many mysteries in the New Testament. And I've listed those. There are 11 of them that are mentioned. 
And may I just intrude by saying this. Did you know that God hasn't told us everything? There are a lot of things God hasn't told us. There are many questions that I would like to ask God myself. There are a great many people that send in questions to us, and on some of the stations we have a question and answer program. We attempt to answer those questions. Well, I've got questions too. And I don't know who to ask, because nobody down here knows the answer. But someday, he'll reveal them to us. I've got quite a few things I want to ask him. Now, that is a mystery. It's something he hasn't revealed, but he now has revealed it to us. And in the New Testament, why, there is this wonderful mystery that was not really revealed in the Old Testament. Now, what is that mystery? Well, in which he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, this expression, in all wisdom and prudence, actually, it belongs with this next verse, because it seems to be just a dangling sort of a phrase, a clause here. But if you put it with the other, "...having made known unto us the mystery of his will in all wisdom and in all prudence." Now, I think it should be given to us like that. Now, what is the mystery of his will? It's that which he's revealed according to wisdom and prudence. This is not some little ABC something. I, very frankly, today rejoice that there are so many agencies and individuals that are trying to get out what they call the simple gospel. And I thank the Lord that so many folk write and tell us that you're making the gospel simple. We can understand it. And I appreciate that, because that's what we're to do. Uh, As Dr. Ironside used to say, put the cookies on the bottom shelf where the kiddies can get to them. But may I say to you that there are the depths and the wisdom of God that you and I can't probe even. And therefore, we ought to bring to it all the mental acumen that we've got in order to try to understand something of the great purposes of God and the plan of God. And God wants us to know these things because now this mystery has been revealed. Now, just what is this mystery? He says here that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, Now, that word dispensation is another wonderful word like mystery. What is a dispensation? And it's misunderstood. Now, there are a great many people today that think that's a dirty word. Well, it's not. It's a great word. And the Bible teaches dispensation. Maybe that's new to you because that's something that even some of our dispensational brethren today don't say. One of the Outstanding Bible teachers of years ago told me, he says, I never use the word because it is a word that's hated. Well, there are a lot of words that are hated. Blood is one that the world doesn't like either. And redemption is another word that's not popular. And the cross, Paul says, is an offense. And I don't want to magnify an offense, but we certainly shouldn't ignore it. Now, let's not ignore this. Let me say, first of all, that the dispensation is not a period of time. That's where dispensation differs with the word age. We hear of the age of grace. Well, may I say to you, that's a period of time. Now, dispensation is an altogether different word, and it's translated several different ways. For instance, it's called a stewardship in certain places called an order in another place, called an administration. Well, now, here, it's a dispensation. Now, what is the word? Well, I'll not give the Greek word, but we have an English word that actually is a transliteration of the word, and that is the word economy. And today, economy is a way of doing things. It's an order, a system that is put in. Now, we have today, I know in school, that was what was known, they taught the girls domestic economy. Well, what is domestic economy? Well, that's the way you run the household. That's the way that you run the household. You're going to have baked beans maybe tomorrow night for dinner, 
and the lady of the house, she purchases a roast, and they're going to have that roast a little later on in the week, and she sets up the order, and that's the way she runs it. Now, maybe down the street there's another family. They wouldn't have that roast on Friday. They're going to have fish on Friday. That's all right. That's the way they run the house, and they've got a right to run it like that. It's the way a thing is run. Now, there's a political economy. That's another thing. They teach that in our colleges today, and there are a lot of young men that go into that field today, and unfortunately, that's where all the radicals seem to center today, in the field of political economy. Well, it's the way that you run a government, the way you run a nation. Now, over in England, they run things over there different than they do over here, and I'm not sure that either place has got the right system, but that's neither here nor there. And we certainly wouldn't better it by taking on Russia's system. And the interesting thing is that in England, they drive down the left-hand side of the street. I had a lot of fun with our guide over there. And he was a Britisher who had a real sense of humor. And I had a lot of fun with him. And he told me some very good English stories. And I shared with him a few of mine from this country. But anyway... Why, I would kid him as we'd drive along. I said, look out, there comes a car on the wrong side of the street. And you run into it. And he said, well, I'm going on the wrong side of the street. But he says, over here, it's the right side of the street. And I said, over here, the right is left. And I said, my, that's confusing to a poor American over here. But that's the way they run it, you see. That's political economy. Now, what is a dispensation? A dispensation fits into a period of time, but it's the way God runs something at a particular time. It's the way God does things. Now, God had Adam on a different arrangement than he has you and me. I think that the most ardent amillennialists can understand that the Garden of Eden was different than it is today in Southern California, although there are a lot of people thought that this was the Garden of Eden, and I thought that when I first came out here, but it's got filled with smog now and traffic, and too many of us came out here. Now, that is a different situation back yonder in the Garden of Eden. God was dealing with Adam differently than he has us. Everything, I'm confident, rests upon one method of salvation. God's never had but one way to save folk. But the approach in man under that system has always been different. Abraham brought a little lamb to God, <laughs> and so did Abel. And God said that was the right way. But I hope you didn't take a lamb to church Sunday. If you want to bring a leg of lamb in, I'm sure the minister would like to have a leg of lamb. But that's not the way you approach God today, you see. We're under different economy. Now, he says here that in the economy of the fullness of times. Now, what is the fullness of times? Now, I can't go into all phases of that, but you know that God is moving everything, and this is the fullness, the pleroma, when everything is going to be brought under the rulership of Jesus Christ, and the day is coming that thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that's not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him, because we're in a different dispensation today. You may not like the word, but it's a good one. <laughs> and we're in a different economy today. Now there's coming a day when every knee must bow, every tongue must confess that Jesus is the Lord, and God's moving everything in that direction. Now that's something that hadn't been revealed in the past. Now because of the redemption that we have in Christ and the fact there is a church today, that's the thing he's revealed to us. God is moving toward the day when every knee must bow to Jesus Christ, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. You see, heaven and earth are out of tune today. We're playing our own little tune. We've got rock music going down here. They don't have it up there. The only rock up there is the Lord Jesus. He's the rock, that precious stone. 
that is the foundation on which the church rests today. But that's a different figure of speech than we have in this chapter. Now we do notice the third thing in verse 11, "...in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will." Now, he rewards us with an inheritance. And he rewards us with something we haven't done. How wonderful this is. Now, may I call your attention to this? And this is a very wonderful thing. He says here, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Now, in the overall purpose and plan of God, believers have a part. They are going to inherit with Christ. And they're going to inherit with Christ because they're in Christ. And Paul says in Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Now, these are some of the wonderful things. And then over in 1 Corinthians three twenty one, he makes this statement here, Therefore let no man glory. In men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos, Cephas or the world or life or death or things present, things to come, all are yours. And you're Christ. Christ is God. I don't know. That tremendous statement God makes, I don't grasp it all, but it causes me to be lifted from the seat in which I'm sitting and just carried right into the skies. My friend, everything's mine. Everything is mine. Christ belongs to me. Paul belongs to me. Even death may belong to me. All of it's mine. And it's because he's given it to me. So it's going to be an experience. And Christ is mine and God is mine. Oh, friend, how wonderful that is. I don't know about you, I feel like shouting because this is so wonderful that he's done for us here. And he predestinated this. He determined it. You see, predestination always refers to the saved. God never predestinated anybody to be lost, but he predestinated us to get an inheritance. And if he hadn't predestinated it to me, I wouldn't get one, because the reward I do not deserve. And this is God's will. And that's the only basis on which this is done. And it's good, and it's right, and it's best. Why? Because God purposed it, my friends, and you can't have it any better than that. Oh, these are the three wonderful things that Christ has done for us. He paid for the church, and I belong to him because he paid a price. How wonderful it is. I can't lose. (laughs) Oh, how wonderful this is. Now, will you notice what verse 12 says? It's one of these glorious doxologies at the end of every time that Paul tells of what one person of the Godhead did. Paul stops and sings the doxology. And then he moves to the next. And here, having told us about the work of the Son, he redeemed us through his blood. He revealed the mystery of his will, and he rewards us with an inheritance And now in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now, that's a very wonderful thing. The believer is for the praise of his glory. Now, God does not exist, friends, to satisfy the whim and wish of the believer. But the believer exists for the glory of God. And when the believer is in the center of the will of God, He's living a life of fullness and of satisfaction and joy. That's the place of satisfaction and joy. And that'll deliver you from the hands of the psychologist, friends. When you move into this area today, and when you're not in that area, there's trouble of brewing for you. That we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now, that adds purpose and meaning to life, to know that your life and my life, and when you put both of them together, you and I don't have very much, do we, to offer. But we're going to be for the praise of His glory. 
God will be able throughout the endless ages of eternity future to point to you and me and say, look there. <laughs> you know, they weren't worth saving, but I love them and I saved them. And that's the thing that gives worth and standing and dignity and purpose and joy and glory to us. We exist today for the praise of His glory. And that is good enough. Now, this doxology, of course, looks forward to the coming of Christ. And this is the second one we've had. We'll get a third one now in a few moments. Now we come to the last. And, of course, we can only mention it. We're going to see now what the Holy Spirit does. We'll see that next time. God the Holy Spirit protects the church. God the Father planned the church. God the Son paid for the church. God the Holy Spirit protects the church. I tell you, church is very important to Him today. The little plans of man down here say they're not important. They think they are. Men are running around with a blueprint for the world. Well, they won't even be around here. In the next hundred years, this crowd will all be gone. But God's great plan is going to be carried out. Thank God for that. Aren't you rejoicing today, friends? Wherever you are, whoever you are, however you are. Now we come to the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit regenerates us. Verse 13 here. And then we're going to see the Holy Spirit seals us. And the Holy Spirit is the earnest of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit regenerates us. The Holy Spirit is a refuge for us. The Holy Spirit gives reality to life. We have regeneration, a refuge, and reality in the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, now let's look at this. In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I think this section right through here is without doubt one of the most wonderful sections, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth. Now, what's he talking about here? Somebody says he doesn't mention regeneration. <laughs> well, he mentions regeneration here, but the way he does it, is a marvelous way, because now we are passing from God's work for us, which is objective. That was the work of God in planning the church, the work of the Lord Jesus in redeeming the church and paying for it. And now the Holy Spirit protecting, it's different. You see, God's work for us is objective. And God's work in both the Father and the Son, and it was performed by the Father and Son. But now the work of the Holy Spirit is in us, and that's subjective. Now, in this work of regeneration and renewing, the Holy Spirit causes a sinner to hear and believe in his heart. That which makes a child of God, you see. How do we become a child of God? Well, the Lord Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, how am I to be born again? To as many as received him. To them gave he the right, the exousion power, to become the sons of God, even to those that don't do any more than just believe in his name. But here it says, in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth. Now, hearing means to hear not just the sound of words, but to hear with understanding. We have that over in 1 Corinthians Paul says here that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, who are the called? Are they the ones that just heard no, it's more than just hearing the sound of words. It means those that heard with understanding. He called them. 
And it's not just a call of, of hearing words, but it's a call where the Holy Spirit made real these words. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And it's those that were called and heard, and they heard the Word of God and responded to it. And what did happen? Well, Peter put it like this, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now, it's like this. The Word of God goes out as it's going out right now. And we're saying that the Son of God died for you. And if you trust Him, you'll be saved. Well, you say, I hear what that preacher is saying, but it means nothing to me. But there's somebody else hearing it, and the Spirit of God is applying it to their heart, and they are believing, they're trusting. And when they trust Christ, they're being regenerated. Oh, this is marvelous. You see, believing is the logical step after hearing. Not necessarily the chronological, but the logical step. You believed after you heard, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth. And that's the way you're born again, friends. This is the closest to explaining what it means to be born again that I know of any place in the word of God. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your deliverance, in whom also after ye believe. And when you say after here, I'd like to change that, because, again, there's always that understanding today that these are time phrases, and they're really not time phrases or clauses at all. They are what is known in the Greek as a genitive absolute, and they're the same tense as the main verb. In other words, when you heard and you believed, then at that time you were sealed. It all took place at the same time. And that's where baptism comes in. You are baptized the moment that you trust Christ. You are sealed the moment that you trust Christ. Now, sealing is the second great work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit first opens the ear to hear. Then he implants faith. And his next logical step, do you see, is to seal the believer. Now, I know today there are those that argue that there's a distinction as to whether God the Father or God the Son seals with the Holy Spirit or whether the Holy Spirit himself does the sealing. And... May I say to you that that type of argument today, it wearies my tiredness. I get tired of hearing that type of arguing because, after all, to try to split hairs like that is like they did in the Middle Ages. They used to argue how many angels could dance on the point of a needle. You toss that around for a little while, and that'll get you nowhere to argue this. I understand it to mean that the Holy Spirit is the seal, because actually God the Father gave the Son to die on the cross. We're told that. But we're also told that God the Son offered up himself willingly. Both are true. Now, God the Father and God the Son both sent the Holy Spirit to perform a definite work. But the Holy Spirit performs the work. He regenerates the sinner, and he seals the saved, and I think he himself is the seal. Now, the sealing work of the Holy Spirit, I think, is twofold. He implants the image of God upon the heart to give reality. You know, a seal is put down on a document, and that seal has an image upon it. And I think that's exactly what he does for the believer today. I think that is the thought that we have over in John three thirty-three. He that receiveth his testimony hath set his seal that God is true. God puts the imprint upon him, you see. Now, the second aspect of the sealing is to denote rightful ownership. Nevertheless, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
Now, because he makes you secure doesn't mean you can live in sin. Because it means if you even name the name of Christ, you're going to depart from iniquity. And if you don't, you weren't sealed, apparently. And that means you weren't regenerated. The Holy Spirit is the seal. And that guarantees that he's going to deliver us. Because Paul, a little later on in this epistle, will say we're sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. One day he'll deliver us to Christ. And it's nice to be sealed like that. You can have a letter insured today. They put a seal on it. They stamp it today. Used to seal it, but today they stamp it. And when that stamp's on there, the post office said, we're going to deliver it. However, they don't always deliver mail. I'm not going to get off on that again. I have too many mail carriers and people work in post office who listen to me, and they're good people. And they think I condemn all folk because... Sometimes letters don't get through, but very frankly, that seal guarantees the deliverance of the letter. And all of this is for what purpose? Verse 14, the third work of the Holy Spirit, who is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now, earnest money is money that if you want to buy a piece of property and you want them to hold it for you, you put so much money down. That means more is to follow. Now, the Holy Spirit is the earnest money. God's given to us the Holy Spirit, and that means he's got more things he's going to give us later on. We've already seen we have an inheritance. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. And earnest money means more is to follow. And all of this is to the praise of his glory. And here's now our third doxology that we've had here And the interesting thing is, when Paul considers the work of the triune God for us, why he has a great doxology to offer, a praise to God. Now we have the prayer of Paul. Because you see that what happens here is that not only does the Holy Spirit regenerate us, not only is the Holy Spirit our refuge, but the Holy Spirit gives reality. Now Paul is led to prayer. And so on behalf of the Ephesians, he prays. And you'll notice what he prays for. And it's very important that we remember this in prayer. He says, verse 15, and this is the prayer of Paul. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, will you notice this? Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith and love to the saints. Now, this church was noted for its faith and for its love. Love one for another. Love wasn't a motto. It wasn't a bumper sticker in the Ephesian church. It was real. The believers loved each other. And that was the church at its very highest, the Ephesian church. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, represents the church at its very best. That's the early church. And this is the Ephesian church. And they were noted for their faith in the Lord Jesus and for their love unto all the saints. I tell you, this was a great church. And when Paul heard that, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And you notice his prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. Now, today, the thing that motivates us in prayer for others is trouble, sickness, distress, a crisis. That causes us to pray. Now, I recently was asked to pray for a church that I love a great deal because of the things that are taking place inside of the church no love for the brethren, nothing but gossip, and Bible study no longer the top priority. And some were distressed, and they said, Dr. McGee, pray for this church. Well, I pray for it. That motivates me to pray. Now, Paul, the thing that motivated him was this type of thing also, but also something good caused him to pray. When you hear something good about some child of God, how God is blessing some preacher, some servant of God, 
Do you get out and say, Oh, God, I thank you for this brother and the way you're using it. And when you hear about a wonderful Bible church and the word going out, do you get down and thank God for it? Friends, we turn in too many grocery lists to the Lord. We say, we want this, we want that, we want the other thing. And Lord, will you do this and will you do that? God's no messenger, boy. Why don't you thank him sometime? Have a Thanksgiving service. A preacher friend of mine told me that their prayer meeting got so stale and dull and so small that they tried something new. And they decided one midweek service in the prayer meeting that do nothing but praise God and thank him. He said, we sure had some brief prayers, but we had a good prayer meeting that night. Nobody asked God for anything, just thanked him for what he'd done. I think he'd appreciate all of us having Thanksgiving regularly, not wait once a year, but have it more often than that. And Paul says, when he heard the good news and this wonderful thing about the Ephesian church, he says, I just cease not to give thanks for you. I just went to God and said, Lord, thank you for the Ephesians. Have you ever been to God and say, Lord, I thank you for so-and-so. He's meant so much to me. Thank you for him. <laughs> My friend, we ought to do a great deal of that and make mention. Paul says, I make mention of you in my prayers. Now, what's he going to pray for? Paul made requests, too, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Did you notice Paul didn't pray that they get more money, that the debt be paid off? However, I think he would pray for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But he prayed here for something that I don't know whether we pray for, for wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Do we pray for that today? There are people that have prayed for my health, my physical health, and I thank God for them, a, oh, a thousand times. It's wonderful. But I hope sometimes you'll pray, give that fellow McGee a little bit more understanding of the Word, God. He seems to be so ignorant of your Word. I wish you'd pray that prayer sometime. I'd appreciate it very, very much. Now, good news caused Paul to pray. And by the way, we never think really of Paul is being an outstanding example of a man of prayer, do we? Well, when we think of a great missionary of the cross, well, we'd certainly put Paul at the top of the list. And when we want an example of a great apostle, we couldn't find any greater than Paul. And when you want one of the great preachers of the church, in fact, you couldn't get a list of ten of the greatest preachers of the church without putting Paul as number one. And he was one of the greatest teachers. The Lord Jesus was the greatest, and it said, Never man taught as this man taught. Well, Paul certainly followed in that tradition. And he's an example of a good pastor, by the way, as we see him in Ephesus, according to Dr. Luke, weeping with the believers there and how they loved him. I always judge a church by the way that they love their pastor, and especially their ex-pastor. That tells you something about the folk, especially if he stood for the Word of God. And today we need to learn to judge folk by their attitude, really, toward the Word of God, not how big the Bible is that they put under their arm. Now, when you think of Anyone excelling in any field of service in the early church, Paul the Apostle must be up toward the top. But how about a representative of a great man in prayer? Would you put Paul in that list? Well, Moses, the great intercessor on top of the mountain, was a great man of prayer. We think of him as that. And certainly David, who went before God and dire circumstance because of his awful sin, and he made confession. And Elijah, as he stood alone before a rebuilt altar, drenched with water on a mountaintop. And then there was Daniel, who reveals a man of prayers. He opened his window toward Jerusalem before a hostile power. And the Lord Jesus certainly is a marvelous example to us of prayer, so much so 
that the apostles came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. But you know, Paul was a great man of prayer. When I was teaching Bible in the Institute here in Southern California in downtown Los Angeles, I always had the students, when we got to the epistles of Paul, to make a list of the prayer list of the Apostle Paul. Every time he said he was praying for somebody to put it down. And lo and behold, I've had student after student come up and said, My, I didn't know Paul had such a prayer list. Didn't know he prayed for so many people. Well, he was a great man of prayer. And here now we have the example. In fact, there are two prayers of Paul that are here. And we have the one now, having set before us the church as the body of Christ. It just caused him to drop to his knees and begin to pray. And then we're going to find again that when we get to the end of chapter 3, another great prayer of the Apostle Paul. Two right here in the epistle to the Ephesians. Now, that's a mark, by the way, of a child of God. You know, one of the ways you can tell whether a man is a child of God or not is because of his prayer life. How much does he feel a dependence upon God? And if he feels that dependence upon God, he's going to God in prayer for himself. And he'll also go to God in prayer as intercession for others. Well, that to me is a pretty good indication. You remember that when Ananias, yonder in the city of Damascus, he was disturbed when the angel wanted him to go over to Saul of Tarsus. And he put up an objection. He said, well, that man persecuted the church. And now the angel says, behold, he prayeth. And that was a pretty good indication that something had happened to the apostle Paul. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you. The Ephesians were on his prayer list, and I guess all these churches were, making mention of you in my prayers. And that means he called them by name. I was with a great preacher one day, and some folk came up and spoke to us and shook hands. And one of the men that came up said to this preacher, said, I'm praying for you. And this preacher, I never shall forget, he said to him, well, thank you very much, but do you mention me by name? <laughs> He says, because I wouldn't want the Lord to get me mixed up with somebody else. Well, call them by name, friends, when you pray for them to the Lord. And somebody says, well, he already knows. Well, just make sure that the Lord knows. Pray for folk by name. He says, I make mention of you in my prayers. And that means he called the names. Now, in this great prayer here... I considered a threefold prayer, some a twofold prayer, but that's beside the point because the important thing is here that he says, first of all, that the God, this is verse 17 now, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, the thing that I'd call attention to here is that this man not only had a motive in prayer, which was good news, but he's not praying for material things, but he's praying here for spiritual blessings. And these spiritual blessings are very important. And the fact of the matter is, they're all important. Now, Paul, having revealed here that the church is the body of Christ and that God the Father planned it, God the Son paid for it, God the Holy Spirit protects it. He recognized that these folk here wouldn't be able to understand that unless the Spirit of God was there to be the teacher and there to open up the Word of God. And only the Spirit of God can do that. Dr. Ironside tells the story of when he apparently lived here in Southern California as a young man, and he wanted to go out and to preach the Word, and he was doing that. And so there was a wonderful man of God that had come over from North Ireland to Southern California because of what they would call 
in that day galloping consumption. But he came out to this area apparently too late, and you wouldn't want to come today with all the smog, but nevertheless, in that day it was different. And he stayed in a little tent out back of the home of Dr. Ironside's parents. And this man was a great man of God and one who had been used of God in teaching the Word. And Dr. Ironside went out and would sit with him. And he would open up the Scripture in such a way that Dr. Ironside said he'd never heard of anything like that before. So one day he asked him, he said, where did you learn that? This man said, well, I didn't get them by going to seminary because I never went to seminary. And I never got them by going to college, and I never got them by actually being taught by someone. But he says, I learned these things on my knees, on the mud floor of a little sod cottage in the north of Ireland. There with my open Bible before me, I used to kneel for hours at a time and ask the Spirit of God to reveal Christ to my soul and open the Word to my heart. And he taught me more on my knees on that mud floor than I ever could have learned in all the seminaries or colleges in the world. And I happen to know, having known Dr. Ironside, that he practiced that in his ministry. I remember when he was teaching us the Song of Solomon, He said he never was satisfied with what he found in the commentaries, and he just got down on his knees and asked God to reveal to him the message of that book. And he has a book on it, and I will present the Song of Solomon when we get to it, and I'm going to give you, very frankly, his interpretation of it, because it's the only one that's ever satisfied my own heart. And what a wonderful, glorious thing it is to have the Spirit of God to be the one to be our teacher, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, He may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. And how will that take place? Well, it will take place by the Spirit of God being our teacher. And, oh, that you and I might learn that, that the Spirit of God is the only one that can open our eyes. Notice verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, the eyes of your heart, being enlightened, And you'll notice here that this is quite remarkable. The eyes of your heart, not the eyes of your mind, that your heart might understand. You see that you may be very brilliant intellectually, but that does not guarantee that you can understand spiritual truth. Because eye hath not seen, neither ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. And only the Spirit of God can teach them to you. Now, I have no understanding of music whatsoever. I can't sing. I can't carry a tune. I recognize very few tunes. I do not know what a pitch is. That's a foreign field to me. Now, I ask a musician. In fact, I had a music director one time, and He made the statement publicly, he says, I can teach anybody to sing. I stood up immediately and I said, Brother, you've got a pupil. Nobody's ever been able to teach me to sing. So, all right, the congregation laughed and we made an engagement. And every Thursday afternoon, I met with him for a month. At the end of the month, he gave up. He said, you know, I just really believe you're right. You'd never be able to learn music. I said, that's true. I said, how could I ever learn? He said, the only way in the world would be for you to be born again. (laughs) What he meant was, I'd have to be born another person. Now, my friend, as far as spiritual knowledge is concerned, no person can understand it. I have not seen, ear, heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. And it's only as you and I are willing for the Spirit of God to teach it. 
I've told many times about that dear little lady up there in Sherman, Texas, that when I went up to preach there, why, they asked me to speak to her. Everybody called her Grandma. She's way up in years, couldn't read nor write. And I started out by trying to explain to her John 14. I thought I'd take something simple for Grandma. After all, she couldn't read or write. She wasn't smart like I was. I was a first-year seminary student, and I had to answer to everything at that time. And she listened to me for about five minutes. Then she said to me, young man, did you ever notice that? Well, I hadn't noticed it, I'll be honest with you, and I couldn't understand how she noticed it. She couldn't read nor write. She knew things about John 14 I'd never read in any commentary. And no Bible teacher ever taught those to me. Do you know how she did? The eyes of her understanding were open by the Spirit of God. Oh, my friend, the Spirit of God wants to teach us. And one of the reasons that God's people are not in the Word of God today is because they're not willing for the Spirit of God to teach them. They have to listen to a poor preacher like me. Or they have to go to some home Bible class. Why don't you let the Spirit of God teach you, Christian friend? When you read a passage of Scripture and you say, I don't understand that. I read that. I have people say that. I read that many times, and I never saw that in it. Well, when you didn't get anything out of it, you get to a barren place in Scripture, and I get there many times, even today. Just get down on your knees there. Just turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I missed the point, and you'll have to teach me, and he'll teach you. Then that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, it's not our inheritance here in him, but it's his inheritance in us. Now, I think the illustration would be the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan belonged to God, and he gave the children of Israel possession of it. Now, by and by, he's going to take possession of this universe that you and I live in. And through his saints, we're going to reign with him. <laughs> and I've just wondered about that. In fact, that's an area I've just never been able to penetrate. And again, the Spirit of God needs to make this real to us. He has an inheritance in us today. And we're tied in, as the children of Israel, we're tied in with that land. We're going to rule someday. Notice there is another petition here. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? And believe me, this is power that he's talking about here. And friends, I mean power. Let me just take a moment for that and look at this power that we're talking about here. It is power that, first of all, notice, and I'll give you my translation of it. What is the exceeding, the intense greatness of his power? And this is dunamis power, dynamite power, to us who believe according to the working, and that working is energizing of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up. That is, in the act of raising him from the dead. Now, friends, that's power, to raise Christ from the dead. Not only that, but the power that set him on his right hand, that's ascension power. And we don't make much of the ascension in our churches today. That is, most of us that belong to Bible churches, for some reason, we emphasize Christmas and Easter, but we seem to forget everything after that. Have you ever stopped to think of the power that took him back to the right hand of God? That, my friend, is power. We're beginning to see a little of it. Have you ever stopped to think of the power that it takes to lift a missile off of the base down yonder in Florida and take it out yonder into space? Think of the power, the physical power that it took to take men to the moon and bring them back. That is power. Why, my friend, if it took that kind of power to travel horizontally on this earth today, you'd see a Volkswagen coming down the highway with one of these great big gas trucks back of it. It would take that much power to keep it going. But it was that power that took him back. And that they might not only know that power, Paul says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, but that I might have it working in me. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? 
who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and he's going to put all things under his feet, and gave him now to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And Paul concludes on this tremendous high note here, that the church is the body of Christ, and he is the head of the church, and Someday, everything is going to be under him. And at the present time, the only thing that is under him is the church. And I believe that is the true church. Now, there's many organized groups down here today that are not listening to the Lord Jesus. I can tell you that. And it's a paralyzed church. You see, the most tragic thing in the world is to see some dear, especially child of God, lying on a bed helpless because the brain has been detached from the body. Well, I've been in many churches that are like that, haven't you? Where actually the church is detached. And there are many individual Christians today that are detached from the head. My friend, he is the head of the body. And he says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. In other words... I wiggle this little finger of mine, which I'm doing right now, here by myself in the studio. I'm wiggling it. You know why? Because the head up here has got charge of that. And I tell you... Now, friends, we come to the second chapter of Ephesians. And it actually continues the thought that we had in chapter 1. It opens with the little conjunction, and, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, he's talking about that tremendous power that raised Jesus from the dead. Well, that power is the power that makes us a child of God because we're dead in trespasses and sins, as we shall see. But now we have been made alive, as he's going to say in Christ. Now, that takes power, and it takes the resurrection power. And it was the thing that So many of God's children have wanted to experience. I think Francis Ridley Havergill expresses it in probably as lovely and fine a way as it could be. Oh, let me know the power of the resurrection. Oh, let me show thy risen life in calm and clear reflection. Oh, let me give out of the gifts thou freely gavest Oh, let me live with life abundantly because thou livest. I'm sure that's a prayer in the hearts of many of God's children today. Now he's going to reveal here something of that tremendous power that God will release today in the life of one who will turn to Jesus Christ. He'll lift him out of spiritual death and the spiritual life. That's tremendous power. God seems to be rather reluctant in letting man have power. And I think you can see why. Just think of the centuries that went by, and man knew nothing of atomic power. Then man discovered atomic power, and it changed the world. And what did it do to the world? Make it a wonderful place to live? No, my friend, it made it a frightful place to live. Because man today, with the power to destroy the world and the power that's in the little atom. Man's dangerous today. And I think that we're living like an ostrich with our heads in the sand if we're saying to ourselves, no nation dares to release that power. My friend, there are many men that are in positions of power today. If they thought they could get by with it, they'd turn it loose tomorrow. In fact, I think they'd turn it loose today. And therefore, man's dangerous with the use of physical power. Maybe God's reluctant to release other power for man. But now we see this power exhibited here. And this chapter actually will deal with another theme. The last chapter of the church is the body of Christ in the world today. And that body is the way you express yourself. 
and the Lord Jesus expresses himself in the world through his church. Now, the theme of this chapter is the church is a temple, and it is the temple that I think corresponds to the temple of the Old Testament, which was in turn preceded by the tabernacle of the wilderness. And I think the comparison is quite self-evident, but the contrast is sharp and striking. Now, the tabernacle and temple, for instance, were made of living trees of acacia wood, and they were hewn into dead boards. But the church now, God takes dead material and he makes it into a living temple. The tabernacle and temple were dwelling places for the glory of God. Now, the church is a dwelling place for the person of the Holy Spirit. And the tabernacle and temple were for the performance of a ritual and the repetition of a sacrifice for sin. The church is built upon the one sacrifice of Christ in the historical past and a sacrifice which is not repeated. That is what the writer to the Hebrews says, "...nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others." For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the age hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now there is no ritual in the church. As a temple, it is functional. The Holy Spirit moves through the living stone. There's no ritual in the church. I disagree with those that seem to think that the church has been given a ritual. We think today that we've had a church service. If we open with the doxology and we have a prayer and sing hymn number 268 in all 16 stanzas, and then we sit down and read the Scripture, and that means you've had a church service. only thing that means is you went through a ritual, and the church has no ritual. Now, wait a minute. Somebody's going to say, then we're not to do that. Well, I don't know how else you can do it. But the point is, just going through the exercise and mouthing words, my friend, has become meaningless to a lot of folk. And these things should have meaning. And they are proper, of course, when there is meaning that is expressed there. Now, will you notice the impressive fact of this age that God is not dwelling in a temple made with hands, but he's indwelling individual believers. Let me read Acts 17, 24, and 25. Notice this. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he's Lord of heaven and earth, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath and all things. We are told today that, don't you know, Paul says, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. Now, I think I ought to emphasize right here this very important thing. And that is, back in the Old Testament, God really didn't dwell in a temple. When Solomon built the temple, you remember that at the dedication, he got up and made this statement. He said, "...the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, and how can this little temple?" And they understood, every instructed Israelite understood God didn't live in a little box like a great many of the liberals have said. I heard a man at Cole Lectures at Vanderbilt University years ago give a lecture, and he said that the Israelites, they had a primitive viewpoint of God, that he could dwell in a little box. And I wish that man didn't have a primitive view of the Bible. If he'd just read it, he'd find out that back in the Old Testament, they didn't believe God could live in a little box. And God never did live in a house down here. That's where he met with the children of Israel. And that house had a ritual. It had a sacrifice. The church has none of that today. Now, will you notice there's another very sharp contrast to the Old Testament temple, and that's the position of the Gentiles. Now, you will recall that they were proselytes, and there was the court of the Gentiles. And if you are ever in Jerusalem, go up to the Holy City Hotel and see that replica. It's made into a miniature 
of how the city of Jerusalem looked in the days of Herod, which are the days of Christ, of crows. And you'll see at the temple that the Gentiles were way off to the left as you look into the temple. They didn't get very close. And Paul's going to say here in this chapter, "...ye," that is, ye Gentiles, "...who were sometimes far off, you are made nigh now by the blood of Christ." We've been brought in pretty close. In fact, we're seated in the heavenlies in Christ. And you couldn't improve on that, my friend, by any means. Now, this gives us something of the background of this chapter that we're entering now. And let me say that I've divided this chapter into three major divisions. You have the church as a temple, remember, and you have, first of all, the material for construction, first ten verses. Then verses 11 through 18, the method of construction. And then in verses 19 through 22, the meaning of the construction. And all of this is very important. Now, will you notice there's something about this section here, and I'd like to say this because you'll need this to understand it. And one is this, that all the way from verse 1 through verse 7 here is what is known in Greek as a periodic sentence. That means the one who wrote this wrote in even a little bit better than the Koine Greek of that day. Classical Greek is filled with periodic sentences. And that's the reason it's difficult to read. It has all kinds of genitive absolutes, all kinds of phrases, tenses, and my, it's not easy to read. And Koine Greek here generally is rather easy to read. But here you have a periodic sentence, which reveals that Paul, when he wanted to, he could really put it on the line, and he does here. Now, the authorized version breaks this up into a sentence that ends at verse 3. And that's not only permissible, that is entirely right here because you have a contrasting statement that's made here, joined by a conjunction, and they're perfectly willing to do it. Now, as we've already indicated, the and connects this chapter with the previous chapter. Paul's been talking about the theme of salvation and the mighty power of God. And Paul picks up the theme of the greatness of his power in verse 19 back in chapter 1. And this is the power which quickens dead sinners. You being dead. Now, that speaks of the death all of us have imputed to us in Adam. Paul mentions it in Romans 5:12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. They've all sinned how? In that first man. Adam's sin made me a son of a fallen Adam, and I have the same nature that he has, which is a fallen nature. And I have no capacity or inclination to God. I was dead in trespasses and sin. Now, when I look back upon my conversion... I really think it is a miracle how in the world God could save a little boy brought up in a home. I won't say it was godless. My father had great high moral principles, and he was known as an honest man. But he was not a Christian. In fact, he's antagonistic to the church. He never darkened the door of a church, but he made me go to Sunday school as a boy. And I always argued about it. Then my dad died when I was 14, and I found myself adrift in the world. I run all the way to Detroit, Michigan, to get away from every authority. And I began to work not for Ford. I turned that job down. They were looking for workers then. I went and got a job with Cadillac. You probably wondered why the Cadillac car is such a good automobile. I'll tell you why I worked for them. Not long, but to make it a good car. And then I got an awful sin. I got with a group of men up there. One man from Hungary, he thought I looked like his son that had died. And he took me on his wing, but he was a sinner. And he led me to places that a 16-year-old boy ought not to be taken. And I got homesick, though. Now I look back, and God made me homesick. <laughs> and I went back home, and if I hadn't, I'd tell you the devil had won the day. I was dead in trespasses and sin. And then a man told me I could have peace with God through Jesus Christ. How wonderful that was. Now, I say that's a miracle. I wasn't looking for God. 
I was running from him as fast as I could. And being dead in trespasses and sin, that's the picture of us today. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now, Adam died spiritually the day he disbelieved and disobeyed God, and he ran away from God. He wasn't looking for God. He hid from him. That's the position of the natural man, this idea that man has a little spark of the divine and he's looking for God. That's as false as anything can possibly be. That day Adam died to God and to the things of God. He didn't die physically until 900 years after he ate of the fruit. Now, it just simply meant he had no longer capacity or longing for God. He separated from God. And after all, death is separation. Physical death is separation of the spirit, of the soul from the body. And that's death. We don't see the spirit and soul, but we sure see a dead body. The highest level of living for man was the physical and the mental. And he's passed on to his offspring this same dead nature, dead to God. And only the convicting work of the Holy Spirit can prick the conscience of any man in this world today. And you and I can't do it. Only the Spirit of God can do it. I had the privilege of being pastor of a great church in downtown Los Angeles. I followed men that were great men. The founder of that church was Dr. R. A. Tari. I wanted to do a creditable job. I wanted to bring glory to God. And I always would remind myself every time I left the radio room to go in on the pulpit platform to preach, I would say, Oh, God, I recognize that today I'm helpless and hopeless. I'm speaking like speaking into a graveyard. Many will be there dead in trespasses and sin. But then I'd say, Oh, God, I'm powerful if the Spirit of God will move there, for only the Spirit of God can speak. The dead man can hear. And thank God, the Spirit of God spoke as he does on this radio, and dead men are able to hear. And the Lord Jesus said when the Spirit of God came, he would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You and I live in a great cemetery in this world. Men are dead. The Irishman made a statement. Someone asked him what a cemetery was. He says, well, a cemetery is a place where the dead live, and that's the place where we live today. Dead men, dead in trespasses and sins. Over this country years ago, there went a famous judge giving a famous lecture on millions now living will never die. There followed him a great preacher, and he came into town and gave a lecture. Millions now living are already dead. And you know, he was more accurate than the judge was because millions have already died. <laughs> and the interesting thing is there are millions today, several billion, dead in trespasses and sins. And that's the picture that speaks of us in trespasses and in sin. Trespasses speak of what Adam did. And sins means that you and I missed the mark. What a picture of mankind today. We are in an area where the past, present, and future of the church and of believers are given. You want to know, Christian friend, your past, present, and future. Perhaps you've driven down a highway sometime, gone through maybe a rather poor section, and you see a sign up by a house that says, We tell your past, your present, and your future. And they generally have it figured out that when you go in there, that they tell you how you're going to come into a great fortune. You're going to get a lot of money. You're going to be able to make a lot of money. I always think that's amusing because these people that know so much about the future, they generally live in the poorest section. They are poor as Job's turkey, however poor Job's turkey was. And they actually are not able to make it themselves, and yet a great many people go to them so they will be able to make it. And it's very interesting that even a lot of God's children don't seem to be able to let God give us our past, our present, and our future. Well, we have it all right here in the second chapter. Now you have the material for construction. And I'm going to read now from my book on Ephesians, Exploring Through Ephesians. I would also like to say concerning this book that 
what I'm giving now is not in our notes and outline. This book goes into detail, and we will send this to those who have part in our radio ministry. Now, friends, we have to make it that way. I was rather amused the other day listening to a friend of mine who has a radio program, and he says all of our material is free. Well, fine. I'm delighted he can afford to send it out. We cannot. But he ended the plea by saying, and we hope when you order the material, you'll enclose an offering. Well, we hope so too, by the way. We live in hope, and he lives in hope. I think that was quite proper for him to say that. Now, will you notice verses 1 and 2 here, and I'm reading from my translation, and somebody says, oh my, not another translation. And I want to say the same thing. I do not recommend my translation at all. I've used it for years here in Southern California, and it's known out here as the Magiacus Ad Absurdum translation. I don't recommend it. Don't recommend my own at all. And I haven't attempted to really translate. What I've attempted to do is just to pull the original words over into the English that you might maybe get a little different viewpoint. I don't recommend it as a translation, but I hope you will follow along and notice this. And you being dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Now, somebody says, wait a minute, you left out half he made alive or quickened. Well, that's not in the original. And you'll notice that in your Bible, it's in italics. And it's put in there to smooth out the translation. And I'm perfectly willing to admit that it belongs there, or something belongs there to give explanation, and it's all right. But as I said, I'm trying to pull out the original and give you the meaning here without attempting to make a smooth translation. And you, being dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the age, or the spirit of the age, that is, according to secularism, according to the way of the world, according to the principle of this world, that is, the principle of the world, that doesn't mean the physical universe, it means the cosmos, the society, the civilization that we're in, our life pattern, if you please, our lifestyle, the lifestyle of the world today, according to the prince of the power, that is, the authority of the air. And you can translate that by the haze or the smog of the spirit that now worketh, that is, energizes in the sons of disobedience. The devil takes this dead material that we're dead in trespasses and sins, and he energizes it. And that's the reason that these cults are as busy as termites, and with the same result. They're busy. That's the reason false religion, friends, puts us to shame, because Satan is energizing it. Somebody says to me, you know that, they tell me miracles are being performed in this cult. I won't argue that. Maybe they are. I know a lot of this is exaggeration, but who's doing it? That's the thing I want to know. And Satan is able to duplicate a great many of the miracles that are scriptural miracles. After all, wasn't the magicians down in Egypt able to duplicate Moses' miracles at first? There came a day when they couldn't, of course. When you get into the realm of the new birth and you begin to get close to God, then Satan is powerless there. But long as it's to delude and to deceive people and lead them astray, the devil is potent today, and he's potent in these cults and isms of the world. Now, a trespass is the thing Adam did. That's the word used of his sin. That which he did, he stepped over God's bound. And sins means just to miss the mark. We just don't come up to God's standard at all. And that's our condition, by the way, dead in trespasses in sin, and yet energized by Satan. In other words, the unsaved man's walking around this world like a spiritual zombie. He's dead in trespasses and sins. And now we're told here, in times past, he walked according to the course of the world. That is, he walked according to the age or the spirit of the age and of this world. 
And that means the society that we're in, what we call civilization today, the lifestyle. And according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now worketh or energizes the sons of disobedience. Now, Satan leads these folk around as he led all of us around. Now, what does it mean to walk according to the spirit of the age of this world? Well, I recognize that today we hear a great deal about separation. And most of this talk on separation means that you get away from that which is fleshly or carnal and godless. But may I say to you that this lost world is characterized by certain mental and spiritual sins that are actually, I think, in God's sight, worse than the physical sins. Listen to James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not." because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, there are a great many folk that come to church on Sunday, and they're as pious as a church mouse. And however pious a church mouse is, But, oh my, they talk about being a separated Christian. And believe me, Monday morning they start out in this old rough workaday world just as mean and hard and after the almighty dollar as much as anyone else is. And they want it to consume on their own selves, their own selfishness. Now, I know this is strong medicine, and a great many folk don't like to hear it, but there are a lot of Christians living just like this today. James, who's very practical, mentions this. Now, friends, this is the thing we've been saved from. Now, John put it like this in 1 John 2, 15 and 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, there are a great many people that today are not living in sin. They say, they say, no, I would not commit these sins. And I wouldn't live and act like certain people do. The question is this. Dr. G. Calvin Morgan asked the question like this. He said, would you like to? (laughs) Is that the reason that you like to see a... TV program where it shows them living it up today because, you know, we do these things vicariously. I've always felt that the reason that the story of the prodigal son is so popular the way that some preach it today is, you notice the Lord Jesus never mentioned any of the sins that boy committed when he was in the far country. But I've heard sermons in which you went from one nightclub to another, from one bar room to another, from one brothel to another. And you know the saints really enjoyed that sermon because they sat there and sinned vicariously. Would you like to live there? That's what John's talking about. Love not the world. Do you really love it? How do you feel about it? I remember the first time Ms. McGee and I came to California. We were just, you know, fresh out of Texas. In fact, I'd never seen a body of water. I couldn't throw a rock over it before until I came out here. And we were amazed at the ocean, and we saw it from San Diego, all drove up the coast to Los Angeles. What a thrill. Then we drove from here up to San Francisco, and they were having that Treasure Island affair. She and I went over. We had a wonderful day, I must admit. And though there was the bright lights on those colored walls, and then there was the soft music, it was beautiful. And that night when we left, we got on the ferry. We went up on top. We were country. Well, we wanted to see the whole thing. And we sat there and looked back at that. And into the fog, that 
Treasure Island began to fade away and the music began to die out. And I said to my wife, I said, I've had one of the most pleasant days today I ever had. I sure have enjoyed it. But I said, if right now Treasure Island disappeared and this bay went in under, and that was it, I wouldn't shed a tear because I don't love anything that's over there. And then I added this, I hope that I can have that kind of an attitude to the world today. A great many folk that talk today about the rapture of the church, and it's a wonderful thing to talk about, but really, I have a feeling some of them are really going to weep when they leave this world because they're so wrapped up in it. They're wrapped up in a job, wrapped up in a business, wrapped up in a home, wrapped up in some club, wrapped up in a worldly church. And, oh, they won't want to go because of the fact all of that's going to be changed. Well, this is strong medicine. Maybe it's a little too strong for you today. Now, I'm showing that the other apostles talked along this line. Simon Peter wrote in 2 Peter 2, 14 and 15, "...having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Boser, who loved the wages of unrighteousness." Now, this is a picture of the lost world. Do you somehow another fit into this, child of God? Well, maybe this is enough of this. Now, according to the prince of the authority of the haze of the spirit that now energizes in the sons of disobedience. You can't serve God and mammon. You've got to choose, Christian friend, who you're going to serve. And if you're serving God, it doesn't mean that you just don't go to picture shows and you don't use makeup and you don't... And don't misunderstand. I don't agree with that type of separation. But that's what I hear today. And that you don't do this and that and you don't associate with certain men that associate with liberals. That's not separation. That's absurd to talk like that. And then yourself to have eyes so filled with bitterness and hatred and selfishness. My friend, those are the gross sins, by the way. Oh, I better move on because I'll lose my audience. Verse 3 says, "...among whom also we all had our conversation." Now, do you notice that Paul now makes it a we? He includes himself first person plural pronoun that he adopts now. He puts himself right with this crowd, and you and I need to do so also. Among whom also we all had our conversation, that is, our activities, our lifestyle, if you please, in times past, in the desires of the flesh, that is, of the old nature, doing the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and that's of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Now, there are Christians today that just live for the carnal nature. And that's the way the man of the world is living today. Prompted and motivated by a godless philosophy and controlled by satanic principles. As a man, he's supposed to be an outstanding Christian businessman. I visited him once. He showed me his home, a lovely home. He told me about his children. He told me about his business. told me about the honors that had been conferred upon him. He never once referred to his relationship to Jesus Christ. May I say to you, there's something wrong with that kind of living. To live like that, to have a lifestyle that includes everything of the world but leaves Jesus Christ out of it. And this is the crowd that Paul says... For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This is the past. Now, will you notice what's happened? But God. Oh, this little conjunction, but is so important. But God, being rich in mercy. And God's rich in mercy. And he had mercy on me. I know he's had mercy on you on account of his great love with which he loved us. Now, love didn't enable him to save us. 
but love provided a Savior so he could forgive us, and he's rich in mercy today. Being even dead in trespasses, he quickened us. That is, he made us alive together with Christ. And now he says, by grace have you been saved. And he's raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus, in order that he might show forth in the ages which are coming the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. Now, but God, and that denotes the radical contrast that has gone before in the first three verses. Those first three verses, they are as black and hopeless as anything can be. Man is a complete failure. He's incapable of saving himself. God comes on this scene of death with mercy. He does not have too little too late. He has a surplus. For an infinite God is rich in infinite mercy. He has what man needs, and he has what you need. The only requirement is that man believe him, and he does this by his grace. A poor woman from the slums of London was taken down with a group of people for a holiday at the ocean. She'd never seen it before. And when she saw it, she burst into tears. And there were those around who thought it was strange that we'd given this lovely holiday and then for her to burst into tears. And she was asked, says, why in the world are you crying? And she pointed to the ocean. She says, this is the only thing that I've ever seen that there was enough of it. <laughs> oh, my friend, there's enough of the mercy of God. He's got oceans of mercy because God does what? He saves us by His grace. Now, let me illustrate this. What does it mean to be saved by the grace of God? We were dead in trespasses and sin, incapable of saving ourselves. Now, God comes on the scene, and by grace, He reaches down. He finds nothing in us. He finds it in Himself. You see, when God came down to deliver Israel, it wasn't because they were lovely and beautiful and serving Him. They were not. They were stiff-necked people, he said. They were idolaters. They were worshiping a golden calf out there in the wilderness. He said, I've heard their cry. Now, why did that appeal to him? Because he loved them. He loves you and he loves me today. He loves us. But he doesn't save us by love. He saves us by grace. Somebody says, how does he do that? Well, let me illustrate that. I have had for years when I'm in Southern California a Bible class in Orange County, and a Bible class down in San Diego County. And several years ago, a group from Campus Crusade worked on the beaches down there in San Diego County and led quite a few of those young people to Christ. Well, now, some of them belong to the hippie group. But I want to say this, that I found out a lot of those are genuine. And I've come to the place myself that... I don't judge a man by his dress. And we're told never to judge a book by its cover. You're not to judge a man by his dress. So these young people, the leader, I was told, put them on our program to listen to our radio program. They also used our tapes, used our books. And I didn't know this. When I went down there, the first class, sitting on the first two rows were a bunch of these young people. My, what a crowd of them. And I want to tell you that some of them were dressed in a very unusual manner. And they had the long hair and all that sort of thing that associated with this group. But very frankly, they shocked me at first. But I found out they had their Bibles, notebooks, and they had some spiritual life, which, by the way, you don't always find in our churches today. And here these young people were showing real life. Now, a young fellow came up to me afterward, and he said to me, that wasn't the first time, about the third or fourth time, this young fellow who had been attending came up to me, had written all over him, and he had on a funny hat, on it he had written, love, 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 love. He had a funny coat on, on it written, love, love, love. Had funny trousers, by the way, and he had written on love, shoes, had written on love. He had written all over him, and... I said to him, I said, why in the world do you have love written all over you? Oh, he says, man, God is love. Well, I said, I agree with you. Nothing could be truer than that. God is love. 
Then he added this, and he says, God saves us by his love. Oh, I said, I don't agree with that. God doesn't save us by his love. I said, give me the verse. Well, he scratched his head and thought a minute or two. He says, well, maybe I can't think of it right now. Well, I said, when you do, let me know, because I've never been able to find it. And so he said then, well, if God doesn't save us by love, how does he save us? Well, very frankly, I said, I'm glad you asked that question. Because I said, the Bible says, by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I said, God saves us by grace. Well, the boy won't know. What's the difference? Well, I said, the difference is just simply this. I said, God does love you. I said, let's don't lose sight of that. God loves us. But I said, God, just on the basis of love, he can't open the back door of heaven and slip us in under cover of darkness. And he can't let down the bars of heaven in front and bring us in the front door. Because I said, now, not only God is love, first of all, God is light. He's the moral ruler of this universe. And he's righteous. He's holy. And he's good. Now, I said, all of that adds up to one thing. God can't do things that are wrong. That is, wrong according to his standard. Now, I said that... God couldn't save us by love. I said, love had him strapped. He can love without being able to save. And I said, the verse I thought you were going to give me was John 3, 16. God so loved the world. And I said, let's look at it. God so loved the world that he saved the world? No, I said, that's exactly what it doesn't say. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, God couldn't save the world by love because... He goes on to say, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, what? Might not perish. Why, I said, you and I are going to perish. We're lost sinners. And God still loves us. But the love of God just can't bring us into heaven. God had to provide a salvation, and he paid the penalty for our sin. Now, I said, a God of love can reach out his hands to a lost world and said, now, if you'll believe in my Son... Because he died for you and will come to me on that basis, I can save you. Now, I said, God doesn't save us by love. God saves us by grace today. And I said, frankly, that's more wonderful. Because I said that today I could get out of favor or could, when I was a boy, with my parents because of sin, because something I did wrong. But I said, I can never get out of favor with God. I can lose my fellowship, and if I sin, that breaks fellowship. The Spirit of God is grieved, but I said, if I'll come back to him, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But even if we walk in darkness and we say we have fellowship with him, we're lying because we're not having fellowship. But if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and what happens? If I walk in the light of the world of God and I see I've come short, for well, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, just keeps on cleansing me from all sin. Why? Because God does it by grace. And what about grace? Well, He's rich in mercy and grace. He extends mercy to you today. And God has His arms outstretched to a lost world and says, If you come my way... And by the way, this is His universe. He's doing it His way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. He does. This is his. He makes the rule. And you're going to have to come his way. He loves you. Oh, you can't keep him from loving you. Now, it's what you can do, you can't keep the sun from shining, but you can get out of the sunshine. And by sin today, by being out of the will of God, turning your back on him, you won't experience the love of God. But if you will come to him through Christ... He'll save you. God is rich in mercy. Now, that's the present state of the believer. How is that? Why, he not only lifted us from a graveyard, a spiritual graveyard, but he's made us alive sitting in Christ today, yonder in the heavenlies. He's the head of the church, remember? We saw that in the first chapter. And what's he going to do? Why, he's going to show forth in the ages which are coming the exceeding, the overflowing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. I'm going to be on exhibit someday. And angels are going to go by and say, See that fellow McGee? He wasn't worth saving. He was lost. But look at him today. He's here in heaven. And why is he here? 
because of the riches of the grace of God. And God was kind to him. God saved him, and God brought him here. And that's going to be for the praise of God throughout the eternal ages. And I'm not going to get any credit at all. Did you know that? Oh, not one bit of credit. But you want to know something? I'm going to be there. And that's good enough for me. And I'm going to join that angelic host, and I'm going to sing praises to God. Why? Because he saved me. I'll be for the demonstration of that. Friends, you can't have it any better than this. This is the most wonderful thing that I know of that we have. And here we're told in a very wonderful way that we've been quickened together with Christ. That's a possession, impartation of divine life. Raised and seated with Christ in the heavenlies, that's a position that we're given today. And you just can't add anything And grace is the way. Grace is mentioned twice here. And you can't have it, friends, any more wonderful than this. Oh, today to praise him for his infinite, wonderful grace, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now will you notice verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, this is the great verse that consummates this section in which he's given to us, actually, the past, the present, and the future of the believer. We were dead in trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of the world. And now God, by his infinite, marvelous, wonderful grace, has reached down and saved us. And then what a future we have. We'll be on display revealing the grace of God and not revealing what nice, sweet little Sunday school folk we are, but rather we'll be on exhibit for the glory of God. And I won't mind it because I'd never felt I'm going to get to heaven anyway on my own works and my own merit, and therefore I'll be delighted to exhibit the wonderful grace of God. And it'll be quite evident that that's the way that he saved me. Now, for by the grace ye have been saved. And do you notice I have changed that a little here? And it's the grace. And what he's referring to is what he talked about up there, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ. This is something special. It is the grace, and it is by the grace that we have been saved. Now, don't come along and say, I hope to be saved. Can you say this day? Can you say, I am saved? And somebody says, oh, I wouldn't dare make a statement like that because I don't know what the future holds. My friend, that's not the basis of your salvation. Your salvation rests upon grace. God has saved you by grace. And you can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And if you're God's child, you may wander far from him but he always makes a way back for you. And by the grace of God, you have been saved, and you have today a finished salvation. And you can say on the basis of what Christ has done for me and the fact the Holy Spirit has inclined me toward Christ and I have trusted him on the basis of the Word of God, I have been saved. And it's not a hope-so salvation or I'll try salvation, but a salvation that can say, By the grace ye have been saved, and by means of faith, and that not of yourselves. God is the gift, not of works, in order that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, poema, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand in order that we should walk in them. Now, I want to read to you a statement here about the grace of God and the love of God. 
And the grace of God, as has been defined theologically, is unmerited favor. I like to speak of it as love in action. And I want you to hear the statement of a teacher of mine, the man who taught me theology, Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer. And here is the statement. Will you listen to it? It's so important. A sharp distinction is properly drawn between the compassionate love of God for sinners and his grace which is now offered to them in Jesus Christ. Divine love and divine grace are not one and the same. God might love sinners with an unutterable compassion, and yet because of the demands of outrage, divine justice, and holiness, be unable to rescue them from a righteous doom. However, as has been before stated, if love should graciously provide for the sinner all that outrage, justice, and holiness could ever demand, the love of God would then be free to act without restraint in behalf of those for whom the perfect substitutionary sacrifice was made. This is Christ's achievement on the cross. On the other hand, divine grace and salvation is the unrestrained compassion of God acting toward the sinner on the basis of that freedom already secured through the righteous judgment against sin, secured by Christ in his sacrificial death. Divine love might desire to save, yet be unable righteously to do so. But divine grace is free to act since Christ has died. It is to be observed, then, that the eternal purpose of God is not the manifestation of his love alone, though his love and his mercy are like his grace mentioned in this context and expressed in Christ's death, but it is rather the manifestation of his grace. That's the end of the quotation. Now, out of God's infinite treasure chest, he lavishes his grace upon sinners without restraint or hindrance. Now, faith is the instrumental cause of salvation. It's the only element that the sinner brings to the great transaction of faith. But we are told it's the gift of God. And now, somebody's going to say to me, well, then, preacher, since it's the gift of God and God hadn't given it to me, then I guess I'm not to blame. Oh, my friend, may I say to you, God's made that very clear. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. My friend, if you want to trust Christ, you'll have to listen to the Word of God. And God will give faith to all therefore who will give heed to the message of the gospel. And that was the thing that we noted when we were over in 2 Corinthians. You remember at that time, we called attention that to, frankly, a very wonderful statement. And I think I'll turn to it, verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 3. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. In other words, the veil is put on Moses' face, not because he was blinding everybody like a headlight, but the glory was fading away because that belonged to the Mosaic system, that belonged to the law. Now he says, their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Now you don't need a veil. Because today he is the unveiled Christ, and the gospel is declared. But we are told, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. What is it here? Well, when the heart shall turn to the Lord. Any time that you are ready to turn to Christ, you can turn to Christ. And somebody says, well, I'm not given the gift of faith. That's not your problem. Your problem is that you don't want to give up your sin that the Bible condemns. 
any time that you're sick of your sin, any time you want to turn from yourself, from the things of the world, from religion, from everything, and turn to Christ, then you'll be given faith. You can trust Him. I get a little weary of these people today that say they have intellectual problems. You've got moral problems. And I mean real moral problems if you just face up to it. You see, that's the real problem in the hearts of a great many folk. And a great many saints today don't enjoy their salvation. Why, you know, even psychology over in Duke University, they made a study over that. And the second reason that folk today are emotionally disturbed and mentally unstable is because instead of living in the present and the future, they live in the past, and it's a preoccupation with past mistakes and failures, and looking to themselves all the time instead of looking away to Christ and trusting Him. Now, faith is the instrumental cause of salvation. Now, Spurgeon says, "...it's not thy joy in Christ that saves thee, it's Christ. It's not thy hope in Christ that saves thee, it's Christ. It's not even thy faith in Christ, though that be the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merit." That's where the power is, and that's where the salvation is. Now, Paul's not talking about faith when he says, and that not a you. Well, God's is the gift. He's talking rather about salvation, and salvation is a gift that eliminates boasting. Everything about it is God, <laughs> and we are nothing. If you will take the position of a zero and then let him be the one to write in the amount, then, my friend... That's salvation. Now, we are told here that the church is God's workmanship. And this is a very wonderful verse. For we are his workmanship. And the Greek word is poema. We get our word poem from that. The church is his poem. And friends, that church that we're talking about here is not really the local churches that we saw in the epistle to the Galatians, but what we see here is that body of believers from the day of Pentecost to the Perusia, the real believers, and I'm confident they're in local churches, and that group of believers, they're his workmanship, and they're created in Christ Jesus. That is, they're a new creation, and they're in Christ Jesus. But why? For good works. And when we get to the last part of this epistle... He's going to tell us we're to walk down here in a way that's creditable and acceptable to God. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand in order that we should walk in them. God intends for us, though we are seated in the heavenlies, we are to walk down here in a way to bring glory to his name. And he'll be coming to that in the last three chapters of this epistle. Now we come to the method of the construction of the church as a temple of God. He says, Wherefore, remember that once ye, the nations, that is, Gentiles in the flesh. So actually, the church in Ephesus was made up largely of Gentiles. There was just a colony of Jews that were in Ephesus. Wherefore, remember that once ye, the nations, you were Gentiles, in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, apart from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I brought a sermon one time. I don't think it was a very good sermon on what it means to be lost. And this is a passage of Scripture that I use. What does it mean to be lost? You will recall that here we are told certain things. That is, that we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We have no right to go back in the Old Testament and take promises God made to Israel 
and appropriate them for ourselves. He didn't make them to us at all. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and we were strangers from the covenants of the promise. Now, God made certain promises to the nation Israel, and they belong to him. Now, he's promised them that land. Now, they're going to get it someday, but they'll get it on his terms, not their terms. And we were strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, when I was over that, I didn't attempt to homestead or stake out a claim on this basis that God had promised it in the Old Testament. I understood he was talking to Israel and not to me. And he told me, however that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Now, that was the position of us as lost people. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. And then, friends, look at this, having no hope. You look at the religions of the world. They have no hope. It's pretty hazy about this matter of after death. There's no resurrection, and there's no hope. And the cults offer no hope at all. They put up a hurdle that no honest human being could get over, having no hope and without God in the world. That was the position of Gentiles. And when Paul wrote this, my ancestors on one side were walking through the jungles and the forests of Germany as heathen and pagan as they come. And the other families over at Scotland And they were even worse conditions, so I'm told. They were pagan and heathen. That was our condition, without God in the world and having no hope. That's what it means today, friend, to be lost. And that is the condition of multitudes of people around us today. They have no hope. They're without God in the world. I have to be very frank with you. I think if I was in the position of a lot of these today... I'd crawl up on a bar stool and try to drink and forget it all. What else you going to do? You've got no hope. And the only hope you've got is here in this world, and so you better squeeze this life like an orange and get all the juice out of it you can because you've got nothing coming over there. You're without hope and without God in the world, and you're strangers from the covenant of promise. What a position to be in. These are terrible, awful things. Now will you notice something has happened. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who once were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now the court of the Gentiles there in the tabernacle, they could come, but they were way off. Let me tell you, they were way out actually in right field. And it was a long way to home base from where they were. And therefore, the very wonderful thing is, The blood of Christ has brought us in and will bring us to heaven someday. Now, will you notice here? For he is our peace, who made both one and broke down the middle wall of the fence, the enmity, having abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in ordinances, in order that he might create the two in himself into one new man, making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity in it, and having come, he preached peace to you who are afar off and to them that are nigh. So that today, friends, when you come to Jesus Christ, you are brought not only into a body, but now you are brought into a place where you stand before God on a par with anybody. I can stand today with you, and you stand today with me on equal footing. And therefore, the point of separation for believers should never be color. It should never be a social status. It should never be on any basis at all, because we've been made one in Christ. And I don't care who you are. If you're a believer in Christ, you and I are going to be together throughout eternity. And I don't know why we shouldn't speak to each other every now and then down here, friends. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's our peace. That is, the peace for both Jew and Gentile, for the contrast here is between them. And he broke down the middle wall of the fence, that is, the partition, 
the enmity that was between the two, and he's made now a new man, put us together in Christ, and made peace. That is, we have peace with God, we should have with each other, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. God's work of reconciliation is already completed. He's ready to receive you if you are ready to come. And therefore, the message that goes out is, be ye reconciled to God. And if you will be, then that brings you into a new body, a body of believers, and doesn't make any difference who they are, Jew or Gentile, doesn't make any difference about the color of their skin. They may be white, they may be brown, they may be red, they may be black, but that doesn't make any difference. If they're in Christ, we're made one new man, and we should have peace. Now, you see the emphasis in this passage is upon the glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only made peace by the cross, but those who trust him are placed in him, and they become a new man now. And the contrast, of course, here, as we've indicated, is between Jew and Gentile. But God had made a difference originally by separating the Jew from the nations. Now, that difference led to spiritual pride, actually, on the part of the Jew. And ultimate, there was hatred between Jew and Gentile. When a Jew and a Gentile are placed in Christ, there's peace. Not only because of the new position, but because something new has come into existence. And Paul identifies this as a new man in Christ. We're something new. So that Paul had said to the Corinthians, Give none offense, neither to the Jew, the Gentile, nor to the church of God. That church is the new man. Before God, the Gentile is not brought up to the status of the Jew. He's actually brought up higher. And Chrysostom made this statement, and my, this is a wonderful statement. Will you listen to it? He does not mean that he has elevated us to that high dignity of theirs, but he has raised both us and them to one still higher. I will give you an illustration. Let us imagine that there are two statues, one of silver, the other of lead, and then that both shall be melted down and the two shall come out gold. So thus he has made the two one. I think that's a marvelous illustration that we've been brought together in Christ. May I say to you, I do not believe in the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. To me, that's a damnable heresy. Forgive me for saying it, but that's what it is. I believe the brotherhood of those that are in Christ. Now, a man may have a skin as white as the driven snow. And if he's not a child of God, he's not my brother. I don't care what you say, he's not my brother. But that man may have a skin that's as black as midnight. And if he's a child of God, he's my brother. Now, you can't escape that. We're something new. <laughs> We're in Christ, a new man. And this is the building, the temple that God is building today. And it might, therefore, be more accurate to say that the Jews have been brought down to the level of the Gentile, as both are in the same state of sin. Because all of us are brothers, actually, as sinners, as sons of Adam. Because Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? That is, are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they're all under sin. That's the state we're in. Now, the peace referred to is between Jew and Gentile. When the Jew and Gentile come to the cross of sinners... They're made into a new creation, a new man, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Old Testament temple, which succeeded the Mosaic tabernacle, was marked by partitions. There were three entrances into the three departments, outer court, holy place, holy of holies. Then there were sections partitioned off for priests, for Israel, for women and Gentiles. Now, Christ, by his death, he took out the veil, and he became the way, the truth, and the life, so that you go through Christ and come directly to God. And those who come to him are removed from their little department and are placed in Christ, the new temple, where there are no departments. 
The cross dissolves the fences, and the gospel is preached to the Gentiles and to Jews. What a picture we have here. Now, verse 18, "...for through him," that is Christ, "...we both have access in one Spirit to the Father." I wonder if you've noted that this little verse here is a big verse. It's like a little atom. It has in it the Trinity. Notice that. For through him, that is Christ, we both have access in one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, to the Father, and that's God the Father. You see, Jew and Gentile at the cross are not only on the same footing as sinners, but through Christ they both have equal access to God, which is a glorious privilege for any human being. And that's one of the things Paul says in the fifth of Romans, that are the benefits of justification by faith. We have access to God through Jesus Christ, and that's wonderful. Now, I don't think you can rush in a brazen way into the presence of God, but it's a real privilege to have access through the Lord Jesus Christ into the Father. And I don't care who the humblest believer is, he has as much access as the Pope at Rome, as the President of the World Council of Churches, and as Vernon McGee has. You have as much right. And that's the reason that I asked people on the radio when I had cancer, I said, pray for me. And I still have it, and I still say to folk, remember me in prayer. I've had several folks say, why did you ask everybody to pray? Why didn't you just ask some folk? Because I think every believer has access to God, my friend. I believe in the priesthood of believers, that we all have access to Him. This is the marvelous thing about this new building that we're talking about. Now we have the meaning of the construction here, verses 19 through 22, here in this second chapter of Ephesians. I'm reading now, and if you've noted, last time and this time I've been reading directly from my book, my own translation, which I do not recommend. This is the Magicus Ad Absurdum translation. And all I'm doing is bringing out the literal. Listen. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and sojourners, that is, foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, Paul reminds here the Gentile believers that though they were strangers and they were alienated from God, their present position is infinitely better. They are no more strangers and sojourners. They're fellow citizens with the saints. And saints is not a reference here to Old Testament saints. They're fellow citizens with the New Testament saints. They are the members of the body of Christ, and they belong to a household not as servants, but relatives. That is, we're members of the family of God. We're his dear little children. Listen to John, so lovely, in 1 John 2.12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. We're little children. <laughs> this is a new relationship, a relationship that was foreign to the Old Testament. Even David, the man after God's own heart, he is called my servant David, 2 Samuel 7, 8. Moses was called Moses, God's servant, Numbers 12, 7. And now their citizenship is not in Israel and in the earthly Jerusalem, but it's in heaven, for our citizenship is in heaven. Whence also we wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 3.20. And you see, we are fellow citizens. We belong to heaven now. And the word conversation, you see, in the authorized version is rightly changed to citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, notice this. This is important. It does not mean that the apostles and prophets were the foundation, but they personally laid the foundation because we read that the early church was built on the doctrine upon that which the apostles were teaching. In Acts 2.42, right at the day of Pentecost, it says that group that were brought into the church, 
they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And much has been written about the identity of the prophets. Are they Old Testament prophets here, New Testament prophets? The fact that the prophets are in the same classification as apostles without the article the would seem to designate them, I think, as New Testament prophets. And I think that you will find this confirmed when we get in the third chapter here. Now, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, and that reveals that Christ is the rock on which the church is built. Paul made it very clear in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. And Peter put it like this, Wherefore also it's contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them that stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, the important thing to note here is that Peter says that the Lord Jesus is that chief cornerstone. He is that rock on which the church is built. And therefore, Peter understood when the Lord Jesus said to him, I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's he talking about? He's talking about himself. He's the rock on which the church is built. And the apostles and prophets put down that foundation, by the way, which is that Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's the rock on which the church is built. He's the foundation. Now, verses 21 and 22. "...in whom every building fitly framed together is growing unto a holy sanctuary." In the Lord, in whom you also are being builded together for a habitation that is a permanent temple of God in the Spirit. Now, again, the analogy here is to the temple of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament ritual, I think, is obvious here. Yet the contrast is revealed in the analogy. There were, for instance, several buildings in the temple at Jerusalem, and I don't think Paul is referring to the different buildings. He means each individual believer is fitted into the total structure. And that is the way that Peter expressed it, you remember, that we are stones just fit it in, built upon Christ the rock. Now, Paul speaks of the church as a temple which is currently under construction. And that's quite interesting because in Paul's day, Herod's temple, which was the temple at that time, was unfinished. It had already been, in our Lord's day, 40 years in building, and it was destroyed in 70 A.D., and even at that time it was not completed. Now, the church is under construction today. It'll be finished, and it's being built in a most unusual way. We're told here it's growing unto a holy sanctuary. Now, that reveals that it's unfinished, and the structure's being built differently. You don't put one stone on top of another in a cold way. This temple is growing, and God is taking dead material, dead in trespasses and sins, gives it life, born again, and now it's growing into a living temple. As Solomon's temple was built without the sound of the hammer, so the Holy Spirit silently places each dead sinner through regeneration and baptism into the living temple. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And it's called a holy sanctuary. It's holy because the Holy Spirit indwells it. And by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the saved sinner is placed in the Lord, and the Holy Spirit indwells each believer. We're told that. But ye are not in the flesh, Paul says, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That's Romans 8, 9. Now, it's a habitation. That is a permanent temple of God in the Spirit. When believers come together in a building to worship, the Holy Spirit is present. And in that sense, God's in that building. But when each believer leaves the building, it's empty. God's not in any church building today any more than he's in any bar room. Today, God indwells believers, not buildings. Actually, God has never dwelt in any building made with hands. Listen to Solomon, 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain me, how much less this house that I build in. It's a pagan philosophy which places God in a human-made structure. The purpose of the church as a temple is to reveal the presence and glory of God on earth. When believers assemble together in a church, the impression should be made upon the world, even in this age, that God's in his holy temple. The world should feel that God can be found in a church service. But my question is, can he today? And I'm sorry if I seem like I'm criticizing, but my friends, the world is not sure God's meeting with folk today. I'm sure that there'd be a great many more there if they were sure God was present. Now we come to chapter 3, and the church is a mystery. This is the last chapter in which we see here the doctrinal side. We go to the practical side in the next chapter. But now the church is a mystery. And in the first four verses, we have the explanation of the mystery. 5 through 13, the definition of the mystery. And then we have this second great prayer here, 14 through 21, prayer for power and knowledge. Now, I'd like to say a preliminary word for chapter 3 here. What do we mean when we say the church is a mystery? And there's a great deal of misunderstanding as to that. And there are two extreme viewpoints that have been made in our day. And these viewpoints, they are very much a mystery to me. That was not the intention of the apostle, to make it that kind of a mystery. The word for mystery bears no resemblance, by the way, to this modern connotation of who done it. We're not talking here at all about Conan Doyle or Agatha Christie. Rather, it's something that had not previously been revealed, but it's currently made manifest. Now, in this case, it's the church, which was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is solely a revelation of the New Testament. Now, Moffat translates the word mystery by divine secret. Weymouth uses the word truth. I like the expression divine secret. It was a divine secret. And a divine secret was something that God has not revealed up to a certain point. Now he's going to reveal it. We've been over this before when we saw the mystery in the first chapter. Now there are two extreme groups. One group ignores the clear-cut statement of Paul that the church is not a revelation of the Old Testament. They treat the church as a continuation of Israel in the Old Testament. And they appropriate all the promises that God made to Israel. Dr. Ironside showed me a Bible that he had years ago in his study. And back in the Old Testament, it had at the top the subjects. And it says, blessings for the church. It was really in the prophets. It was for Israel. Blessings for the church. Then they came to another page, and he showed it to me. It says, curses for Israel. It's quite interesting. The church took the blessings but left the curses for Israel. But the interesting thing, both belong to Israel. And this other group, they place undue emphasis upon Paul's statement. He made known unto me the mystery and my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. They treat the mystery as the peculiar revelation of Paul. And I'm going to show that's inaccurate. As a result, there has been the pernicious practice of shifting the beginning of the church to some date after Pentecost. And on this sliding scale, several dates have been suggested. And when one becomes untenable, why, well, they adopt another one. This group has probably been after me more and fought me more than any other group in Southern California. 
when anyone says, I'm a hyper-dispensationalist, they must be wrong because the hyper-dispensationalist probably fought me more than any other individual in this area. And I'm glad for it because I think that a man's known by the enemies he makes. If you want to know what position I hold, ask the liberal in Southern California and ask the hyper-dispensationalist and ask those who are not conforming their lives to the Word of God and don't like Bible study. And I like my enemies. They tell a great deal about me, by the way. And so, these are two extreme positions. Now, there have been two ways of interpreting the mystery. One is to entirely ignore it and go back and find the church back in the Old Testament and talk about the church there as being Israel. And I had a professor in a denominational seminary that he traced the church back to the Garden of Eden. Now, you can't beat that, friends. You couldn't go much farther back than that. Well, it's not in the Old Testament. Paul says it's a mystery, which means that it was not revealed in the Old Testament at all. And the other extreme is to become a hyper-dispensationalist, and that means that you have several dispensations after the day of Pentecost. Now, on the day of Pentecost, something happened. And to wash back and forth over Pentecost as if you're the tide washing over the beach, I think it's entirely wrong. Something happened on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came, began forming the body of believers. That'll continue until he takes the church out of the world. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. That is, when we're taken out of the world and presented to Christ. Now you have, first here, the explanation of the mystery. Now there is a mechanics to this section, and that's the reason I suggested that you have the Scripture before you in order to follow this, because it will make it more meaningful to you. Paul says here in the first two verses, "...for this cause I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles." Now, actually... There begins a parenthesis, and that parenthesis goes down to verse 14. And in other words, because of these marvelous privileges that are now accorded to Gentiles, and Paul enumerated them back in chapter 2, we were far off, strangers without hope and without God. Now, all that's been rectified. Through Christ, we've been brought in. Now, because of all that, Paul's going to pray for them. And he starts out, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And then drop down to verse 14, he says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, everything between that is a parenthesis, and that actually is where he's talking about the mystery. Before he came to his prayer... He says, "...if so be," that is, upon the supposition, "...that ye heard of the dispensation, or the economy, of the grace of God which is given me to you." Now, this if so here, it marks the beginning of the parenthesis. In verse 14, he'll pick that up, you see. That is, the prayer. Now, in between, he says, "...ye heard of the economy," that is, the dispensation." Will you notice that, that he says here, if you've heard of the dispensation, now that's the economy of the grace of God. You and I are living in the dispensation of grace. Now, when somebody says, now, I don't like that, McGee, I'm not a dispensationalist. All I can say to you is you ought to be, if you believe the Bible, you're some kind of a dispensationalist. Now, you may not be one like I am. I hope you're not an extreme one, but I hope you believe that we live today in the dispensation of the grace of God because that's exactly what Paul's saying here. I didn't say it. I didn't coin this word. Dr. Schofield didn't coin it in the Schofield Bible. It came out of the epistles of Paul, if you please. He uses the word. Others use the word. If you've heard of the economy of the grace of God which was given me toward you, how that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote unto you before in few words. Now, you remember back in chapter 1, verse 10, we spoke of this word dispensation. 
He is speaking of the divine plan and the arrangement by which God had called and sent him to the Gentiles as compared to the other apostles. Paul's ministry was different and special. That is, Paul had said to the Galatians, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. The message was not different, but the ones to whom the message was to be given were different folk in a different category. Paul went to the Gentiles and told them, you've been far off, now you can be brought in. Peter went to his own people, to Israel, and he said to them, there's none other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. Same gospel, though. And Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Gentile, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. They now go to two different groups of people. Now, these are being brought in to something that's brand new. Now, that was a different economy than you have back in the Old Testament, you see, or a different dispensation. Paul was a Pharisee before, and he lived by the law. He never went out and preached to Gentiles. That was a different economy he was under. Now he's under a new economy, and it's altogether different. But God's mode of salvation has always been the same, because back under law, he didn't save them by keeping law, but by bringing the sacrifice when they saw that they had come short of the glory of God, and that sacrifice pointed to Christ, you see. Now, what is this that he's going to talk about, this economy now? He says, how, verse 3 and 4, how that by revelation, that is, by the apocalypsin, the mystery, that is, the sacred secret, was made known to me. That is, now, Paul says, the mystery was made known to him. Now, on the basis of this, there are those that immediately say, these hyper-dispensationalists, they say, well, now Paul was the only one that had the mystery. That is, they used to say that. I don't know whether they still say it or not. I have very little contact with them today, by the way, but after studying the third chapter of Ephesians here, I expect to have a whole lot of contact with them. I'm sure that they'll be writing to straighten me out concerning this. Now, he's going to make it very clear in this chapter that This that has been revealed was not revealed to him alone. Let me drop down to verse 5. "...which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of man, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs of the same body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus by means of the gospel." Now, that was something you see that all the apostles had. So, Paul here, speaking of himself, here at the beginning, he says, since he's writing to them, and he's had his ministry with the Ephesians, he says, it was made known to me, but is also made known to the other apostles, as I've written in few words, whereby when you read, ye may perceive my insight, that is, my understanding in the mystery of Christ, which is Christ, of course. Now, In other words, by revelation means that Paul's conversion, when Christ informed him that when he persecuted the church, he persecuted Christ. The church was the body of Christ. And Paul found out for the first time God is doing something new, that a church had come into existence. And that, you see, was on the day of Pentecost. Now, the mystery, the sacred secret, as we've said before and we continue to repeat it, was not a whodunit. Now, was it something mysterious? It was specifically something not revealed in the Old Testament. Therefore, it was unknown to man, because it could only be known by revelation. But now it's revealed in the New Testament. And this word is used 27 times in the New Testament. It refers to about 11 different mysteries. Paul seems to be making a contrast actually with the mystery religions of the Greco-Roman world. And there were many in that day. These were secret lodges in which sadistic rites were performed. And the initiate was warned not to reveal the secrets of the mystery religions. 
and I have in my study that I made. In fact, it was a thesis I wrote when I was in seminary on the mystery religions. This is something that even today not too much is known about, and yet we do know a great deal about them, but very few Christians seem to know about them. Now, in contrast, Paul says, "'Woe is me if I preach not the gospel, and we are stewards today of the mysteries of God.'" That is, we are to give the message out. This is not something to be kept in a secret lodge. This is something to be shouted from the housetop. Now, Paul had made brief reference to the mystery back in verse 9 of chapter 1. You will recall, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. He mentions it there. And then you come on down and you find that, again, Paul mentions this matter of the mystery in the second chapter, verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall a petition between us. And this was something that had not been revealed before, you see. And in that sense, it was a mystery. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make of himself of two, one new man, so making peace. Now, this was something that was, you see, not revealed before. Now, the mystery is that Christ is risen He's head of a new body made up of Jews and Gentiles and of all tribes and peoples of the earth. This was not revealed in the Old Testament. Paul, you remember, put it like this in Romans 16, 25. He says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. You see now, he makes clear here what he's talking about. The mystery was not revealed before. And in Colossians 1, 26, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Now, anybody that goes back into the Old Testament says this is the church back in the Old Testament, you know something that apparently God wasn't telling. And I would say you're almost smarter than the Lord is. You've more or less usurped his place because you're telling something that he didn't tell and he didn't make it known and that back in the Old Testament wasn't there. And apparently these folks know something that God didn't know back in the Old Testament. My friend, may I say to you, the mystery means he didn't reveal it in the Old Testament. And since he didn't reveal it, it's not there. Now we have here the definition of the mystery. Which in other generations... Now I'm reading verses 5 and 6 of the third chapter. Which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of man as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and of the same body, that is, fellow members, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus by means of the gospel. Paul now clarifies what he means by the mystery. And there is a sharp contrast between the sons of man in past generations and the apostles and the prophets of the church. No one in the Old Testament had a glimmer of light relative to the church. It's now revealed to the holy apostles, and holy because they've been set aside for this office by God. And the prophets here are definitely New Testament prophets. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of this mystery. The Lord Jesus said this in John 16, 15, "...all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, he'll take of mine and show it unto you." Now, what is the mystery? And here I want to make a distinction, and don't miss it, friends. The mystery was not that Gentiles would be saved. The Old Testament taught that. Let me give you a passage or two. Isaiah eleven ten, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Again, Isaiah 63, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. In Zechariah 2.11, And many nations 
shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And Malachi 1.11, Far from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Now, what is the mystery then? if it's not the mystery that Gentiles are to be saved. The mystery... Now, will you hear me very carefully? The mystery was that Gentiles and Israelites were placed on the same basis by faith in Christ. They are brought into a new body, and that body is the church. Don't miss that. And Christ is the head of this new body. This, therefore, has caused a threefold division in the human race. Now, you have this division of the human family. From Adam to Abraham, it's 2,000 years plus, all were Gentiles. From Abraham to Christ, there were Jews and Gentiles. Now, 2,000 years. All right, we now come from Christ, the day of Pentecost, to the rapture. And that's been now 2,000 years plus. Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. That's exactly what Paul said, as we've said before. 1 Corinthians 10, 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, Paul took in the human family when he said that. There's no fourth group, and it's not just two groups. There's Israel, Gentiles, and the church of God. Now, the church is not in the Old Testament, de facto. Now, I think there are types of it back there, but it's not a revelation. Christ said, on this rock, I will build my church. And at that time, it was future. And you're in the New Testament when he said that. The church began on the day of Pentecost, and to go beyond Pentecost makes the body of Christ Siamese twins, a Jewish church and a Gentile church, coexisting. And the church is not Siamese twin. It began on the day of Pentecost, all Jewish, yes. And then you have that period of transition when Gentiles are brought in. The church is one body made up of both Jew and Gentile, and that means Gentiles include all the peoples of the world. Now, Paul said, "...of which I became a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, which was given me according to the working of his power. Now, Paul assumed no place of superiority in the knowledge of the mystery by virtue of the fact that he was the apostle of the Gentiles. He takes only the title of diakonos, a worker or a helper, or deacon. It was the gift of God's grace which had transformed him from Saul the proud Pharisee who persecuted the church to Paul the apostle, who was now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and took him out of one group and put him in another, and he's now a member of the body of Christ. All that had been accomplished was through the working of the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul had both the gift and the power. Now, verses 8 and 9. To me, who am less than the least, And that is really something here. He says, I'm more least than anyone else. Of all the saints is this grace given to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the dispensation or the economy of the mystery. Now, we are living today in the economy are the dispensation of the mystery of the church, the gospel of grace, which from the ages past has been hid in God who created all things. And you want to know something? There are a lot of things God hasn't told us yet. That's one of the reasons that I'm anticipating heaven, is because some of you don't think I know very much. And if you'll not let it out, you're right. Please don't tell anybody, because I do have a few people fooled. But you know, when you and I get to heaven, we are really going to be smart. We're going to start learning things. God hadn't told us very much. It's amazing how little God really told us. You know, he never told anybody about that little Adam. He never told about diamonds being down in the earth. He kept all that to himself. He let man find out a lot of things. A lot of things man can't find out. It can only be known 
by revelation. And the church was a mystery in that sense. Now, Paul says, I became a minister, a diakonos, a deacon, according to the gift of the grace of God, which was given me according to the working of his power. That is, the junimus power. Now, to me, I'm less than the least. It was given to me to preach this. I'm the least of the apostles. And Paul says, I'm not meek to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And he thought of what he was and then of what the grace that God had done for him. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, he hath enabled me, for he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who before was a blasphemer, persecutor. What a mighty revolution took place in the life of Paul to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, how wonderful! And to make all men see the economy, the dispensation of the mystery, that which was revealed in the past is now revealed. Now, he says, in order that now there might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenlies through the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the purpose of the ages which he wrought in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access in confidence through our faith in him. Now, another purpose of the mystery is revealed here. God's created intelligences are learning something of the wisdom of God through the church. They not only see the love of God displayed and lavished upon us, but the wisdom of God is revealed to the angels. And how wonderful that is. Therefore, he says in verse 13, Wherefore I entreat you that ye not lose heart in my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Because of the great goals of the mystery, which Paul has enumerated, he's willing to suffer imprisonment as the apostle to the Gentiles. And he didn't want the Ephesians now to lose heart and be discouraged because the imprisonment of Paul was working for his good and their glory. And he says, "...who now suffer, rejoice in my sufferings for you, fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church." He said that in Colossians 1.24. Now, next time, we're going to look at Paul's second great prayer that is shared. Read it before we come to it, friends. This is wonderful. We're treading on the high places in this epistle. Now, friends, we've come in this third chapter where we see the church is a mystery. And Paul has dealt with that in what is actually the parenthesis in the chapter. Now, you'll recall that with verse 1 of the chapter, I dropped down to verse 14. That's where we are today. So let's go back and tie the strings together again. And this parenthesis comes in between. And I also should add, it is an emphasis, too. Now, verse 1 reads, For this cause I, Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, For this cause I bow my knees. Naturally, we say, well, what cause? Well, it was because of his deep interest in these Ephesians, and he wanted them to enter into the great truth here of this dispensation, this new economy that we live in, and to experience all the riches of his grace that's in Christ Jesus. All of this is the cause now, and that which was in the background. Now he says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are several things here, even in this verse, I'd like to call attention to. Now, when we were looking at the prayer that's back in the first chapter, I mentioned what a great man of prayer Paul really was, and that we know him as an apostle, a preacher, a teacher, but not so much as a man of prayer. And I called attention to some of the characteristics of his prayers that were there. Now, in this verse, we have another characteristic of the prayers of Paul. And this prayer reveals a 
posture in prayer. Now, I hope I'm not splitting hairs, but here it is. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not insisting that in our public prayer meetings today that we all get out on our knees. However, I rather wish that we did. One of the best meetings I ever had was as a young preacher in my first pastorate. I went up into Middle Tennessee to the old Stones River Church. It was right near where the battle of Stones River was fought in the Civil War. In fact, there's a cemetery that is there. And it's a little country church. And I never shall forget that first night when I began, I said, let's bow our heads in prayer. Well, they did more than bow their heads. I shut my eyes and I heard a rumbling, and I thought everybody got up and walked out. So I ventured to take a look, and I did. I opened one eye and looked, and you know, I didn't see a soul, and I thought they'd really walked out on me. But since I was praying to the Lord, I just continued to pray. And then I said, Amen. And then I opened my eyes, and you know, here came all these people up. And that little old country church was packed out. They came up just like corn coming up out of the ground between those pews. They'd all got down on their knees. And you know, we had a wonderful meeting. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying just because we got down on our knees that we had a great meeting. I do want to say this. I think it helped a great deal. I'm afraid today that in the formality and the ritual even of our nice new churches and our plush seats and carpets on the floor, that today we are missing something in our relationship to the Lord. My feeling is there ought to be more of the easy familiarity in worship and more reverence for God, especially at the time of prayer. Our proper place, we are a creature. We ought to go down on our all fours before Almighty God. And Paul said that's the way he prayed. And I've always felt that it's a good way to pray. I used to pray. Now, I must confess now with arthritis, I don't do it like I used to. But I used to get down right on my face, right down in the study, and pray there. And it's amazing how it helps you to pray. And this is something I think that's good for man. Now, I'm not going to insist on this, but I'm just calling your attention. This is the way Paul did it. And I think he's a very good example for us today. Aren't we told also that our Lord went forward there in the Garden of Gethsemane and fell on his face? You know, it wouldn't hurt a lot of us saints to fall on our face. I think that would be the proper place for us to get down on our face. Now we have something else in this verse. He says, I bow my knees unto the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know you're going to think that I'm splitting hairs. I hope that I'm not splitting hairs here. But I think this is rather important. What we have here is Paul prayed to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that Back in that first prayer in Ephesians 1, 17, he says that he addressed his prayer to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we find that that was his formula, and I think it's a rather tight formula to address all prayers to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, somebody says, say, you are splitting hairs, aren't you? No. Listen to the Lord Jesus. In John 16, 23, he says, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. These men, when they were with him three years, I think they were like a group of children in many ways. I think it was gimme, gimme a great deal of the time. Now he says to them, I'm leaving you. And you're not going to ask me anything. But whatever ye will ask the Father in my name. Now, what does he mean by that? He means simply this, that when you and I pray to the Lord Jesus directly to him, we rob ourselves of an intercessor. You see, he's our great intercessor. And that's what it means to pray in his name. 
It means to go to God with a prayer that the Lord Jesus himself can lift to the Father for you and me. And that's what it means to pray in his name. And I think that we ought to be very careful in our prayer life. Now, I was in a service. You know, I guess being retired now, I noticed things I never noticed before. They called on a visiting brother to pray for the meeting at this conference. And we got off to a good start, marvelous start. But this brother slowed us down that night a great deal because the music had been excellent. Pastor did a fine job of presiding. Then they called on this brother to pray. And I counted three times that he came around and prayed for me. My feeling was, when I heard him say it the second time, you don't need to tell the Lord that again. He heard you the first time. And then when he came around the third time, I said to myself, he'll turn the Lord off now because the Lord will get tired of hearing that repetitious prayer. Well, my feeling was that wasn't needful. Now, of course, I guess after this brother looked me over, he decided I needed praying for it three times. But nevertheless, I feel like that is vain repetition that the heathen use. I think we ought to be very careful about our prayer life. My, when you and I are going to make a talk before a group of people, we certainly prepare ourselves, don't we, for this broadcast. I try to get ready for it. And most of the time, I'm here with just the Bible. But I've got preparation back of it. Friends, it may not look that way, but I surely do. And we always, if we're going to talk to other people, well, why do we in our prayer life, especially in public prayer, when you've got a group of people there, you get up and go all the way around Robin's house, and then you take off down through the country and around the world. And after you make a trip around the world, everybody's a little exhausted for the evening service. So that the thing interesting here is that Paul went directly to God the Father and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now another characteristic that follows along with this, you notice this prayer is brief. And did you notice that the other prayer of Paul was brief? And the prayer of Paul in Philippians, the fourth chapter, it's a brief prayer. All of Paul's prayers were brief. Very brief. And did you notice that all of the prayers in Scripture are brief? The Lord said, When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. And all Bible prayers are brief prayers. Moses' great prayer for Israel only takes three verses. Elijah on top of Mount Carmel giving that great prayer there as he stood alone for God against the prophets of Baal. Only took one verse in a tight situation like that. I think I would have used at least two or three verses. And then Nehemiah's great prayers crowded into seven verses. And these other great prayers in Scripture, the Lord's Prayer, which is John 17. I can read that in three minutes. That's all it took the Lord to pray that prayer, by the way. I had here in Pasadena years ago, in fact, way back in the 40s, about 42 and 3, a program on the radio, and I asked questions of the audience and had them send in answers. And those that got the answer in first, that is, the earliest postmark, we would give them a prize. And one of the questions I asked was, what is the shortest prayer in the Bible? And the first week I didn't get an answer. Second week I didn't. That is the correct one. And then in the third week, I got the correct answer. And you know what that shortest prayer in the Bible is? Well, it's that prayer of Simon Peter. Lord, save me. And he's out there on the water. And so many people wrote in and said, well, I didn't think that was a prayer. It was so short. Well, my friend, that was a prayer. And it was answered immediately. You see, if Simon Peter had prayed that prayer like some of us preachers pray on Sunday morning, Lord, thou who art the omnipotent, the omniscient, the omnipresent one, Simon Peter would have been 20 feet underwater before he got to what he wanted. But I tell you, he got down to business. And Paul's prayers are brief prayers also. Then let's look at the content of this prayer and notice what he prayed for. He says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And by the way, 
God has a wonderful family. A great many folk think that when they pray, it's me and my son John, his wife, and us four, no more. But it's a little wider than that. And then there are folk that feel like their little clique in the church is about the only one that the Lord's listening to. And then there's some people think their local church is just about it. That constitutes the saints. And then there are others that think their denomination is the only one. And then there are others that think that it's just the church. Just those saved from the day of Pentecost to the parousia. My friends, God saved people long before the church came into existence. He's going to be saving them after the church leaves. They're all going to be in the family of God, but they're not in the church. And then God has other members of his family, his angels or his family. And he has created intelligences. John, when he saw them, he said, you can't number them. And, of course, he didn't have one of these latest gadgets of putting it through the computer. But he said he couldn't number them. So there must have been quite a group. All of those are the family of God. Now he says here, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Now, he prayed here this marvelous prayer that they might be strengthened with power in the inner man. Now, we pray a great deal for the outward man. And don't misunderstand me. I think that is a marvelous way in which to pray, to pray for the physical needs of folk. And Paul did. He prayed for himself, for that thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times about it. And it's very wonderful to know that God does hear and answer prayer. Now he says here, will you notice it, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now again, I have to call attention to it's according to, not out of his riches. If he took it out of his riches, it had been like Mr. Rockefeller, who used to give that caddy a dime. Well, he gave it out of his riches, not according to his riches. If he'd given it according to his riches, the boy would have walked off with his pockets filled with dimes. And now God always answers according to his riches. And Paul prayed for the Philippians like that. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, The petition is that the believers might be strengthened with power by his Spirit into the inner man. You see, the spiritual nature of the believer needs prayer as well as the physical. How often the spiritual today is neglected while all the attention is given to the physical side. Paul prays for the inner man, for he realizes the outward man is passing away. Now, in this second petition here, He prays that Christ, now will you notice this, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Paul is praying here that Christ might dwell in their hearts. This is to think the Lord's thoughts after him, ye in me and I in you. Paul could exclaim, Christ liveth in me. In Christ is the high word of this epistle. And the wonderful thing, the counterpart of it is that We're in Christ. That's our position. And Christ is in us. That's our possession. And that is the practical side down here, because Paul could say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, "...examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not of your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate." Christ has not come as a temporary visitor. He's come as a permanent tenant by the Spirit to live in our lives. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now, this third petition here is that the knowledge surpassing love of Christ, that they might here be rooted and grounded. Rooted refers to botany. That's life. And grounded refers to architecture, that's stability, that they might have life and stability. And this is for all the saints. 
and that they might now know something of the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. And if it passes knowledge, then we can't understand it. But he says here that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, and that you might know something here, he says, of the breadth and length and depth and height of the love of Christ. Well, the breadth of it is the arms of Christ reach around the world. I'm the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. The length of it begins with the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world and proceeds unto the throne before which there is a Lamb that had been slain. And then the depth of it goes all the way to the death of the cross. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And the height of it reaches to the throne of God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And only the Holy Spirit can lead a believer into the vast experience of the love of Christ. It's infinite, and it's beyond human comprehension, and that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now he says, Now to him who is able to do beyond all things superabundantly, beyond what we ask or think, according to the power which worketh in us, to him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, unto all the generations of the ages, of the ages of the ages, of the ages, throughout eternity. This is a doxology, and it's a benediction. It concludes the prayer of Paul, and it also concludes the first main division of this epistle. This is a mighty outburst of spiritual praise. I wonder if you could think God's thoughts after him by reading this, or as I read it, could you say, them's my sentiments? Is that what you could say? We are not able to so much as touch the hem of the garment of the spiritual gifts God's prepared to give to his own. Oh, how wonderful this is, that he might give to us superabundantly. Oh, how good he is, and how small we are. We just can't contain all of his blessings. Now, we have come to a new section in the epistle to the Ephesians, the conduct of the church. The first three chapters, we saw the calling of the church, the vocation, the vocalization of the church. Now we have here the vocation of the believer, the heavenly calling, and now the earthly walk of the believer. And not the worldly walk, but the earthly walk. They're walking here on this earth. And the church is seated yonder in the heavenlies in Christ. He is the head of the body, and he's seated at God's right hand. But the church is to walk down here in this world, as we shall see. Now, the church here is called a new man. The church now has been made new, and it's a new man to walk. And now we come to the practical side of this. Now, in this last section, we shall consider the conduct, the confession, and the conflict of the church. The church here is a new man, and the church will be a bride. And the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, we've been on the mountain peak of transfiguration in the first section. And probably the highest spiritual point in the New Testament is in these last three chapters. And that's the reason we've spent so much time on the mount. But in this last division, now we descend to the plane of living, right down where the rubber meets the road. Then now we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty, where we confront a demon-possessed world and a skeptical mob. Are we able to translate the truths of the mountaintop into shoe leather? Are we able to stand and walk through the world? Our Lord said that we are in the world, but not of the world. Now, it's been stated that Ephesians occupies the same position theologically as Joshua does in the Old Testament. And now we come to the position where this truth is manifest. Joshua, you remember, entered the land of promise. He led the children of Israel 
over the Jordan that speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, brought them into the promised land. That's where you and I live today, or at least where we should be living today, in resurrection territory. And Joshua brought them into the land that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and also to Moses. And it was his by right of promise. But he had to appropriate it by taking possession. And possession is the great word in Joshua. And now we've come to that word here. Before, in the first three chapters, it's position, position, position. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. God's made them over to us. But are we walking down here in possession of them? And the children of Israel promised the promised land. But to them it was a never-never land because they had up to this point never entered it. Now they've entered it. And they're to enter it for their enjoyment and blessing, blessing to others. Although enemies and other obstacles stood in the way, Joshua had to overcome and occupy. And he was told, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that's yours. Now, all of it's yours. But you're not going to enjoy only that which you lay hold of. The believer is privileged today now to move in and occupy the all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, the unsearchable riches in Christ. But they must be searched out with the spiritual Geiger counter, which is the Word of God. Now, we have seen glorious declarations. Henceforth, there will be commands for those who have been called to such an exalted place, a way of life is demanded, which is commensurate with the calling. So many people today dwell on the first part of Ephesians. They become rather super-duper saints, very spiritual. I remember when I first came to Southern California, there was a family in the church. That is, they attended. They were not members. And, in fact, rather active and very lovely people. And I asked them one day, the man and his wife, why they didn't join. And they looked up toward the ceiling and said, we're members of the invisible church, and fluttered their eyelids. Well, I looked up toward the ceiling. I didn't see that invisible church. And, of course, the reason I didn't see it, it was invisible. Now, I found out that a lot of these folk who are members of the invisible church, they're really invisible. They're invisible on Sunday night, and they're invisible on Wednesday night. In fact, they're invisible when you need somebody, by the way. But the invisible church is to make itself visible down here in the local assembly, and the individuals down here are to walk that way. Now we've come to the practical side, the earthly conduct of the church, the vocation. Now in this chapter, the church is a new man. And we have in the first six verses the exhibition of the new man. And then verses 7 through 16, the inhibition of the new man. And then verses 17 to 32, the prohibition of the new man. Now, the new man is to exhibit himself down here. The members of the invisible church are to make themselves visible. They are to exhibit themselves. They are to be extroverts, if you please and get the Word of God out something. Now, we want to say that what follows here is restricted to those that are in Christ. The ones we're talking to now, at least that Paul's talking to in this epistle, and that the Spirit of God is talking, are saved people. Now, if you're listening to this today and you're not a Christian, and there are quite a few folk that are not Christians, they've written to us, they say they listen. What God is saying here, he's not asking you to do until you become a child of his through faith in Christ, become a member of his body. Now, this is for those in whom we have redemption and they've heard the word of truth. Now, a dead man cannot be urged to walk, no matter how much insistence is made or how important it may be. Now, Paul is going to start off by saying, Therefore, I beg you. You, the prisoner of the Lord, that ye walk worthy of the calling 
with which you're called. Now, here is the thought. He said that we were dead in trespasses and sins. That's the condition of the laws. You just don't go out to the cemetery. You don't send the top sergeant out there for him to say, attention, you know, give a command, and then forward, march. I want you to understand something very clearly. If you say that, there won't be any marching. Oh, there won't be any marching, friends. Nobody's going to move. They've got to have life first. So he's not talking here to unsaved people. And I must say, oh, we're delighted to have you if you're not a Christian. But I want you to stay on the sidelines and listen, because this will tell you what God would ask of you if you're going to become a believer. And then when you look around you, you'll know whether the saints that you know are living as God wants them to live. This, by the way, is a very nice program to have in your hand to see whether the saints are. Now we have here that these instructions are given to the new man, not to the man dead in trespasses and sin. The world is saying today, and the religions are saying, do something and you'll be somebody. God says, be somebody, and then you can do something. Now we have it. Verse 1, Therefore, I exhort you, I beg you, I, the prisoner of the Lord, that you walk worthily of the calling with which you were called. Now, therefore, is a connective. It is a transitional word, and it's in view of all that God has done for the believer that's been stated in these last three chapters. Now, in view of that, therefore, and Paul is a prisoner because of his position in Christ. The man seated in the heavens is also seated in prison, and he's there because he was a witness to the Gentiles And he's telling them that, now, I'm a prisoner. I beseech you, a prisoner in the Lord. And beggar beseeches the same word that you have in Romans 12, 1. This is not the command of Sinai with fire and thunder. It's the gentle wooing of love. I beseech you that you walk worthy of the high calling. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, here, it's to walk worthily of the calling. Now, it's a call to walk on a plane that's commensurate with your position that's in Christ. Paul said to the Philippians in 127, only let your conversation, that is, your manner of life, your lifestyle, be as it becometh, the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, So ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. He says in Colossians, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.10, your witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Now, he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the gospel. Now, friends, people may not be telling you, but they're smelling you today. They are sniffing you to see whether you're genuine or not, whether you're a real child of God through faith in Christ. And the only way they can tell is by your walk. How do you walk through the world? And by the way, it's not so much how you walk as where you walk. You remember, John says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, We have fellowship with him. That's to walk in the light of the Word of God. How much time do you really spend in the Word of God? Don't you know that your children know how much time you spend in the Bible? Don't you know your neighbors know? Don't you know that the people in the church know how much time? And then we talk about fellowship with God. We have to walk in the light. And what about the man outside? I heard this story years ago. It was over in Memphis, Tennessee that there was a man, one of these men, who gives out tracts, and it's fine to give out tracts. I think it's a ministry that requires a lot of prayer, and it ought to be done with a great deal of intelligence. And this man was handing out tracts, and he handed one to a black man. The black man said to him, what is this? The man says, it's a tract. <laughs> the black man handed it back to him. He says, I can't read. 
He said, you say it's a track? Well, he says, I can't read it, but I can watch your tracks, and I'll see what kind of tracks you make. May I say to you, that was the greatest sermon that that Christian ever had preached to him. Somebody's watching his tracks, not reading the tracks he's giving out. That's the thing that's important. Now, Paul says, on the basis of the fact I'm a prisoner, I'm in prison for you Gentiles, I beseech you now, not a command, but I beseech you. Now, he says here that with all lowliness, now he's going to tell us how to walk. We're to walk with all lowliness. And he mentions here about seven different things. I'm going to take them up. With all lowliness. Now, that means a mind brought low. You know, Paul practiced what he preached. It's the opposite of pride. And you'll find that in the life of the Apostle Paul, he always exhibited a lowly mind. Oh, today, if our seminaries would get off of this binge of trying to make intellectual preachers and teach some of them to walk in lowliness of mind. And so many of them need to walk in lowliness of mind. I remember hearing the story years ago of the young preacher He was a brilliant young fellow in Scotland in the seminary. And he's so brilliant that when a very fashionable church in Edinburgh wanted a supply, why the seminary sent this fine young man. Well, I tell you, he was filled with pride because of the fact he was called to minister in this great church. And so he went there. Now, he'd never had any experience. He was brilliant sitting in class are in his study. But when he got up before that group of people, there was something he'd never known about before in that stage fright. And he forgot everything he ever knew. He memorized his sermon, but he forgot it. He forgot everything. And he just stumbled through. And a dear little Scotch lady there watched him as he came down. And he just really made a failure. And she went up to him and she said, Young man, said, I was watching you this morning. And she said, I'd like to say to you, if you had gone up in that pulpit like you came down out of that pulpit, then you would have come down out of that pulpit like you went up in that pulpit. He went up with pride. He came down, I tell you, with lowliness and meekness. This man here certainly came down. Now, it's the opposite of pride. That's what it is. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Paul said to the Philippians in 2, 3, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I think this is the flagship of all Christian virtues. It characterized our Lord. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart. Oh, the number of Christians today that are actually, they have a pride of race. They have a pride of place. They have a pride of face. And they actually have a pride of grace. They're proud. They're saved by grace, even. Oh, we need to walk in lowliness of mind. And there's something else to be said about that business of lowliness. All this business today of exalting ourselves. That's what Satan did. That awful thing. It's Stories told about a group of people that went in to see Beethoven's home in Germany. And the guide was taking them through, and they came to the piano where he composed his music. And then after he finished his lecture, he said, if any of you'd like to come up and sit at the piano for a moment and just maybe hit a key or two. And so there was a mighty rush. Everyone tried to get up at first, and everyone trying to except a gray-haired gentleman with long, flowing gray hair. And the guide finally, after they'd all been there, said to him, wouldn't you like to come up and sit down and try playing? Oh, he said, no. He said, I don't feel worthy. That man was Paderewski, by the way. Probably the only man there who was worthy to play the piano. A Beethoven is the one man that wouldn't play it. Oh, how many saints did they rush in? and do things, even in the church. Have no gift for doing, but they do it. Nevertheless, we say we have difficulty finding people to do things. There's another trouble, too. That's the extreme. 
of folk doing things they ought not to be doing. We need to walk in lowliness of mind. Now, meekness means mildness, but it doesn't mean weakness. It doesn't mean that you're Mr. Milk Toast. The two men that are noted for being meek in the Old Testament was Moses, in the New Testament was the Lord Jesus. When you see Moses come down from the mount, break the Ten Commandments, and I tell you, when you see what he said to his brother Aaron and to the children of Israel, you call that meekness? God does. And was the Lord Jesus meek when he went in, drove the money changers out of the temple? He certainly was. Well, the world doesn't call that meekness. What is meekness? Meekness is willing to stand and do the will of God regardless of the cost. Bowing yourself to the will of God. That's meekness. And long-suffering means a long temper. This is a fruit of the Spirit. When we were in 1 Corinthians, I talked about that. Long-suffering means burning slowly over a long period of time. It means we shouldn't have a short fuse. And some of us, I'm afraid, do. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And then the fourth thing here, for bearing one another in love. It means to hold oneself back in the spirit of love, for bearing one another, for giving one another. And then the fifth that's mentioned here, giving diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, the Lord Jesus prayed that we might be one. And the Spirit of God today has baptized us into one body. Now, we are to maintain that we're to maintain that unity. We're not to make it. God never said for us to join the ecumenical movement, because to begin with, you can't make a unity that only the Holy Spirit can make. We're to keep it. And that's the reason that you and I should be with all believers. That is, you and I should feel that we're all one body. Now we have mentioned here seven unities that we are to keep. Will you notice them? He says, ye are one body, and there is one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all, through all, and in all. Now, one body is the body of believers. It began on the day of Pentecost to the parousia, to the rapture. One spirit is the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into the body. One hope of your calling, that one hope is the blessed hope. We have no other hope. One Lord refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, his lordship over believers. The fifth is one faith. That refers to the body of truth called the apostles' doctrine in Acts 2.42. And the sixth, one baptism, refers to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, real baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ritual baptism is by water. Then seven, one God and Father of all. That refers to God's fatherhood of believers. Since there's only one father, he's not the father of unbelievers. The unity of believers produces a sharp distinction between believers and non-believers. He's the father of all who are his by regeneration. He's over all, through all, and in all. means that God is both imminent and he's transcendent. This is a marvelous section of the Word of God, as you can see. Now, friends, you can get so involved in that. We have been talking about the church, which is the body of Christ, and that the head is in heaven. We're joined to him. The church is a body. The church is a new man. The church is a mystery. All of this heading up in the person of Christ, yonder at God's right hand. As someone has said, you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good at all. And a great many people get carried away with that to the extent they don't realize that we're to walk down here in a very bad world, very mean world. And that is where the rubber meets the road. We're now getting down to the nitty-gritty. Paul said, how we're to walk. Now, walking is down here, and that's what the body is to do. We saw first the exhibition of the body, and he spoke to the individual, how the individual is to walk in lowliness, meekness. And then he widened it out to the church. There is one body, one spirit. And then he consummated it with a great, tremendous crescendo. 
And he said, One God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. Now, when he says he's above all, we're speaking there, actually, about the transcendence of God. God is transcendent. He's above his creation. He is not dependent upon it. The Lord doesn't depend on oxygen, you know, to get by. He doesn't have to bring up some supplies from the rear. He doesn't do Saturday shopping in order to have food for the weekend. He's not dependent upon his creation. He is transcendent. He is not only above all, but he's through all. And that means this universe you and I live in, he's in it. (laughs) And he's in you all. And he's motivating it and moving it according to his plan and purpose. And that, you know, adds meaning to life today. It, it makes it sort of worthwhile. It gets a little humdrum every now and then, doesn't it? There is a monotony. Now, I love to make these tapes. But you know, after I've been in this study here every day for about 10 days, making two and three tapes at a time, I'll let you in on something. And I hope you won't tell anybody about it. And that is, it does get monotonous, you know. Get weary and that sort of thing. But, oh, there comes in that great thought, all of this is in the plan and purpose of God. And then I feel like singing the doxology or the hallelujah chorus. And when I do, everybody moves out of earshot. But I sure hope the Lord listens, because he said it's to come from the heart, making melody in your heart. And evidently, that's where I make it, because when it comes out the mouth, there's no melody there. I always think of the experience we had because this, to me, is like a great symphony orchestra that's presented to us here. And you and I are to walk in step with God. We are to walk with the music of heaven today. And it's like a great symphony orchestra. I like to illustrate like this. When I first went to Nashville as pastor, some friends there invited me to go with them to hear a symphony orchestra. They bought a ticket for me, they said, and they wanted me to go. Well, now they thought they were doing me a favor. But, you know, there are other things that I'd rather do than go and listen to a symphony orchestra. And I recognize that I'm a real peasant when it comes to music. I don't understand it at all. But, you know, I got a great message there that day. I went with him, and I sat down. We got there a little early, and there was quite a stir in the auditorium as people were coming in. Then lights went on on the platform, or the stage, I guess I should say, and I noticed all those instruments that were out there. And then it looked to me like over a 100 men came out from all sides, all the different wings. And they came, each one, to his own instrument. I guess they did. didn't sound like it. I was told that was tuning up. And each one played his own little tune. And I give you my word, you have never heard anything that was medley, nothing that was melody there. In fact, it sounded to me like this rock music, even that orchestra way back yonder. And it was terrible. And very frankly, why... They quit after a few moments, which we were very thankful, and then they disappeared again in the wings. And then when the time came, the floodlights came on, footlights, I think they call it. They came on, and then these men came out again. But this time they were different. Before, they were in their shirt sleeves. This time they were in full dress. I tell you, they had a bow tie, beautiful white shirts on. Oh, they were very nice. And each one came to his instrument, but no man dared play it. And then the spotlight went on one of the wings to our right. And there stepped out the director. And he bowed, and there was thunderous applause. And he bowed several times. Then he came over to the podium, and he picked up a little thin stick. And he turned around, bowed again, but it Then he turned his back to the audience there, and he lifted that little baton. And when he did, you could have heard a pin drop in that auditorium. And then he came down with that little stick, and he sure got a lot of music out of that little stick. You have never heard anything. It was this thrilling. It made goose pimples on you. My hair stood on end. It really was thrilling to hear that first tremendous number. And as I sat there, 
because after a while it got a little boring, I began to think about that. And you know, that's the picture of this universe. You and I are living today in a world where every person is playing his own little tune. This group is carrying his little placard, and he's protesting against something. He's against everybody else. And everybody seems to be out of tune, out of harmony with everybody else. And it doesn't look very good in the world today. And you wonder what the outcome's going to be. Well, it's very pessimistic as you look toward and listen to some. And you look toward the situation today. I tell you, I can understand why Simon Peter began to sink in that ocean. When you see the waves around you today, you think this is it. But friends, one of these days, there's going to step out from the wings of this universe, from God's right hand, the director. <laughs> He's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he does, he'll lift the baton. He's going to lift the scepter in nail-pierced hands. And when he does, everything is going to be in tune. He's imminent and he's transcendent. What a tremendous thing. He's above all, through all, and in you all. So don't give up. The director's coming and get us all in tune. Now, we come to the section where we have the inhibition of the new man. The inhibition of the new man. The church now is to walk as a new man in the world. Now, before there was to be the exhibition. The church is to be an extrovert, to witness, to manifest in the life. Now, the church also has inhibitions, and inhibitions are important. The little child doesn't have inhibitions. And the church is not to be like a little baby all the time and manifest itself as a baby. It is to grow up and develop some inhibitions. You know, there are just certain things you don't say. At times, you know. But a little child would say them. And I told a story, I think, about going and visiting with some people, and all they were church members, and they put on quite a performance. How pious they were and religious they were. And then we sat down at the table, and they called on me for the blessing. And I returned thanks, and a little fellow was sitting there in a high chair. I think he's about maybe three years old. The little fella, he looked around, you know, and he turned to his mom. He says, what did he do? <laughs> he had no inhibition. They just didn't return thanks there very often. The little fella didn't know. Now, the church, though, is to have inhibitions because it's to mature and to grow up. Now, will you notice the process that he gives? But to each of us was given the grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, if you'll notice here that he's given the believers gifts. And this is a section again on gifts. We have it in Romans, the 12th chapter. We have it here in this fourth chapter of Ephesians. And then we've already seen it in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. That actually is the larger section on gifts. Now he's saying here that believers are to give diligence to maintain the unity of the Spirit, you see. And how are we to do that? And that does not mean that each is to be a carbon copy of the other. It's not me too proposition. Each believer is given a gift so that he may function in the body of believers in a particular way. Now, let me come back and say something that we said in 1 Corinthians 12. Gifts are given to individuals that they might exercise that gift in the body of believers because they are a member of the body. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, he says that to everyone there is this manifestation of the Spirit and it's given to profit with all which means simply this, a gift is the Spirit doing something through the believer. And he's doing it not for the private devotions of the individual, but he's doing it in the body of believers to build up the body, that is, for the profit of the body. Now, no gift is given to an individual to develop you spiritually. 
It's given to you to function in the body of believers that you might benefit and bless the church. When I hear someone say today, and I've had many letters like this, Oh, Dr. McGee, we do not speak in tongues in the church. We do it for our private devotions. I can say to you categorically from the Word of God, you're dead wrong. A gift was given to profit the church, and you have no right to selfishly use it for your own profit. In fact, the matter is that it's not a gift if it's being used that way. A gift is that you are a member of the body, and every member of my body is to function for a very definite reason. Imagine this morning when I came down to the study. Imagine my eyes saying, Well, we are sleepy today. We'll stay home. You go on down. And they'd say, we want to have our devotions. Well, I want to say to you, friend, I couldn't get along down here without my eyes. I need them in making this tape. And my legs brought me down here. My eyes are looking at the page of Scripture. And my tongue is cooperating a little, I hope. And I hope my brain is. So that, you see, it's when... You are exercising a gift. You're benefiting the church. Now, that is the thing that is quite obvious here. Each believer is given a gift so that he may function in the body of believers in a particular way. And when he does, the body functions. And that's where you get the unity of the Spirit. Together with this gift is given, you see, the grace to exercise it in the power and fullness of the Spirit of God. Now, each believer functioning in his peculiar sphere, he produces a harmony, as does each member of the human body. Now, when one member of my body suffers, Paul says all of it suffers. And therefore, when you will not function, exercise your gift in the body, you just throw us all out of tune. Then he says in verse 8, "...wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high..." He led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto man. Now, he did two things. First, he led captivity captive. Now, you'll notice, first of all, that this is a quotation from Psalm 68, 18. And let me read that. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for man, yea, for the rebellious also, but the Lord God might dwell in him. Now, somebody says, say, there seems to be a discrepancy here in the quotation. It says back in Psalms, he received. Now, here it says he gave. And by the way, may I say that any author has a right to change his own writings, but nobody else does. A man quoted me in an article, but he misquoted me. And believe me, the publisher had to back up and apologize For misquoting. Now, I have a right to misquote my own writing if I want to, if it serves a purpose. Now, the Holy Spirit changes this, but he does it for a purpose. Why? Back in the book of Psalms, the Lord Jesus had the gifts just ready back yonder as he's at God's right hand. And now that he's been here and he now has gone back in the Spirit of God, is the one that today is distributing the gifts, then he gave them, did he not? I think this is very accurate. Now, this, of course, is a reference, I think, to the ascension of Christ. At that time, when he ascended, he did two things. He led captivity captive. And I believe that means that those of the Old Testament who were redeemed but were in paradise, and Christ took them with him out of paradise, yonder into the very presence of God. Because we're told today, when you die, you don't go to paradise, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, we're told he did something else. He gave gifts unto man. Now, that means that he conferred gifts upon living believers in the church that they might witness to the world. Now, you see, at his ascension, he did two things. He took these Old Testament saints in the presence of God. Then he gave gifts. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, baptized them into the body of believers, but he put them in in a certain place to function as a member of the body. And he's been doing that ever since. Now, verses 9 and 10. Now that he ascended, 
What is it unless that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? He that descended, he it is also who ascended, high above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, I believe that the logical explanation here is since Christ has ascended, he must have descended at some previous time. And some see in this only the incarnation. For instance, the early church fathers, though, they saw in it the work of Christ in bringing the Old Testament saints out of paradise up to the throne of God. Now, it's not necessary to assume that he entered into some form of suffering after death. For instance, when he descended into hell, we are told, well, what does that mean? Well, he descended into the place where the dead were. And his incarnation and death were his humiliation and descent. And they were adequate to bring the redeemed of the Old Testament into the presence of God. I think that's what we have here in this passage. And I recognize their other interpretations. Now, we have in verses 11 and 13, "...and he himself." gave some. Now, you will notice that I'm now reading my own translation. I trust it might be helpful. And he himself gave some apostles and some prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Now, he didn't give them to become that. These are not gifts that he's giving to these men, although he had done that. But he's saying then he took these men who have certain gifts and he gives them to the church. For what purpose? In order to the perfecting or the equipping of the saints under the work of ministering and building up of the body of Christ till we all attain under the unity of the faith and of the fullness of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a full-grown man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, this may sound selfish. I trust it's not. What's the purpose of the church in the world? It's to complete itself, might grow up. Now, he himself here is very emphatic. And he himself, the Lord Jesus is the one who gave the gifts. And he is the one that has given them. He's the one that has the authority. Now, he gave some that were given the gift of an apostle that they are given now to the church. For what purpose? That the apostle might do, as Paul says, Paul an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, God the Father raised him from the dead. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this office, by virtue of its very nature, has long since disappeared from the church. Now, prophets here, I think, are used as they are elsewhere in the epistle. They're New Testament prophets. And I think it means preachers. These men were given, as were the apostles, particular insight into the doctrines of the faith. And they were under the immediate influence and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which distinguishes them, I think, from teachers today although they were preachers in their day. Now, the Lord Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, he did two things. That he took the Old Testament saints out of paradise to Blair, where he is. And then he gave gifts to the church down here. The members of the church all are given a gift. And then he took some of these gifted men that he'd given gifts to, and he gave them to certain churches. Or he's given to the whole church these gifted men. And there are the apostles, and there are the prophets, and there's no one around today with the office of apostle. But actually the apostles belong to us today and the prophets. Now, they themselves, they passed off the scene long ago, but they're still members of his church. And it does not exist only on earth. Part of it's up yonder in heaven with him. And they are part of the host, though they pass the flood and are in the presence of God. They're still members of the church, and we have apostles and prophets. Well, may I say to you 
that we do. And right now, aren't we studying the epistle to the Ephesians? Who wrote that, by the way? Apostle Paul? Well, where is he? He's up yonder with Christ. You remember he said, absent from the body, present with Christ. And he says, it's far better to go and be with the Lord. Well, he's taken the far better route now. And he's up yonder, but he's a member of the church. And we're studying his epistle today. So he's given to the church, the apostles and prophets and the evangelists were the traveling missionaries and pastors and teachers. And the one that is the office of a teacher is one interests me naturally a great deal. Because if I don't have that gift, I don't have any, that's for sure. And you will find that that gift is mentioned in Romans 12 and then again in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and 29, and then again in 1 Timothy 3, 2. Now, God has given these men to the church that the church might be brought to full maturation where there would be inhibition, that the church wouldn't make a nut of itself, that the church would not appear ignorant before the world. And the teachers and all of these are to prepare the church that they might do the work. Do you notice what he says here? the work of ministering and building up the body of Christ. Now, we call a pastor of a church a minister. But now, if you're a Christian today, you're as much a minister as he is. You don't have to be ordained to be a minister. He has a certain gift. And this is something else I'd like to say. I do not believe that any man that is in the church today has all the gifts. Dr. Chaffer used to say he never met a man he thought he had both gifts. He said at one time that he led his own singing and did the preaching when he started out as an evangelist. And a dear lady came to him one night and said, Dr. Chaffer, you're doing too much. He said, you ought not to lead the singing and do the preaching both. And she said, why don't you get somebody to do the preaching? Well, may I say to you, he was a musician, but I thought he was a great teacher also. So that the interesting thing is that we have today the viewpoint that the pastor has several gifts and that one of them is the minister. Well, he is to teach the Word of God so that his members are those that are in under him, that they might do the work of the ministry. They might be the one to go out and witness. And today... We have the church going in reverse, and a great many people think it's the business of the pastor or the pastoral staff to do all the visitation. I think it's the business of the members. That's their responsibility and the thing that they should do. Here is a little article that I took out years ago of a bulletin of a church back east, and it reads like this. For centuries, the principal responsibility for evangelism has been borne by the clergy. The laity were neither called to evangelistic activity nor believed it to be their responsibility. One of the most significant developments in the church, possibly the single most important development in recent centuries, is the revival of lay activity and the growing recognition that the layman is called to a ministry no less important than that of the minister. Elton True Blood has said, The Reformation has opened up the Bible to the common man. A new Reformation will open up the ministry to the common man. Now, may I say that I think that's a very fine article and that we are seeing laymen becoming more involved and so many young people, young Christians, getting involved in doing the witness. Now, they need teaching and they need teachers. I think that's the only reason in the world they'll listen to me is because they feel like I can teach them. By the way, there are folk that get a great deal excited when they hear somebody using my material. I had a call some time ago from a lady back in Ohio, and there's apparently a preacher back there that does a pretty good job of imitating me, and the Lord help Ohio for having a man like that. But nevertheless, she said he's teaching the book of Ruth and says he not only follows your book and follows your teaching, he uses your illustration. And she says, I think it's terrible that you ought to stop him. Oh, I said, is he doing a good job? And she said, yes, he is. He's doing a fine job. 
Well, I said, praise the Lord. I always felt like somebody would come along and do it much better, and I did it. And she says, yes, but he ought not to do that. I said, I don't see why he shouldn't. My business is to try to prepare the others to do the work of the ministry. And this man apparently is using material, and he's free to use it. Now, I know a preacher that I saw an article that he wrote, and he said, you can't use this without permission. Who in the world does he think he is? Why, we're to build up the church, and that material ought to be free for anybody to use. And every now and then I get letters from ministers one the other day, and he said, I want to preach this sermon of yours. Is it all right? Well, I said, one thing I ask of you, do it better than I did, brother. That's the important thing. But use the material, of course, because, my friend, we're to build up the body of Christ today. And it rejoices me that when I get letters and people say, I took your material or your book and I used it out yonder, I used the tape. I thank God for that, my friend. We're to get the Word of God out today. And that's the important thing, that these men have been given to the church for the building up of the church. And that's one reason that I went out of the pastorate into the wider ministry of radio. I found out that by radio I could build up more people. And very candidly, and I'm talking to you very frankly, but don't expect your pastor to do it all. He's there to train you that you might do the work of the ministry and that the church might be built up to full maturation, that we might not act like a bunch of nuts today, that we might give a good, clear-cut, intelligent witness in the world. And may I add this? I'm very frank, as you know. I think that the greatest sin in the local church today is the ignorance of the man sitting in the pew, doesn't know the Word of God. And that's tragic. I'd hate to get into an airplane that the pilot didn't know any more about flying than the average church member knows about Christianity or the Word of God. I'll be honest with you, I don't think that the plane would make it, my friend. I think it would crash maybe before it even got 10 feet in the air. Now, that is the condition of the church today. It's another reason. We believe that getting the Word of God out today is pretty important. Will you forgive us for going into detail here like this? Now let me move along. In verse 14, he says, "...in order that we be no longer children." (laughs) You know, we are to have inhibition. We're not to run around like a bunch of babies crying. You remember, that's what Paul said to the Corinthians. He says, "...you're carnal, you're babes in Christ." In your disgrace, in order that we be no longer children tossed up and down and driven about with every wind of teaching by the slight of man, and that's the shooting of dice of man, in craft and cunning, tending to the system of error, scheming of deceit, but being followers of truth and love may grow up into him as to all things who is the head, Christ from whom all the body, being fitly framed together and put together through every joint of the supply, according to energy of the measure of each individual part, that is, according to the working in the measure of every part, the whole body, making the increase of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, the purpose of Christ and given to the church men with different gifts is to develop believers from babyhood to full maturation. These men are to be, therefore, pediatricians. Now, I use the expression sometimes, I am not an obstetrician. Primarily, I'm a pediatrician. The obstetrician, he brings the baby into the world. Now, I know he has to get up at 1 o'clock in the morning to do all this, and that it's pretty bad, and he spends the night. But from then on, he's through with the little... (coughs) angel, by the way, and he turns him over to the pediatrician. And that's the fellow that has the problem of putting on the dieties and giving the bottle and burping him. And I've been a pediatrician in my ministry, and the obstetrician is sort of second. But that's been my business. And I feel that that's what many of us are called to do. Now, there is a mixing of metaphors here. Will you notice And he brings out vividly the danger of a believer continuing as a babe. 
children are never put in command of a ship at sea. It's like the pilot, you know, of a plane. You wouldn't put a baby up there running it. You wouldn't put my little grandson up there. I hope he's a smart boy, but he's not that smart. If they were, they'd be tossed up and down in a ship, driven here and there without direction over the vast expanse of sea, and in a plane it had crashed. They'd become discouraged and seasick as they lose their way. Now, this is a frightful picture of the possible fate of a child of God. Now, the figure of speech changes again. These babes are seen in a gambling den where the sharpest take them in with a system of error. And I wouldn't think of sending my grandson up here to Las Vegas to play the slot machine. In fact, when he gets a hundred years old, I won't send him there, and I'll tell you that. In contrast, though, the believer is to follow the truth in love. That is to love it, live it, and speak it. Christ is truth, and the believer must sail his little bark of life with Christ as his compass and the magnetic pole toward Christ. All things must point. The body receives not only orders from the head, but spiritual nourishment. And this produces a harmony where each member is functioning in his place as he received spiritual supplies from the head. The body has an inward dynamic whereby it renews itself. Likewise, the spiritual body is to renew itself in love. Now we come to the prohibition of the new man. There is the negative side of the believer's life. And I think this is important to see today. There is not enough emphasis right now on this. We talk about all of this new morality, which is nothing in the world but just old sin. And there's a liberty in Christ, but it's not license to sin by any means. And there is the negative side. So we're going to see that there are some prohibitions. And I'll be very frank again, and let me say this. I can't find anywhere here where it says a woman is not to use makeup. I don't know. I'm not hipped on that, but I do want to say that I've been with a group for years that judged a great many women by the amount of makeup that they used. And I used to have a great deal of fun when teaching and kidding these young people. And many of these girls think they were spiritual, come in with disheveled hair and no makeup on. They look like they're a walking zombie. And I think some of them were just about that, by the way. And I used to tell them when they'd ask the question, should a girl use makeup? And I'd say, well, I'll tell you one thing. Some of you'd look better with it. And I think a Christian ought to look the best he can, but he ought not to be painted up like a barber pole. There are prohibitions, but that just doesn't happen to be one of them. And we need to recognize that there is the power of negative thinking. We've had too much of the power of positive thinking. We need a little of the power of negative thinking. I have a sermon on that, by the way. And have you ever stopped to think? The Garden of Eden, that was the only kind of thinking there was in the Garden of Eden, and it was a garden, remember? And thou shall not eat of that tree. <laughs> That's negative, and it's the only thing that was there. And then when you come to the Ten Commandments, they're very negative, but very good. And now there's some negative thinking here. Prohibition of the new man. Verse 17. This then I say and testify, that is, I solemnly declare in the Lord, that ye walk no longer, as also the Gentiles walk, in the vanity, the emptiness of illusion of your mind, having been darkened in the understanding, that is, in your moral perception. Don't go for the new morality. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance which is in them, through the hardness of their heart who as being past feeling, cease from feeling pain, have given themselves over to uncleanness, lasciviousness, to a working of all uncleanness and greediness and covetousness. Now, Paul returns at this juncture to the practical aspect of the believer's walk. Now, will you notice? Listen to him. He had introduced it in those first three verses, but he was detoured by the instruction of, of the subject of the unity of the church. Now he gives a picture of the lives of Gentiles and the lives of the Ephesians before conversion. He told about their position. You remember back in chapter 2, 
You were way off, strangers, without hope and without God. But they were also living in sin. This is their picture. Now, this is a graphic picture of the lost man today. That is what he does. And there are four aspects of the walk of the Gentiles that illustrate the absolute futility and insane purpose of the life of the lost man. That you not walk as Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. Now, notice that. The vanity of their mind means the empty illusion of the life that thinks their satisfaction in sin. Oh, how many people? How many? And I feel so sorry for many of these young people that have taken on the new morality. One girl said to me, two abortions, murdered two babies not married. What a life. That's not life, my friend. That's awful. That's terrible. And the Gentiles walk that with lost people. They walk in the vanity of their mind, an empty illusion of life, that it's great to drink cocktail. And a woman said to me, who's become an alcoholic, she started listening to the program. She's right now fighting a battle to be delivered from alcohol, and she's accepted Christ the best she can, but she can't leave the bottle alone. May I say to you, she says, oh, how tragic it was to think it was so smart and sophisticated to drink cocktail. How tragic. And the second thing, having been darkened in the understanding, why the lost man has lost his perception of moral values. And that's exactly what the new morality is. No perception of it. And then the third, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them. Now, what a picture of mankind today. He thinks he's living. (laughs) And one man told me, he said he spent $75 one night, he and his wife in a nightclub. What to do? Have a good time. That's expensive good time. And let me tell you, fun time. And you have to pay like that and go through all of that to have a good time? You are alienated from the life of God and certainly dead in trespasses and sin. Now, here's the fourth. Who, as being past feeling, have given themselves over to uncleanness, to a working of all uncleanness in covetousness. Now, this continuance and this state of moral ineptitude, it brings them down to the level well, they have no feeling of wrongdoing. And there are a lot of folk like that today. They're apathetic. The resultant condition is to plunge further in the immorality and lasciviousness. And this vicious cycle will finally lead them to a desire to even deeper sin. If you paint the town red tonight, you've got to have a bigger bucket and a bigger brush for tomorrow night. The meaning is to covet the very depths of immorality. Now, men in sin are never satisfied with sin. They become abandoned to sin. Now, this is what it means in Romans. God gave them up. You can reach the place, my friend, where you are an abandoned sinner. Now, verses 20 and 21. But ye did not thus learn Christ, if indeed him ye did hear, and in him were taught, even as in Jesus there is truth. My friend, if you're not listening to Jesus, then he must not be your Savior. He's the shepherd. His sheep, he says, hears his voice. You haven't heard his voice. You just couldn't be a sheep, you see. Now, this is the picture of the Gentiles that we've seen. Now, here is the thing. What are they to do? They're to listen to Christ. They're to hear him. And other sheep are not to hear him when an unsaved man writes me and says to me, I disagree with you. Fine, brother. I hope you don't agree with me. That's the entire picture, by the way. And this is the thing that we need to recognize, that the saved person looks to the Lord Jesus as his shepherd, lets him lead him, listens to him. And he is an example. Not that we can imitate him, because we can't. But he certainly has been the one that has been the pioneer that went through the doorway of death for us. And he's the one that when he walked down here, he is an example to look to. No reason for any believer being in the dark today. 
Now, Paul says at verse 22 through 24, that ye put off as regards your former manner of life, the old man, and that you're to put on, he says here, the new man. Now, it's actually like a garment. You put off the old, put on the new. And don't we call certain garments a habit? There's a riding habit, a walking habit. There is one for hiking, hunting habit, and playing golf, a habit for that, so that we have different habits. Now, the child of God is to put on as a garment the new man. Actually, what this means here, that it cannot be done by self-effort. After all, the babe in Christ can't dress himself. I found out that a child has to get very far along before he's able to dress himself. Then when he starts out, he doesn't do very well. We never reach the place where we can do that. Now, the old man, we're told, over in Romans, has been crucified in the death of Christ. And in view of this truth, then they were to put off in the power of the Holy Spirit the old man. This does not mean, friends, that they eliminate the flesh. We do not get rid of the old nature, but we're not to live in it. And I think any person today listening to me who's honest, you recognize you've got an old nature. Now, we're not to live in it, but we also have a new nature. We are to live in it, and only by the power of the Holy Spirit, as that's the great message of the 7th and 8th of Romans. And Paul is dealing with that here. And that we are to walk in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. That shows that this is the imputed righteousness of Christ, and this is all done consistent with the holy character of God. Since we've been declared righteous, and we are in Christ, seated up there, down here, our walk should be commensurate with our position. Now, verse 25 through 27, and I'm reading now, as you've noted, my own translation in the book, Exploring Through Ephesians. Wherefore, having put away lying, speak ye truth, every one with his neighbor. For ye are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your indignation or your irritation. No longer give room to the devil. Now, Paul here returns to the prohibitions. He began in verse 17 where the believers told to walk no longer as the Gentile walk. Now, these injunctions continue through the remainder now of this epistle. These are the prohibitions. This is the power of negative thinking. Now, he's to speak the truth. And he's speaking the truth. Why? Because he's to put away lying. And when the old man was put off in the crucifixion of Christ... The lying tongue and the deceitful heart were put on the cross. That's the reason he had to die for us, is because you and I are lies. Remember, David said, I said in my haste, all men are liars. I remember hearing old Dr. W.I. Carroll years ago say, he said, you know, David said, all men are liars. But he said it in his haste. And Dr. Carroll says, you know, I've had a long time to think it over. And I still agree with David. Well, speaking the truth, you see, I think it resolved most of the problems in the average church. Long ago, I gave up the idea of trying to straighten out all of the lies that I'd hear in the church. I started out, I'd follow it down. And I found out, friends, you spend all your time doing that. Now, since believers are member of one body, they should speak the truth. Here is the thing that Chrysostom said, and it's a ridiculous analogy, but it certainly illustrates the truth. I'm reading now from Chrysostom. Let not the eye lie to the foot, nor the foot to the eye. If there be a deep pit, and its mouth covered with reeds, shall present to the eye the appearance of solid ground. Will not the eye use the foot to ascertain whether it's hollow underneath or whether it is firm and resists? Will the foot tell a lie and not the truth as it is? And what again? 
if the eye were to spy a serpent or a wild beast, will it lie to the foot? I know, my friend, like the fellow that said he saw a ghost at night. Well, the eye told him he saw something, and he said to his feet, feet, don't get in my way. <laughs> I'm ready to go. And so he started out. Feet didn't let him down, you see, because they don't deceive one another. The eye won't deceive the foot and in the church. There ought to be honesty and truth. And he says, be angry and sin not. Now, the believers commanded to be angry with certain conditions and with certain people. You know, this idea today that a Christian is one who's a blah, that he's sweet under all circumstances and conditions. My friend, will you hear me carefully? No believer can be neutral in the battle of truth. We should hate the lying and the gossiping tongue. And when we hear that in another Christian, we should hate that thing. Now, we should not hate or loathe the person with an innate hatred, or as Peter calls it, malice. He says that malice is something that should not be in the life of the believer laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. He says, and as newborn babes, we should desire the sincere milk of the word. Malice, as someone has said, is congealed anger. Can't give it up. A great many people have certain hang-ups. They hate certain people. They can't get over it, they say. I can't forgive. Well, we should forgive and forget if the person is willing to give up their line. And you find that the Word of God has a great deal to say about this. This idea that we're to be sort of a milk toast individual. You remember the Lord Jesus, when he went into that temple, and there was that man with the withered hand, and they had planted him there to see what he would do. Remember what Mark says in Mark 3, 5? And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he hated that thing. And he was angry with that thing. My friend, we're told that God is angry all day long with the wicked, but the minute they'll give it up, turn to him, he'll save them, of course. Now, that should be our attitude, by the way, the attitude of a believer. I heard of a custodian in a church. It was a church that had had a lot of problems, a lot of trouble, a lot of bitterness and hatred in the church, and a lot of little cliques, a lot of little groups. And they'd had one pastor after another. The custodian, though, had been there for years. And someone one day who visited the church, who knew about the church, said, how is it that you've been able to stay here so long under the circumstances? Well, he says, you know, I just gets into neutral and lets them push me around. My friend, a great many people think that's being a Christian, to do that. No Christian can be neutral. We're in a great battle, as we're going to see in this epistle here. Now, verse 28 and 29. Let the stealer steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his own hands that which is good that he may have to give to him who hath need. Let no filthy speech come out of your mouth, but if any is good for the building up, as the need may be, that it may give grace unto the hearers. Now, man by his sinful nature is a thief, and he's a liar. And it's natural to be that way. May I say to you, when I was a boy, we always, during the year, a bunch of boys a gang that I ran with, and they were mean. I'll tell you very frankly, they were mean. As I've often said, I was the only good boy in the crowd. But you know, we used to go and steal watermelons during the watermelon season. And I'm of the opinion the owner might have given us one, but they tasted better if we swiped them. And then we'd steal peaches and apples out of orchards. I tell you, it wasn't anything to say. And we'd steal eggs and take them down during the winter time to the old Buzzard Creek, and we would roast them and then hunt rabbits. And just naturally a thief, by the way. Then I was converted, and I haven't held up a bank or a market or anything like that. 
But I was riding here several years ago down a certain highway on a country road, in fact, going to see a man. And he had a marvelous, wonderful watermelon patch. And you know my temptation. I actually stopped. I got out of the car. I thought, I think I'll go over and get me a watermelon. Then I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm going to see the man. He'll give me one. And there's no reason for me to do this. And I got back in the car and drove on. But you know, I almost went in his patch and took one without being asked. And I told him my experience. And he laughed and he said, you know, I might have shot you if you'd gone that watermelon patch. He said, I've had a lot in there stealing my watermelons, and they're pretty valuable today. So it's in our hearts, friends. We're just naturally that way. Now, Paul says that we're not to steal anymore, even when it may look like it's all right. And he's not to get rich for his own selfish ends, but he's to help others, you see, with whatever he has that's surplus. Today, there are many fine Christian ministries that lag and wilt for lack of fun. Why? Because a lot of God's children are not given as they should give. That's quite evident. Then he mentions filthy speech. And it means that which is rotten or putrid. An uncontrolled tongue in the mouth of a believer is an index to a corrupt life. Believers who use the shady a questionable story, they reveal a heart of wickedness. Because you know what's in the well of the heart will eventually come up through the bucket of the mouth. And the speech of the believers should be on the high plane of instructing and communicating encouragement to other believers. You can have fun and enjoy life. Humor's all right, but gracious to deal with that which is dirty and filthy today. Now, he goes on here to deal with something that we want to deal with. And this is quite wonderful. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God in whom ye were sealed until or for the day of redemption. Now, the day of redemption is that day that the Holy Spirit will present you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's a person. The Holy Spirit's a person here that can be grieved, therefore. When what is it that grieves him? Well, the offenses which grieve the Holy Spirit, they've already been listed. That's what we've been talking about. When you lie as a Christian, that grieves the Holy Spirit. You have dirty thoughts. That grieves the Holy Spirit. And when a person is grieved, what happens? Well, there's no fellowship. He can't work in your life. But notice what he says. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, though. You're sealed till the day of redemption. Now, you can grieve the Holy Spirit... But you can't grieve him away because you've been sealed unto the day of redemption. How wonderful this is. From the moment that you are regenerated, the Holy Spirit seals you, as we've already seen in this, and he will present you to the Lord Jesus Christ someday. And in the meantime, you can grieve him. Now, what is the difference today really between Christians? The real difference between Christians is... Those who live with a grieved Holy Spirit and those who live with an ungrieved Holy Spirit. That's the difference. Now he says, in conclusion in this chapter, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. As that word malice again, congealed anger. But become ye kind to one another, kind-hearted, forgiving one another, as also God in Christ forgave you. Now, these two last verses, they're in sharp contrast one to the other. For instance, in verse 31, there is an additional listing of that which grieves the Holy Spirit. Now, these are the sins of the emotional nature, bitterness. That's an irritable state of mind which produces harsh and hard opinions of others. Someone came to me and told me what they thought of a certain Christian, and there was a third Christian present, and after this man left, he said to me, if I were you, McGee, I wouldn't put too much stress upon what this individual has said. He said he's very bitter. Well, great many people speak in bitterness, and when they do, it hurts. 
And that grieves the Holy Spirit. Now, wrath and anger are outbursts of passion. Bishop Mole makes this distinction between them. He says, wrath denotes rather the acute passion and the other, that is anger, the chronic passion. And then clamor. That means a bold assertion of supposed rights and grievances. There are those in the church. You meet them guilty of this. It grieves the Holy Spirit. They said, you know, they don't pay any attention to me anymore. The pastor doesn't shake hands with me. Well, my friend, what right have you to say that he's got to run around and shake your little paw to keep you happy? Of course, a lot of us pastors had the job of burping the babies, and that was part of it, was shaking a lot of hands. They'd be bitter if you didn't do it, and they would be clamorous if you didn't do it. Now, evil speaking here is blasphemy, yet it means all kinds of slander. And they are to be put away, that is, taken away. And it's an aorist imperative, if I may intrude a little grammar here. It means that there should be a decisive act if the Holy Spirit is not grieved. You're to put it away. You are to make a decision to put that away. Now, malice, as we've said, is congealed hatred here. But become, he says now, do you note that here? He says, you're to put these away from you, but become kind one to another. And this denotes the radical change that should take place in the believer so there'll be no vacuum in his life. Kind to one another. That means Christian courtesy. Kind-hearted is more intense than the word kind. It means to be full of deep and mellow affection. Some believers, you know some like that. Wonderful friends, when they see you, they put their arm around you. Well, I went to college with, graduated college with him, then in seminary. I helped meetings for him for years. He's retired. When we saw each other in Florida, we just flung arms around each other. That's kind-hearted. I love him in the Lord. Now he says, forgiving one another. That's a reflexive form of a phrase, and it means to give and take in relation to the faults of one another. Forgive instead of magnify the faults of others. That's what we're to do. Now, all of this is done on a twofold basis. First, this conduct will not grieve the Holy Spirit. And in the second place, the basis of forgiveness is not legal, but gracious. It's not a command under law, but it's on the basis of the grace of God exhibited in our forgiveness because Christ died for us. And we're to forgive because we've been forgiven, not in order to get forgiveness, And that's quite a contrast. The Lord Jesus said, you know, you're to forgive, so you will be forgiven. (laughs) Well, that's legal. And he was given that in the Sermon on the Mount. But here, it's on the basis of the fact of what he's done for us. This is quite wonderful. Now we come today to the last chapter, and we see now the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And it seems strange that we've looked in the fifth chapter, the church will be a bride, and now the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But the time words, of course, are important. Now, a friend of mine who's quite a wag and a humorist, he said, you know, said, I'm not sure, but what, that's the way it ought to be. That after they get married, that's when the war begins, and therefore... The church should be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, may I say that he's being facetious, because the important thing is that in the future, the church will be presented to Christ. That's the expectation of the church. And today we're in the period of the engagement and the exhibition of the church before the world today. Now we come in this sixth chapter to another side, and the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, the soldier service of the church is important. Yonder in the city of Ephesus was that great temple of Diana, 
one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the most pagan, even, grossly immoral, and now it's time for the believer to recognize that he's got an enemy. Not only did the Christians in Ephesus have an enemy, but we have an enemy today. We don't have a temple of Diana, but I think we have something infinitely worse. I think that we're seeing around us many things parading in the name, not only of religion, but of Christianity. That's not Christianity at all. Now you have here, in the first nine verses of this chapter 6, the soldier's relationship. Then verses 10 and 12, the soldier's enemy. We need to know our enemy. And the soldier's protection in verses 13 through 18. And then the soldier's example. Because you see, Paul was a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then we have really the soldier's benediction in verses 23 and 24. Now we come to the first part of the chapter, which opens with instructions to children and to parents and to servants and masters. It may seem very far-fetched and foreign to the life of the soldier, but such is due to an oversight in giving prominence to the training of the soldier. You see, a soldier's training does not start in boot camp. It begins when he's a child in the home, and that's important. This is something that we're told today that back in, you remember, during World War II, that they said in the Navy that in the early days of our nation, they had wooden ships and iron men. But today we have iron ships and paper doll men. Well, maybe that's not entirely accurate. But here is a report from the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, and will you listen to it? Some problems faced in the training of Navy personnel. Twenty percent of all young men in the United States attaining the age of Navy enlistment of 17 years must be rejected because of previous criminal records. Another 20 percent must be rejected because of personality psychological or health problems. Seven percent of all enlistees fail to measure up to recruit training. Severe problems are faced in the training of young men who must be trained in the simple things that should have been learned at home. At 17, a young man ought to be ready to launch into the training program. The Navy finds that they can easily put a uniform on the man. It is putting a man into the uniform that is causing such problems. Now, I understand that that's even greater today. And even in our so-called Christian schools, that the students graduating from Christian Bible schools and colleges, only 10% go into foreign missions. And 37% of graduating students go into home missions. 53% go into secular work. Of the 10% who go to a foreign mission feel a startling number return after the first term as casualties. Training is essential if the soldiers to fight properly and be victorious over the enemy. This is important to see. Now we have, first of all, the soldier's relationships in the first nine verses here. And we begin with him in the home as a child. That's where the preparation should begin. And every child is handicapped that doesn't get that first lesson that a soldier should have if he's out yonder fighting the battle of life. One of the great problems that young people are having today, and older people out in this big, bad world that we live in, is because they were not properly trained in the home. And properly trained actually means discipline. Now we are told here the first lesson that a soldier must learn is obedience to those in authority. He must follow orders. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, very candidly, the soldier must learn 
that he must obey. The basic training is therefore learned in the home. And after the soldiers learn to obey, then he's in a position to be promoted to the rank of an officer where he gives commands to others. Now, to know how to give commands depends largely on how the soldier learned to obey. Therefore, the basic training is found in the home with the parent-child relationship and the master-servant relationship. The victories of the Christian life are won in the home and today in the place of business. If you're going to win them in the place of business and out in this world today, they must be learned at home. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, he says. Now, that means that it's not only because it's according to the will of God, it's more than right, it's just. It's a righteous thing to do as it's God's way. You remember it said of the Lord Jesus, that as a boy, that he went down to Nazareth and he was subject to Joseph and Mary. Now, there are two essential factors which must be taken into account in this verse. It is assumed that Paul is talking about a Christian home. He's been talking about that all along in the marriage relationship. Now, a home such as he began discussing back there in chapter 5. Obedience of children to parents is confined to the circumference of in the Lord. Did you notice that? Obey your parents in the Lord. And I have great sympathy for a boy that accepts the Lord and has an unsaved father or mother. And there are those that are like that. Remember a man, he was a very godless man, heavy drinker, said to his boy, says, well, now that you become a Christian, you're going to start obeying me. The boy was a pretty smart boy. And he says, and when you become a Christian, I'll start obeying you. Well, that's... I think, the important thing. Now, it's in the Lord, and that's mentioned here. Christian parents have a privilege of claiming their children for the Lord. I think that we all ought to do that. Even where only one parent is a believer, you may claim that child for God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians seven fourteen, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, this doesn't mean that the child is a believer just because he has a Christian parent, but it does mean that the parent has a right to claim that child. Now, we're talking about a Christian home. Then the second thing we need to keep in mind here, the word for obey is an altogether different word that we had in verse 22. Of wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Here it means obey. It's a different word altogether. You see, the wife occupies a place of equality with the husband, and it's merely a question of headship. That's all. And here the child is to obey as the servant is to obey. It's the same word that occurs down. We'll find it in verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, Disobedience to parents is the last and the lowest form of lawlessness to occur on this earth. I wonder if you realize that. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 2, where we're told about the characteristics that in the last days, perilous times shall arise. Well, what is it that will arise? Men will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be covetous. They'll be boasters, they'll be proud, they'll be blasphemers. And then notice, disobedient to parents. That's one of the characteristics of the last day. Now, today you hear so many cases of children actually killing their parents. And that's indicative of the time. And others, totally disobedient. Now, I think there comes a day in a boy's life when God has given him a nature where he no longer, now he's in rebellion against the parent. Why? Well, it's time for him to move out and get married and start a home of his own. That's the thing that's happened. God doesn't want him to be a mama's boy tied to his mama's apron string the rest of his life. 
God wants him to stand on his own two feet, but when he starts out, he's to be obedient. And I was visiting in a home when I was a pastor many years ago, and there was a little two-year-old boy in that home, and the father and I couldn't even carry on a conversation because the little fellow, he occupied the center ring of the circus, and he was a little circus himself, and the dear little fellow was a brat, if you ask me. Oh, my. And the father says, you know, I just can't make that child obey me. The father weighed about 200 pounds, and that little fellow, I don't imagine he went over 30, 40 pounds. And the father said, I can't make him obey me. I think he could have. I think he should have because of the fact that God intended for him to make him, to obey him at that age. Now, in verses 2 and 3 here, "...honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth." Now, may I say to you that the Ten Commandments, I think we found that in this epistle, are not the norm for Christian living. But you see, it doesn't mean you can break them. Now, when you're a little fellow in the home, you're to honor your father and your mother. And you're to honor them all your life, by the life that you live. And the very interesting thing is that all of the commandments are repeated in the New Testament with the exception of the Sabbath day. Now, I'll get some letters on that one. But you find that as no commandment given to believers today, the Sabbath day. But you're to honor your father and mother. And the interesting thing is here... This is a commandment that has a promise of long life to those who keep it. And it's repeated here. It's the first commandment with promise. The others didn't promise you anything. They promised you something if you didn't keep them, but nothing if you did. And I think that you have two examples of those who did not follow it in Scripture. And their life was short. Samson and Absalom. Samson, a judge, died a young man. Absalom rebelled against David, a young man. Now, I think that's interesting to know that the Ten Commandments are given in the New Testament in the proper place, as this one is here, with the exception of the Sabbath day. Now, that's something for you to toy around with, by the way. Now, will you notice verse 4 here? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture or the discipline and admonition, instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, no such commandment was given to parents under the law. You see, under grace, there's always mutual responsibilities and interactive duties. The parent is not to vent a bad disposition on a child or punish him in a fit of rage. It's the parent's duty to teach the child the truths of the Scripture and then to live them before the child. Don't provoke your children to wrath. As a believer, you're to live like a believer. Now, fathers here, I think, includes the mothers also, but the emphasis, I think, is upon the father for the discipline and training of the child is actually his responsibility. But the mother's included. Children are not to be provoked to anger. Now, this doesn't mean that they're to be treated as if they're sort of a cross between an orchid and a piece of Dresden china. I think, frankly, the Board of Education should be applied to the seat of knowledge. And that quite frequently, by the way. Proverbs had a great deal to say about this. He says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Like the father whipping the boy, and he said to him, Son, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And the boy said, Yeah, but not in the same place. And then Proverbs 19, 18 says, Chasten thy son while there's hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crime. And foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, 15. And I think one of the great problems today with these little folk that are in rebellion today, 
before this time for them to be in rebellion is simply because they needed to be whipped. They needed to be taken to the woodshed. And I'm not trying to get even because I made quite a few trips there. And he says in 23, verse 13, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Now, when you whip the child, if you're not whipping him in anger, he makes it very clear here, don't provoke your children to wrath because they see you're venting on them a mean disposition. But yet you should be disciplining them and they won't die. Now, my mother whipped me a great deal more than my father did. In fact, she was at home with us, and I grew up as a boy. I was such a good boy, but I don't know why I seemed to get a whole lot of whippings. And I remember I learned something, and one of it was when she began to whip me with a switch, and she could have hurt, I would yell at the top of my voice, You are killing me! You are killing me! And I found out that she didn't want me to yell like that. The neighbors would hear, and the neighbors would say, My! That boy's mother's killing him. And so she would always let up when I would begin to yell like that. I found out, you know, it sort of softened the punishment that you receive. But friends, actually, she wasn't killing me. And the thing is, if you beat him, he won't die. And just keep that in mind when the little fella yells at the top of his voice. And if you can do it and still smile and say, I'm doing it for the good of the boy. Now, we have here another statement of this. In Proverbs 29, 15, and 17, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Correct thy son, he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 29, 15, and 17. Now, a child in a Christian home should be given Christian instruction that he might come to a vital relationship with Christ and be fortified when he comes in contact with the world. Now, I want to say this, that every parent ought to have the privilege of leading their child to a saving knowledge of Christ. Now, my wife never was my assistant pastor. I insisted on that. I never let her become president of the Missionary Society or hold any office any women's organization, in any church I served. She was not my assistant. I told my board one time, I said, my wife is my wife. He's not the assistant pastor. And her business is to take care of the home and the child. And I think that's important. My wife had the privilege that I'm afraid very few parents have today. One time when I was out on a trip, our little girl, she, I don't think she's over seven or eight years old, she's out playing. And she came in, and we were visiting, at least they were visiting my wife's mother. She came in, and she said to my wife, she said, Mama, I won't accept Jesus. And my wife took her in the bedroom, got out on her knees with her, and had the privilege of leading her own little child to the Lord. And I always felt that was much more important than to try to be a personal worker in the church. I know a great many personal workers today that have lost their children. My friend, that's your first responsibility, is your own child. And you better concentrate on that child. And if Christians today would do that instead of attending to everybody else's business and trying to raise everybody else's child, you get your own child to the Lord first. And that's your first responsibility. You see, I'm a retired preacher now, and I'm on radio. Nobody can throw a rock at me and hit me right now. I can say this today. But you know the interesting thing? I always said that. And that's not the way to make friends and influence people. I found that out. But it's in God's Word, and what's in God's Word, I've always wanted to say it. Now, it says here that the discipline... That's to be of the Lord. Did you notice that? And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, that means of the Lord that discipline and instruction are administered in the name of the Lord. That's important. Now, 
from verses here 5 through 8, we have this question of servants. Now, will you listen to this? Bond servants are slaves. Be obedient to your masters, your Lord, according to the flesh. They're just your master down here. With fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as to Christ. Not with eye service. That is, don't watch the clock. As men pleases, don't butter up the boss, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the soul, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatsoever good each one shall have done, this shall he receive from the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, in order that I might not be misunderstood, I'm going to move on to verse 9. Because you have the other side of the coin. And ye masters do the same things toward them, giving up your threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no respect of persons with him. Now, this is for Christian workers and for Christian owners of the factory. This is for capital and labor when it's Christian. And when you have that, and I say it very kindly, you won't need a labor boss to come around to make the capitalist do what he ought to do. <laughs> the interesting thing is, and I know of several businesses today run by Christians. I mean the owners are dedicated Christians, have chapel service, and on their own time, and they pay their workers for it. Several like that. And they are prosperous concerns. God has blessed them. And they don't need a union. One of the employees of that place said, if we were under union, we wouldn't be making what we're making right now. So that we're talking now about Christians, Christian workers and Christian owners of the factory. That's important. And uh, two sides of the coin. In other words, we're just getting right down to the nitty-gritty. This is where you work, friend. And the relationship should be different among Christians. How wonderful it is. Now, even here in our radio office that we have, we don't pay as much to girls and men that work here in our office as they can earn on the outside. I'm sure they could go outside, get a job. In fact, we had one girl that got a job. I imagine she made a great deal more than she made. She's back with us. She'd rather have the less salary and work where it's a Christian atmosphere. May I say to you, this gets right down where you live today. And if you're an owner, the best way you can reveal your Christianity is the way that you conduct yourself with those working for you. And if you're a worker, the best way that you can reveal your Christianity is to those that you're working for. Now, we had read the passage that referred to labor, and so I reached ahead and read the passage that related to both, because it's like the relation of husband and wife. You have no right to lift one out to the exclusion of the other. And there is a responsibility put upon a believer who is a laborer, and also a responsibility put upon one who is a capitalist or one who is the employer. This is the employee and employer relationship. And in that day, it was actually a sharper division than that. It was really master and slave. And this passage reads like that. Bond servants, that is slaves, be obedient to your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as to Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the soul, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatsoever good each one shall have done, this shall he receive from the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, the question we've had before us has been, that of submission first in the home, the husband and wife relationship, then the parent-child relationship. Now he moves out of the home into the street 
out to the workshop in the marts of trade and into the office. And it's a different situation here between slave and master. There are no bonds of love such are found in the home. Yet children of God who are filled with the Holy Spirit should be submissive one to another. In fact, he began by saying, submit yourselves one to another. Now, that's all right for Sunday, for the church service, but what about Monday morning when you go to work? You're working for a believer, and you are a believer. Or you are working men that are believers. Well, it's estimated that half of the population of the Roman Empire was slave. That is, there were 120 millions of people in the Roman Empire, approximately. Sixty million of those were slaves. Now, Christianity never made an attack upon the evil of slavery, but it reached down to the slave in his degradation and lifted him up, assuring him of his liberty in Christ, and preached a gospel that the very nature of it condemned slavery, and it eventually broke the shackles of slavery from the bodies of men and cut the fetters from their minds and souls. And in this country, the South had to lose. I'm a Southerner. But the South had to lose because slavery was wrong. And that doesn't mean that the North was right in their method, but it does mean that the principle of slavery was wrong. Now, there were in the Roman Empire multitudes of slaves who came to Christ. If you have my book on reasoning through Romans, you find out in chapter 16 that most of those that are mentioned there were slaves, that are mentioned by name. Now, the church began to reach actually into the praetorian guard of Caesar and into the palace itself. And now he says, be obedient. And the church did not instigate revolution against the evil practice of slavery. But it preached a gospel that was more revolutionary than a revolution has ever been. Because a revolution has always had its side effects, which has been bitterness and hatred that has existed through the centuries. But when the gospel of Christ is preached, it'll break down the middle wall of partition. I actually believe that today, if we had the preaching of the Word of God in this country, and there never was a time when America could have been called Christian, but we certainly are far from it today. But if it could be preached as it was in the early days, and those who professed to be Christian were obedient and loyal to those to whom we owe obedience and loyalty, it would have a tremendous effect today upon the public life of America and our contemporary society. You know, a man is not a Christian just because he's made a profession. He reveals that Christianity. And just to profess on Sunday you're a child of God is no good. Are you loyal to your employer? Are you faithful to him? Are you loyal and faithful to your family, to your home, to your church, to your pastor? And when a professing Christian is disloyal in these areas of his life, the chances are he'll be disloyal to Christ. And certainly he has no witness at all. Now, there's some details here we need to pay attention to. He says here that you are to be obedient to your masters according to the flesh. Paul makes it clear that slavery only applied to the bodies of man, never to the souls of man. And it was to be with fear and trembling. Now, that does not mean abject and base cringing before a master, but it does mean to treat him with respect and dignity. There's one thing today that I have no use for. It's a officer of a church who pretends to be loyal 
to his pastor to his face, and then is disloyal to his back. Or a member of a staff that is disloyal on the outside. To me, this is the lowest form of life today. You just don't get any lower than that. You and I should always treat with great respect and dignity those that are over us, by the way. Now he says, in singleness of your heart. And that means there's to be no duplicity, not being two-faced in it all, not licking the shoes of the employer, of the boss, when he's around, and then stabbing him in the back when he's away. And both of these are not the action or the life of a Christian. Now he says you're to do this as to Christ. Now, that shows that the slave has been lifted from the base position of degradation where he sullenly worked as little as possible and only when his master was watching. Now, he's the slave of Christ, and Christ has made him free, and he's to look above the earthly master, and he's attempt to please his master in heaven. A master could control only the bodies of the slaves. And the slaves of Christ have yielded their souls to him, yea, their total personalities. You see, Paul called himself, Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, with good will doing service, shows that their attitudes should reflect their Christian service. When a child of God, whether a slave or a master, employee or employer, gets to the place where the motive of his life is to please Christ, then I tell you the hurdles posed by Captain Labor are easily passed over. In our day, I think there's a new kind of slavery, and it's sweeping over the nations of the world. And in our own land, there is a slavery, and it's not only of the body, but of the mind. Such slavery, I think, is far more pernicious and deadly than that of the Roman Empire, and multiplied thousands are willing to make any sacrifice today to foreign ideology. You can call it anything you want to. I've had the privilege of speaking to a group of students from Berkeley here in California. These young men have turned to the Lord, and their major's political economy. Now, there was a time when they were a slave to this form of political economy, to a particular system. And now they're delivered from that. As one young man told me, he said, one time I thought we could manipulate the economy and that we could make everybody prosperous and everybody happy. And he said, I see now that only Christ will be able to bring in that kind of a society. And that doesn't mean, he says, we're not going to work for it, but it does mean that we're going to know that our goal is limited, and only Christ can do it. Now, what is it today that can break the shackles? Therefore, it's only the power of the gospel of Christ. He says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, it's Christ that offers freedom. Think of the thousands today that are trapped by drugs, by alcohol. It's alarming the way alcoholism is taking over the lives of multitudes today. And I don't care to enter into that. But what we're talking about is there is a slavery that's about us. And a person who's working for another should serve as under Christ, not unto the boss that's over them. The Saul of Tarsus was a slave to an ideology. He was a Pharisee. And he came to Christ, and he was made free. And immediately, though, he yielded to a new master. And he said, What wilt thou have me to do? And he became a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the position, you see, the high position that the Lord has lifted the employee to. He's dignified labor. and doesn't make any difference whether a man's working at a bench or digging a ditch or 
working in an office or whether he's a miner down in the bowels of the earth or a farmer tilling the ground. Each one of them can say, I serve the Lord Christ if he's a child of God. When William Carey, remember the missionary, he plied to go as a foreign missionary. You remember that he repaired shoes, made shoes. And somebody said to him, what's your business? <laughs> and they did that in order actually to humiliate him because it was a slur on him. He wasn't an ordained minister. And they said, what's your business? Well, he had an answer. He says, my business is serving the Lord. And he says, I make shoes to pay expenses. Serving a Christ. Oh, to be that kind of a worker today. Now, what about the master? What about the boss? Well, we're talking now to believers. And ye masters, do the same things toward them, giving up your threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. There is no respect of persons with him. Now, you must understand that you are the employer, that before Christ, you're just another man. There's no respect of persons with him. And what he said to labor applies to you. You come in under the same category, and you are to have a master, and your master is Christ. And this is the Christian relationship of capital and labor. And responsibilities are Mutual masters are to adopt the same general attitude toward their servants, which is a servant of Christ. And they're not to take advantage of their position as master. They're not to abuse their power. They're not to threaten. And in the presence of Christ, the master and the servant stand on the same footing. They're brothers in Christ. And this relationship is seen in a very practical demonstration, I think, in the epistle of Philemon. You remember Philemon was a master, and he had a servant by the name, a slave by the name of Onesimus, that ran away from him. And according to the law of the day, he could have put him to death. But he didn't put him to death, because Paul sent him back with the epistle to Philemon. And he says in that epistle, you're to receive him, not now as a servant, a slave, but above a slave, a brother, beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, therefore, when a capital and labor are believers, you've got an altogether different relationship. It's not capital and labor. It's brothers. That's the thing that makes them partners now, I mentioned about a business over in Dallas, a great manufacturing concern over there employs several hundred men. And many of those that work there are believers. In fact, most of them are. And the owners are believers. And the very interesting thing is they don't need capital labor relationships there because they're all brothers. And you ought to see the way it works. And actually, those that work there, they share in the profits. One man said to me that worked there, and he's not what I'd call a very strong Christian. He said, you know, he says, it pays me to work hard here, because he says, I share in the profits. May I say to you, what a difference it makes when that exists. Don't tell me Christianity is not practical. It is practical. It'll work. The thing that was said years ago, I think, by a great Chinese Christian, Sun Yat-sen, he commented on Christianity in this country. You must remember, he attended school over here, and he knew America pretty well. And he says it's not that in America that Christianity has been tried and found warning. He says the problem over there is it never has been tried. That's the problem today. We've kept it back of stained glass windows. The nicest thing that anybody has ever said about my ministry, and especially this radio ministry, is a man up in San Francisco. And he's a broker, man of means, by the way. 
outstanding businessman. And he wrote me a letter, and he said, I listened to you on the way to work. Been listening now a long time. He's an officer in a church. I take it it's a liberal church. And this man's come a long way spiritually. And he said to me, he said, you know, you do not sound like you're speaking from the inside of stained glass windows. And that's the nicest thing you can say. Because, my friend, if Christianity can't move out of the sanctuary and get down yonder with the secular, there's something radically wrong with it. And it'll work if it's tried. And it'll work in this capital labor relationship. Now we come to the theme of this chapter, which is the church is a soldier. Believer is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And now we are going to see, as we have seen the soldier's training here and his relationships, we see him in the home, that's where God begins with him, and then we see him moving out into the world, and he's either an employee or an employer. He has to be one or the other. And as a child of God, he's got to contribute to the welfare of the contemporary society. He has to be a producer one way or the other. So there was that relationship. But now we come to something that's very important, and we see the soldier's enemy because there's a battle to be fought. We're going to see that the thing that today is probably more misunderstood than anything else is the fact that the child of God is in a battle, and the battle is being fought along spiritual lines. I've made a statement that has caused quite a bit of controversy, I understand. I've said that sometimes the most dangerous place you can be is in church on Sunday morning. You know, in Jerusalem, the most dangerous place to have been the night Jesus who was arrested was not to have been with that bunch of Pharisees or with the cutthroats in the underworld, but the most dangerous place to have been would have been in that upper room where Jesus was. And you know why? The devil was there. He'd put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. He was there. And if Judas Iscariot was here today, and Simon Peter even, I think both of them would testify to the fact that was the most dangerous place to have been that night in Jerusalem. And so we need to recognize where the battle is being fought today, the spiritual battle going on right now. Now, I want to say something as kindly and as sweetly as I know how to say it. There is a great deal of discussion and argument and hard feelings that go on in Christian circles today. And a great deal of it is actually among fundamental believers. There are those that do not feel that somebody is as fundamental as they should be, and they talk a great deal about separation and that type of thing, and about doctrine. I don't mind stating my entire position. I am premillennial pre-trib, and a dispensationalist. I believe the whole ball of wax, my friend. I believe that. But I get a little weary today, and actually just a little bored today, with folk that are so insistent on dispensationalism, so insistent upon premillennialism, so insistent upon separation, and yet their lives are lived in a very careless manner, and it's not commensurate with this exalted and high position that we have. Now, we are seated in the heavenlies. That's wonderful. But, my friend, we are walking right down here on this earth, and this thing has to walk in shoe leather. And if it doesn't walk in shoe leather, I don't care how many 
Keswick conferences you go to, our Bible conferences, our Bible classes that you attend. But if this thing does not get down into your life, where you are living the Christian life, standing for the things of God, and you're doing it sweetly, you don't have to be mean and ugly, state your position, but you don't have to use the bitterness and the vitriol and the hatred that you see exhibited today. That hurts the cause of Christ a great deal. Now, why is it that you see so much of this exalted teaching and so high teaching and such low living? Well, may I say to you that there's some that are fundamental in their head, but they're sure liberal in their feet, that's for sure. And in their total living, they are that. Now, I'm not discrediting Bible conferences or Keswick conferences. I started the Keswick Conference in Southern California myself many years ago. It's been imitated again and again in this particular area. And I'm for it, and I'm for Bible conferences. I don't think anyone can say that I'm against these things. They might say it, but they couldn't be honest in saying it. But I'm saying it now because of the fact that there is that danger today of thinking just because we've got a head knowledge of some things, we've learned a vocabulary, and we are able to spout out our position rather lucidly and fluently. And because we can do that, that somehow or another that's all that's needed, and we can live a very careless Christian life. Now, that is to misunderstand where the battle is going on today. Again, let me say this. I do not think that the devil is working down yonder in the nightclub uh, on Skid Row or that he is down with the underworld or the mafia and all of this group. I think he goes to church on Sunday morning. I think that he's working today on the spiritual front. And too many sleepy Christians seem to be totally unaware of that. There are too many Christians today that are concerned about closing up the cocktail parlor. And don't misunderstand, it needs to be closed. But there are too many Christians that get involved in trying to close a cocktail parlor, and they need to close a few mouths today in Christian circles that are gossiping and talking too much. I say that the devil is working in an area where we least suspect him. And if you want to find him, I'll tell you where you can find him. Don't look for him Saturday night. He's not out on the town. He's gone to bed early so he can get up and go to church Sunday morning, and that's where you're going to find him. That's where the spiritual battle is being fought, where a man is giving out the Word of God, where church is standing for the Word of God. That's the place he wants to destroy, my friend, and that's the man that he wants to destroy. Therefore, that's where the spiritual battle is. Now, I said at the beginning of our study in the book of Ephesians that it was like the book of Joshua, that what Joshua is to the Old Testament, Ephesians is to the New Testament, or turning that around, that Ephesians is the Joshua of the New Testament, and Joshua is the Ephesians of the Old Testament. And I took that at the very beginning, and then probably you thought I forgot the subject, but we're back to it now and see application of it. Now, when the children of Israel came into the promised land, that's not a picture of heaven at all. The Jordan River is not a picture of our death. If you want to sing on Jordan's stormy banks, I stand and cast a wistful eye, you want to do that while you can, but when you really see the Jordan River, you'll find out that you've been certainly disappointed in that muddy little stream. It doesn't speak of our death at all. It actually speaks of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you and I cross over out of the wilderness of this world into Canaan 
And that's right here and now. The child of God should be living in Canaan. And in Canaan, it's not heaven, because when the children of Israel crossed over, there were enemies in the land. There were battles to be fought, and there were victories to be won. And today, we've come to that place of soldier service now, and we see the battle before us. The enemy now is marked out, the soldier's enemy, and he's put before us. Now, when Joshua entered into the land, there were three enemies that are given to us in the book of Joshua. Jericho was standing right in the way. That was the first enemy. And Jericho represents the world. What Jericho was to Joshua, the world is to the Christian today. He was told to march around the city. He'd never fought it. And you can't overcome the world by fighting the world today. You'll make a mistake if you try that method. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And you and I have that enemy, and it's by faith that we'll get the victory in the only way we can over the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. These things are passing away, and the child of God is not to love them. And we are in that world, but we ought to also recognize we should have a Canaan experience. And then there's another enemy that Joshua had, and that was little Ai. Ai represents the flesh. You see, Joshua thought it'd be pretty easy to overcome Ai, and he sent up a small delegation, and believe me, they were really whipped. And they came back, and Joshua got down on his face and began to whimper and cry before God, and God says, get up off your face, Joshua. Cut out this blubbering in my presence. Israel hath sinned. And the problem today with many of us is that, yes, we've got a victory over the world. There are a lot of Christians marching around Jericho today, tooting a horn like the children of Israel were blowing trumpets, and they're saying, I don't do this, I don't do the other thing. But they sure have been whipped by the flesh. They're overcome by a temper. They're overcome by the sin of gossiping, lying, Christian man came to me some time ago, and he said, Why in the world is it that I just continue to lie about everything? Well, the flesh is getting the victory over a lot of us, friends. And Ai represents the flesh. Then there were the Gibeonites. They were clever, sly rascals. They really just lived over the hill from where the children of Israel were. You remember, they deceived Joshua. They took old moldy bread, and they took worn-out shoes, and they made everything look like they had made a long journey, and they came into camp where Joshua was, and they said, Brother, we have heard about you. My, we've heard how God has given you victories in this land, and we want to make a treaty with you. We want to be a friend of you. Oh, my, that's the way the devil approaches us. He deceives us, you see. How deceiving. He makes his ministers angels of light. Somebody said to me concerning one of these leaders of a cult, they said, you know, I listened to that man. My, how attractive he is. How personable he is. Actually, how really wonderful he is. He thrilled me. <laughs> May I say to you, the devil makes his ministers ministers of light. You think that he's going to knock on your door one day and say, Look, I'm the devil. I'm here to take you in. I'm going to fool you. May I say to you, that's not the way he'll approach you. He will knock on your door and say, I've got some literature for you. Or he'll use other methods to deceive you. He may say, Now, look. I know your church is going liberal, but remember, Grandpa had a pew in the church, and that window up there is named for Grandma. We can't afford to leave this church because we've got so much here. That's what the devil says. God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And the Lord says it in a nice, sweet way. And the devil, he imitates him. The devil says, oh, so sweetly, we just need you here. Stick around, and 
That's what happens. My, the devil is so subtle, and the Gibeonites fooled Joshua, and he made a treaty with them. And they were the only ones that got him in trouble. Actually, of course, Ai, he had to confess his sin. He says, Israel hath sinned. That sin had to be dealt with and put away before God would give a victory. That's the way we overcome in the flesh, if we confess our sins. But what about the Gibeonites? My friend, if you're going to line up with them, you're going to find yourself defeated. There's going to be no question about that. Now, will you listen? What can we do? Well, we can't do it ourselves. You and I are no match for the devil. And you and I are not even told to fight him, by the way. He'll carry on the warfare. Now, I'm ready to read verses 10 through 12, and I'm reading from my translation. Because right here, actually, again, I think the devil got in a lick here. Our translators actually watered down the text here. They said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Well, what in the world is he talking about? Well, he's talking about this spiritual wickedness. He's talking about that which is satanic. Now, will you notice verse 10? Finally, Paul says, he's coming out of the end of the epistle. In conclusion, be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. You cannot in your own strength and power overcome the devil. Be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, or put on the panoplyon of God in order that ye may be able to stand against the stratagems are the methodios of the devil. Paul definitely is making a play upon these two words here. Be strong. Be strengthened in the Lord. That is the thing. That's the only place that you and I need to get power. And we need to recognize that. Now he goes on to say that these enemies that are about us today, they're spiritual enemies. And we need, therefore, spiritual power to overcome them. And we are, therefore, to put on the armor of God. We're going to look at that armor in detail, by the way. It's important to see what it is. Now, only God's armor can withstand the strategy and onslaught of Satan. You see, he has all kinds of weapons today. He has missiles spiritual missiles. And you have to have an anti-missile system if you're going to overcome it. And that's the only way that you can. And therefore, the Christian soldier, we need to recognize, does not have an enemy to fight who's in the flesh and blood. No man should be our enemy that we're to fight him. The enemy is spiritual, and the warfare is spiritual. And it's well to note here that the flesh of the believer is not the enemy to be fought. The believer is to reckon the flesh dead and to yield to God. And the way of victory over the world, as we've seen, is the only way in the world you can overcome the world, through faith. Fighting the old nature will lead to defeat. Paul had that experience in the seventh of Romans. Now, the world is the enemy of the believer, yet the way to victory over the world is not by fighting. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, the devil is the enemy of every believer, and he has in battle array his minions arranged by rank. And wrestling here speaks of the hand-to-hand encounter with the spiritual forces of wickedness. Now, here is where I say that we do not have as strong as we should have in our translation. Now listen to this. For our wrestling, verse 12, for our wrestling is not against blood and flesh, 
but against the principalities, against powers, against the world rulers of this darkness. These are all spiritual. Against the spiritual hosts of evil in the heavenly places. Now, this is the warfare that's going on. And the fallen angels of Satan are seen in this conflict that's in heaven. In the book of Daniel, I think we have probably the finest illustration of this in the 10th chapter of the book of Daniel of the fact that there's a spiritual enemy to be overcome. And I want to turn to that, but let me say this before that demonism today. If I'd said this even ten years ago, which I did say and was certainly questioned at that time, as one dear lady said to me, Dr. McGee, you sound positively spooky. Well, maybe I do, but I'll say it again. And it's this. There is a demonic world around us today, and it's manifesting itself at the present hour. We have a church here in Southern California that's called the Church of Satan. And there are strange things happening today in certain of these weird, way-out groups. A man said to me, he says, McGee, this thing is real today. Well, who said it wasn't real? If you're an unbeliever in this area, you ought to get your eyes open and see what's happening about us. How people are being ensnared and led into all of these things. And what we have today are these spiritual forces that are working in the world. And they're evil forces. And they're working against the church. They're working against the believer. They're working against God and against Christ in the world. This idea today that somehow or another, that you and I are a match for this. Now, you can poo-poo it all you want to, but this thing just happens to be true. Now, principalities mean that they're demons that have the oversight of nations. Powers speak of those that are privates. They're demons that want to possess human beings. And then world rulers of this darkness are demons who have charge of Satan's worldly business. And spiritual wickedness in the heavenless are demons who have charge of religion. I think that he has the best organization that there is in the world today. And it's an organization where he is manipulating in this world. And my friend, he's running a great deal of this world today. The heartbreak, the heartache, the suffering, the tragedies, May I say to you, is the work of Satan in the background. And this is the thing that's causing the great problems that are in the world today. Now, let me turn to the thing that I had reference to. Over in Daniel, in the 10th chapter, verses 12 and 13, Daniel was praying a prayer, and he didn't get any answer. He prayed that prayer for three weeks, by the way. He tells us in the beginning of chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshaz, and the thing was true. He says, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. In other words, in all of that time, he was in prayer. Then this is what happened. When finally the angel came to him and touched him, verse 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now come. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart, to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I'm come for thy words. Well, Daniel could say, where in the world have you been? Well, listen. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, now that was a demon, withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. He said, I had to go back for reinforcement. There's a spiritual battle going on. And my friends, when you go to church sleepy, 
You have to be defeated because that's where he's fighting today. Now, we don't seem to realize that there's a spiritual battle being carried on today and that there is a manifestation even at the present time of demonic power and many people are being blinded and carried away in all kinds of cults and religions and isms with all kinds of beliefs. And as a result, the Word of God sinks into insignificance and into a minor place, even in many of our churches. My friend, the enemy that we have today is a spiritual enemy. That enemy is Satan and his hosts of demonic power. And that is where the battle is. That's where we need protection today. Now we are told in order to carry on this, we have the soldier's protection. And we are told, Wherefore, take up the panoplyon of God, in order that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Put on the armor of God, in order that ye might be able to stand and that having done all to stand. Now, we've identified the enemy. Now, Paul now begins to identify the arsenal, which is available for defense. Nowhere is the believer urged to attack or advance. The key word in this entire section is this, to stand, stand. That's the important thing. You know, the Scripture speaks of believers... As pilgrims, as pilgrims, we are to walk through the world. And as witnesses, we are to go, go to the ends of the earth. As athletes, we are to run. We are to run with our eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that we are to look to. When we're athletes, we're to run. But as fighters, we're to stand. And very frankly, I personally would rather do a great deal of old-fashioned standing. Now, many years ago, Billy Sunday, the evangelist, attracted a great deal of attention by, on the platform, he was fighting the devil. And by the way, I think that there was a great element of truth in that because it was a spiritual battle. And I think the battle is carried on where the Word of God is preached, where the gospel is given out. That's the battle line today. That's where the enemy is working today. I don't think the enemy, friends, is working down on Skid Row. I don't think that he's out partying Saturday night. I remember years ago when I was active in Youth for Christ as a young preacher. I was out every Saturday night. And we used to say at that time, well, Saturday night's the devil's night. Now we're making it the Lord's night. Well, frankly, I think the devil was home in bed. I think he's resting up so he could come to church the next morning because of the fact that why should he want to fight his crowd? They belong to him. I'm not sure he's proud of them. I think he's ashamed of a lot of these alcoholics and these down-and-outers today, and these up-and-outers. He could take no pride in them, but he's out fighting where the spiritual battle is. And Billy Sunday carried on a battle against the devil. Now, very frankly, I'd agree with that. But personally, I've never felt like that I should carry on that battle. That is, that I should make the attack. You don't have to make the attack. Just stand because he's going to make the attack. Having done all to do just one thing, to stand. And I've never been enthusiastic when I hear a group of defeated Christians singing, Onward Christian Soldiers Marching As to War. May I say to you, it's more scriptural, I think, for the believer to sing, Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. And I believe today that we need to do some good, old-fashioned standing. And very frankly, this is an hour when my heart is sad, when I look today at a great many churches. Now, some folk that think I'm hard on the local church. I love the local church, and my heart goes out to the local pastors today. They're fighting the battle. Those are the men that are really on the battlefront today. I'm for 
him, because he's the one I happen to know. I was a pastor a long time, and I always appreciated those that came in and stood shoulder to shoulder with me at that time. And I see churches that at one time were great churches, and the crowds flocked there, and they're no longer attending today. Attendance is way down, and the interest has gone. And what has happened today in many of these places? Well, I'll tell you what's happened. The members were blind to the fact where the battle was being fought. They thought because the finances came in, they thought because the crowds were there, they were winning the battle, and they themselves were losing it all the time. Oh, the day that we might recognize where it is, and that today the local church might recognize that. How many of you really pray for your pastor on Saturday night? And instead of criticizing him on Sunday, pray for him. He needs your prayers. And you don't need to crucify the man today that's preaching the Word of God. The devil's going to see to that. You don't need to join that crowd. You ought to uphold his hands as Moses held up his hands on behalf of Israel. And that's where the problem is today. That is the difficulty in the local church, and my heart goes out to these men today. Now will you notice, he says here in verse 14, Stand therefore. My gracious alive, I get the impression that Paul is trying to tell us to stand. And having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparedness or the equipment of the gospel of peace. Now, for the fourth time here, the believers commanded to stand. And this is the only place that I find Paul laying it on the line and speaking like a sergeant and saying, in the command, stand. Before, when he opened this section, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, beg of you that you walk worthy. Now, the command comes to us as soldiers, stand. That's the command today. Stand against the wiles of the devil, because he can outwit us unless we have on this armor. And now, will you notice this armor? We have our loins girded with truth. And that's very important. In the ancient garment of that day, and for the uniform of the soldier, the girdle about the loins, it held in place every other part of the outfit that you wear. And when you lose the girdle, why, well, to tell the truth, you're losing everything you got, my friend. Your garments fly open and your pants fall down. And I know that comedy is produced, and people laugh when they see a man running or a man fighting, and his trousers begin to droop. Well, that's supposed to be funny. And a great battle in the past was won by a clever general who had his men go through, and with the enemy, the enemy was asleep, and they just went through and ran a knife through the belt of the soldiers. Well, believe me, they were so busy the next morning holding up their trousers. They weren't able to shoot the guns. And this general won the battle because of that. Well, the girdle holds everything in place. And we're to be girded with truth. Now, what is truth? That's the Word of God. Now, there are a great many people today that are given a testimony. I think they ought to sit down. Oh, I am being so ugly. Will you forgive me? But I want to speak that which is in my heart because very candidly, somebody needs to give out the Word of God today, and I want to give it out just as it's written. Now, there are people that are given a testimony, and they've got a thriller. All these football players, these baseball players, these movie stars, these television stars, but you know, they do not know any more about the Bible than a goat grazing grass on a hillside. They're totally ignorant. What they need to do is to have their loins girded about with truth. That is the thing they need. They need to know the Word of God. 
because some of them are saying some very foolish things. And then every now and then, I could give you the names of a dozen back in my day that had gone off into tangents, into cults and isms, and everything under the sun, and they've really lost their testimony. Why? Well, simply because of the fact their loins were not girded about with truth. And it's important that you have a knowledge, a certain knowledge of the Word of God before you get up publicly and speak to folk. And that's the reason today that many of these testimonies, they're thrillers to hear, but they're coming from folk that are standing there, my friend, and they're about to lose all their spiritual garments, if you want to know the truth. They have to hold them up because they're not girded about with truth, and that is needed today. Now, will you notice that there's something else that we're told here? And I should mention this. Every piece of this armor really speaks of Christ. We're in Christ up there, and we should put him on down here. Paul has already told us that. Put on Christ, and he's the one that's the truth. And you and I should put him on in our lives. And again, may I say this. A testimony that does not glorify Jesus Christ should not be given. And there are too many of them that glorify the individual. I was a great athlete, or I was a great this, that, or somebody else. And I today am turning over my wonderful talent to Jesus. And believe me, he's lucky to have in his crowd, because he is not so much, and his crowd is not so much. It's wonderful that he has me. My friend, you are lucky if you have him, let me tell you. And he didn't get very much when he got you and when he got me. And this is a day when the little fella really doesn't have very much to say. You've got to be somebody great in the eyes of the world. We need to have our loins girded about with truth. And Christ is the truth, and truth alone can meet error today. And you have on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, Christ is the righteousness of the believer. And I do think, though, that there is the practical righteousness that is here. The filthy rags of self-righteousness, that doesn't quite make a breastplate. But I do think that underneath that, there should be a heart and a conscience that is not disturbing the individual because that he's not right with God, their sin in his life. Only the righteousness of Christ can enable the believer to stand before man and before God. But the heart that's going to be protected should be a heart that's not condemning the individual. The awful thing is, is to have sin in the life and to try to carry on the battle. We'll never win it that way. Now we have our feet shod with the preparedness or the equipment of the gospel of peace. Shoes are necessary to standing, you see. And they speak of the foundation. You've got to have a good, solid foundation. Preparation is foundation. I remember in hand-to-hand -hand combat, we were taught, make sure you get your feet anchored. Well, my friend, is your feet anchored today on the rock? And the gospel is the only way the believer must touch the world. And it's his foundation in this world. And again, Christ is that foundation. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is Jesus Christ. Put on Christ. Oh, how we need him today as we are facing a gainsaying world and also spiritual wickedness in the darkness of this world. The armor that the child of God is to wear in order that he might be able to stand against a spiritual enemy. And actually, the armor is a spiritual armor. And that armor is Christ, the living Christ. For he puts around his own. In the Old Testament, it was expressed even by Satan. There's a hedge about that man, Job. And there's a great deal to this armor. Now, I think probably I should say that we have seen now that the very important part of the armor was the loins girded about with truth. That's the Word of God. Christ is the truth. 
and we need to know him and to know the power of his resurrection. And we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness, that is Christ. He's been made unto us righteousness. And that's the only thing that can stand against the devil. But underneath it there should be that heart and conscience that is clear because of sins confessed, because of a walk with God and fellowship with him. And then there should be the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that means we should be on the foundation. I tell you, if we're standing on a slippery rock, the devil is going to be able to overthrow us. And if we're standing on sand, I tell you, we'll be overthrown very easily. Now he says in verse 16 through 18, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet, which is salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying on every occasion through prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, it is probably better to say here, above all, taking the shield of faith. Because the shield covered all of the armor. In other words, the shield we're talking about here literally means a door. And it was the shield for the heavy infantry. The hoplites came out, you know, and then there moved in the strong infantry. And this shield was like a big door. And the soldier, he stood back of it, fully protected. Now, have you ever noticed that in the Word of God that Christ is both the door to salvation and he's the door that protects the believer from the enemy without? And this is the picture that you have of him in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. For instance, he says in verse 9, "'I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, that's salvation. What about security? Notice verse 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Well, my friend, that's protection, is it not? Here is the shield of faith. Now, faith will enable us to lay hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's important. The interesting thing here is that faith enables us to stand back of this door and the fiery darts of the wicked one. And friends, he's shooting them fast and furious today. I remember when I was in college, and that's a long time ago. You have to have a good memory to remember back when I was in college. Well, when I was a student in college, I had a very brilliant professor. He studied in Germany. He was the philosophy professor. I respected him a great deal. I respected his intellect. I think, actually, he was intellectually dishonest, but I did not know that at the time. And I looked up to him, and very frankly, he was taking my feet out from under me because I tried to answer him in class. I should have probably kept my mouth shut, but I was always a student that spoke out. I would say this, that I think the man came to be a good friend of mine. He and I used to walk together across the campus after the class and discuss these matters. I very frankly came to the place. I went to the Lord in prayer, and I said, Lord, if I can't believe your word, I don't want to go into ministry. And I was about ready to get out, and then the Lord, in a very miraculous way, sent me to hear a man who was the most brilliant man I think I ever listened to. And he gave me the answer to that. May I say to you that I then began to learn that when a fiery dart came my way, and I didn't have the answer, just put up a shield of faith. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And the very interesting thing is that the shield of faith has certainly batted down 
the fiery darts of the wicked one. Well, I can remember when the story of creation, it upset me terribly. Oh, boy, I was ready to get out of the ministry because I couldn't accept certain things. And very frankly, the problem wasn't with my little pygmy mind. I thought it was. The problem was I just didn't know enough. And I put up the shield of faith. And if today somebody would come along with something that would be upsetting, Somebody said to me, over in Israel, this man and I were walking along, and they were excavating. He says, suppose they dig up something down there that will look like it disproves the Bible. What position are you going to take? Well, I said, I'm going to put up the shield of faith, and that'll bat down the fiery dart of the wicked one, because I've learned that when the fiery dart is batted down, that you get the correct answer later on. How interesting that's been as we go along. I go back to the day when actually they questioned the fact whether John wrote the Gospel of John. I think that's pretty well established today. I had questions about that at one time. And the fiery darts, friends, they're coming fast and furious today, and they're going to continue to come. The only thing will bat them down is the shield of faith. It's like a big door. These soldiers in the infantry, when the hoplites went by, they were generally mowed down in the Roman conflict. But these boys that came along, they are moving these tremendous shields. And they just put them out in front of them and stand back of them. And the enemy shoots at them everything they got. Then when the enemy is out of ammunition, here they come. <laughs> May I say to you, this is the way to stand the fire of darts. Then we're told here to take the helmet of salvation. Have you ever noticed the helmet protects the head? And God does appeal to the mind of man. I recognize he appeals to the heart. But God appeals to the mind. And he says in Isaiah one eighteen, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And that is something that I think is very important to see. And then we read in Acts twenty four twenty five, And as he reasoned, that is, Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. In other words, Felix had no answer for Paul, because Paul appeal to the mind of this man as well as his heart. And then the Scripture says, Romans ten seventeen. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. God does not ask you to take a leap in the dark. That's not faith. A theology professor, a liberal, said many years ago when I was a student, he said, faith is a leap in the dark. God says, if it's a leap in the dark, don't take it. Because I want you to leap into the light. I have a solid foundation for you. How wonderful it is. Now we're told here to take this helmet of salvation. Well, Christ is the salvation of the sinner. And he's the one to receive the glory in it all. That plume that's on top is Christ of the helmet. And he's been made unto a salvation. And when Christ was born, they said, call him Jesus. He's going to save his people from their sins. And Paul said to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, And let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, you see, all parts of the armor have been for defense. Have you noticed that? Everything is for the front of the individual. There is nothing made for retreat. If you retreat, you're going to get shot, just like Ahab did when he was riding out of the battle in a chariot. That's where they got to him. And believe me, my friend, a retreating Christian is certainly an open season for the enemy. The enemy can get through to it. Now we have here only two weapons for offense. First is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Did you notice that? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Christ is the living Word of God, and He used the Word of God to meet Satan in the hour of his temptation. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword in the battle of Armageddon in which he gains the victory. What is that sword? It's the Word of God, my beloved. And some of us need to have a sharp sword going out of our mouth, the Word of God, the only weapon of offense, my friend, that you and I are to use today is the Word of God. That's what we're trying to do. Then the second weapon of offense is prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to come to that in another epistle. In fact, the little epistle of Jude, and I'm going to dwell on it at that time. But here, let me say, praying in the Holy Spirit is not turning in a grocery list to God at all. To pray in the Spirit means that you and I recognize our enemy today and that we lay hold of God for spiritual resources, and we lay hold of God for that which is spiritual, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what it means, I think, to pray in the Spirit. Now the soldier's example, and Paul is a good soldier, Jesus Christ, and here's his example. And on behalf of me, that to me may be given speech, an opening of my mouth to make known in boldness the mystery of the gospel. It was the mystery because it's not back in the Old Testament as such. That Christ died for our sins, buried, rose again the third day. And that's the message we should give out today. This is the Word of God. On behalf of which I'm an ambassador in change in order that I may speak boldly in this as I ought to speak. And friends, may I say to you, that is the prayer that we cut it here, that there might be given to us an understanding, and that there might be given to us a boldness to declare the Word of God. Oh, how important it is to see this. Now he goes on to say here in verse 21 and 22, "...but that ye also may know the things concerning me." What I do, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. Tychicus was the pastor there. Later on, John became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. He shall make known all things to you, whom I have sent unto you for this very reason, that he might know the things concerning us, and that he might comfort your hearts. Paul had a real concern for the brethren. Now we have the soldier's benediction. And this is proper. You remember General Douglas MacArthur said that soldiers do not die. Old soldiers do not die. They just fade away. <laughs> well, listen to Paul. He says here, Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them who love our Lord Jesus Christ in incorruptness. And here was his swan song over in 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 8. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his 